Bill Clinton was in the White House. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers and San Diego Chargers are headed to Super Bowl 29 on bended knee. I don't remember it, uh, but it was by Boys to Men, and it was the number one song on the radio. Average American annual salary, $35,900. Gas was a buck twelve, and here we are when our heroes from the 80s and early 90s are making plans for the next portion of their life and we're being introduced to the new stars who are going to carry the world's biggest federation for the next 10 or so years. And I got the biggest of those guys in 95 right next to me, Kevin. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Agreeing to go down memory lane, for better or worse. You may need therapy after this, we'll see. So my uh, average American salary was 35.9, so it actually is the same. We're almost there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're headed back. One thing that, that, that people don't know is how, how long he's been associated with, with, with professional wrestling. I mean, you know, he was a, I think he, he actually broke in as a referee. And, you know that. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm almost positive Jim broke in as a referee. And um, the one thing that was, when, when I had found out that Jim was going to be taking that spot was, of all the people when I had that, you know, that stellar three-year run at WCW during the Oz and Benny Vegas days and all those you know, Master Blaster and so on and so forth. Um, Jim had a uh, talk radio show, a wrestling talk radio show in Atlanta. He would often have me on because I was, you know, I was a good guest. And that's where he became a fan of me, knowing that I could actually speak, I was funny, that there was a lot more to me than, than met the eye, which at that point, you know, WCW slash, that was just had turned from the NWA was based on nepotism. Mm -hmm. you know, if you didn't, you know, if you weren't in Dusty's crew, you know, you basically, you know, or, or weren't, weren't you know, related to him in some form or fashion, you didn't get a push. And so that was kind of where that was. So Jim was kind of a, an ally that, you know. Did you see him as a creative guy, though? I knew you, I, you, you never know if somebody be, can be creative, but I knew that he knew. I knew that he knew, you know, what what sold, what didn't sell, what made sense, what didn't make sense, you know, whether or not. There's a lot of brilliant people that that, that can't, you know. I'm sure that uh, if Picasso sent here you know, and was going to tell you what how he came through cubism, you and I would go, okay, well, we still aren't going to be able to do cubism. I mean, it's just a very you know unique form of, of art. Um, but, you know, so whether or not he can, he can put his thoughts on paper and have it, you know, be something that, that, that becomes part of, you know, a plus in the program. I mean, you don't know these things until you get, you know, it's the same as me, you know, I, I've been, I wrestled for a lot of years and when I, when I got the book, you know, it's like anything else, you realize early in the booking process that no matter how good of an idea you have, and how precise it is if the two guys go out there and completely botch it and, and don't, you know, execute to a T what you did, you can lose 50, 70, 80 percent of what you're trying to get done. Mm -hmm. You're a bad booker. No, right. the guys just didn't do, you know, didn't do their job. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I had no idea, but I just knew that he was an ally. So I, at that point, I, you know, it was a good thing. It was for a me. good thing. Right. Yeah. At first, not good, but just because we're both two strong personalities. But then after we started, because um, he didn't, me, me and him didn't start doing something together. But once we, me and him started working together, um, I realized what you know how brilliant he really was. I didn't even know what a false finish was um, it, until he showed me how to like use false finishes and stuff like that. Yeah, but I didn't know, I didn't realize how how good of a mind he was until we started to uh, to work together. And you know, and it's kind of, it's like the ECW locker room. It's like it was a pretty tight locker room, you know what I mean? And then people coming in, and you know, Scotty can be a little bit of abrasive, you know. But, well, the thing is, he's smart, but he he always tries to tell you that he's um that he's smarter than you, you know. So, you know, people that rubs people the wrong way. Uh, what about the the Raven character? Awesome, unbelievable. You know, was it just right right place, right time because of the grunge? 
Yeah, and then uh, you got to keep it separated. That freaking song that Paulie brought brought him brought him out with. You know what I mean? It was, a, yeah, the generation. I don't know if it was Y X or whatever they were calling it then. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, it was. Yeah, at the time it was really real well. Yeah, you know, Stevie, his his opponent here, always generated kind of the homophobic chance from the crowd. Was that something by design or did that just naturally happen? Uh, that was just Stevie being style. I don't, you know what, I never really asked Stevie. I never asked him about it. I guess ask him, ask him, but um, well, I don't know. He, Steve, he was just good, man. I mean, he, he's great too in what he does. How was your relationship behind the, the scenes with Stevie? Um, I didn't. I didn't really. Just, you know what? He was a young kid just breaking into the business. I mean, I'm not like I'd been there for fucking 20 years or whatever. But um, but you know what I mean? He was a young, shy kid. You know what I mean? I didn't. I didn't start like him. I didn't start to get to know him until I was working with Raven. You know what I mean? I probably, you know, the kid came up and like shook my hand. Probably was like, "Hi, Sam, man." You know what I mean? And that was probably it until we started working together. You know. I didn't like um, either one of them at that, at that point just because I had went to work for him in Baltimore. I think I worked at Rock and Rebel or something like that. They didn't pay me what they told them they were going to pay me, and then they went to the strip club and gave the strippers money. So, I, you know, I, did, I, I didn't like either one of them at that point. Why do you think they split them up as a team? Was it not working? Well, that's what you do when somebody's getting fired, you know, you know what I'm saying? That, that's just what happens with tag teams, you know what I mean? Ooh. But, you know, most likely the idea is to split them up because, uh, because they're both bleeders and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And then, you know, I mean, what happens when you split a tag team like that? Then one of them's gone, then the other one's gone, most likely, you know what I mean? So, and, and I don't know, was Paul calling, the, was Paul booking then? So, yeah, that's probably, I figure, Paulie's psychology then. What went wrong there? I don't know because I'm not, you know, I'm not a technical worker, and uh, but I don't want to do a freaking hour. I don't want to do, I don't want to do two, three minutes after my five minute entrance. You know what I'm saying? But um, well, I don't know. I, I couldn't do a freaking hour, but I don't, you know, an hour or so. I mean, I mean, even if take the like the the Guerrero like Malenko's or the. With the Benoit Guerreros, you remember when those, well, you know, those three, they were doing, Paulie was doing like three out of five pins and stuff like that. I mean, even those guys, you know, the working, working motherfuckers, the best workers in the company at that point by far, you know what I'm saying? And just them guys doing an hour and then trying to do an hour with Tully and, and Shane, you know what I mean? There's a reason, that, there's a reason the crowd didn't like it. What's matter? And it could have been hot, you know, 110 degrees in there, and these guys are working an arm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. ECW crowd. They want, they want to be up on their feet. They, they want to be part of the show. What's going on with manage with with Paul Lee backstage while the fans are turning their back on the company? Oh, I don't know. I, I was probably smoking smoking okay. a joint with the Pimpers or something, or and uh, Johnny Grunge or whatever in the in the back because you know the, it was a big. I don't know if you ever been to the in the back there. Not in the back. In the back of the ECW arena, it was like a big warehouse. You know what I mean? You could go you know a hundred yards this way and go do whatever the heck you want. Yeah, yeah, easy. Um, and nobody cared anyway. I mean, because everybody had their own little outlet or whatever they were doing, wherever they were doing it, you know. What about Tully? Talk to me about Tully coming in. I did not. Did you deal with him at all? Not at all. And I'm, I'm nobody at this point, too, you know what I'm saying? I'm like new in the business, but I'm so worried about my own shit right now, you know what I'm saying? And, and getting myself over, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm so wrapped in my own self but rather than like a Tully, you know what I mean? Is he not getting where the business is going now in 95? What were the problems with the matches with Bob? Just a difference in style. You know, I mean, there were, there were times you wrestle Bob, and you know, Bob is really strong, and he was just in the middle of you making a comeback called Pile Driver. <laughs> you know, and you'd be like, okay. I remember at one time we were in Sacramento, and we're in the middle of the match, and he, takes me to the ropes, he goes, sunset flip. 
and he's the heel, so out of respect, I sunset flip him. I barely got through the curtain, Taker walked up and he says, if I fucking ever see you sunset flip another human being as long as I'm here, I'm off. He said, I'll put the boots to you in the middle of the match. And I was just like, that bad? He goes, dude, you were, he said, it looked like he basically bent over him. He said, your feet were on the floor and you were already, and your back was on the mat. He said, it just this, he said, you, you would have to have seen it. I said, oh, well, you know. So that's, that's an unawareness on whoever's calling the match of who they're working with. Yeah, I'm I not just, telling Kamala to sunset flip. You no, I mean, and on top of that, it's just like there are guys that are, are really good workers, like Steve Regal's for an example. Steve Regal is a great hand, but he has a specific style that he right. works, and it just doesn't. If you're, I need somebody that you know that can make the make movement around me. You know, if you're going to, if we're going to grapple. I mean, it's like, fuck, it's like washing paint, you know, paint yeah. dry. It's just not going to be anything. And Bob was that guy. Bob was, you know, it was a, a more of a grappler. He could have, you know, which was, was, was fine because Brett could work that style. And it wasn't such a, uh, you know, the, the, the height difference between Bob and I was, and he's wanting to lock up. Any Trekkies in the locker room? Anyone marking out for Shatner part? I know that me and Scott Hall have a picture of Shatner between us. You know, yeah, I mean, he is Shatner. I mean, one of the, uh, probably one of the finest uh, actors of our time. Actors of our time. <laughs> Celebrities are often uh, intermingled into angles and stuff, or at least guests on the show, and they either get it or they don't, I'm often told. Did Shatner get it? I think he, yeah, I think after a couple of scotches he did. <laughs> right. see, the, see the picture I have him as a, either he was in the sun that day or <laughs> something got his face red. Nah, I'm, I'm kidding, Will. No. Uh, oh, it's Will, huh? That, yeah, that we're, we're, we're that, that close. Oh, good for you. Yeah. See, I don't remember, you know, I remember the match and stuff like that. And I remember a guy, uh, I, went, I, I think the guy who grabbed, we were on like the, we were on the, um, just like right on the edge where like a guy sitting in the first row, like a bull came up to him. And, and I think Cactus was doing one of them, you know, how he likes to climb shit and stuff like that. I think the guy might have grabbed Cactus instead. Do you remember? I don't. No, this was at the rodeo arena. So there was oh, no yeah. like... Uh, separation, really. They could. No, uh, no, there is. Though I'm talking. Yeah, because you have the people on the on the on the. Um, Are you talking about somebody from the, uh, the from the bleachers? Yeah, from oh, the oh. yeah from the bleachers. Grab went over and grabbed. I don't know why something like that happened, but I know I wore cactus that night. Talk to me about your entrance for a minute. Now this is the, the woman coming in with you, the cigarette, the beard, the whole nine. That's right. Nancy's coming. Nan yeah, and Nancy's at the ring for this too. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. I don't know. It's just. It was a work in progress, really, in like 90, you know what I mean? With did like, you know right away that you were onto something, though? No. No, Paulie did, Todd did, but I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't get it at all until a couple of years, until, until a, you know, a couple of years after that, I realized that, that I didn't realize what was happening when it was happening. So it was just something that you spontaneously did? Because you felt yeah, it? Yeah, well, Todd, pretty much Todd was like, Cack, just go out, because me and Todd were really tight. Me and Paulie was a boss. Mm -hmm. To me, you know what I mean? Todd was my friend. Because me and Todd had known each other for like five years now. Me and him got along great from uh, the very start. So, yeah, so Paul, Paulie was a boss, and Todd was pretty much, Todd was pretty much, hack. just go out there. That's how I ended up drinking and smoking. They were like, well, that's what you're doing in the back anyway. Just go out there and do that. Because before that, I was a good guy that was getting booed. Talk about Cactus from working with Cactus. Now, all these gimmick matches you're going to be great. doing with them. Yeah? Oh, he was so easy to work with. I mean, me and him didn't see eye to eye about some things and stuff, and, and, and rightfully should have been in a, you know, in real, in a real fight at some points in our career. But um, I got so much respect for that guy. And me and him just were like, it was like me and him, like it was like and me and Sabu, not not other guys. It was it was just flu. I mean, it just happened, and you didn't you didn't really have to go over much. You just 
You just went out there and you did it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You, t you know, say, you know, Sam, hey, well, let's maybe throw this by and let's do this. Besides that, we would just go out there and talk to each other. From the time I touched either one of those guys, it was just like, it was like, I don't know, it was like poetry to me. I remember he had, I don't know if it was a tryout match or it was his first match, but you know, the guy comes down and he's got that giant bison head, which, and now as a kid now, I did, I was a huge Moose Chodilak fan growing up in the, in the, in the, in Sheik's territory. And we had Moose Chodilak who had the Moose head. So I, I kind of got the correlation. And uh, I remember, the, I, I want to think it was a dark match or trout. I, I don't know why he was working with Scott. I know it didn't air, so. Um, but he, he, takes the, he takes that hat off, that, that big head, and sits and turns around, and Scott just smacks him with an open hand as hard as you can possibly smack a human being. <laughs> and you're talking about... <laughs> kind of killed that opening. I, I mean, we're just like, we're just sitting there to monitor, we're just going... Oh, like. <laughs> How did he get in the ring with the head? Could he get through the ropes? It was, before he got in it, it was, it, it was, then remember he carried it. Shortly after, after he figured out he really couldn't get in, he, it was one of the, it was like the Vader thing. Remember when Vader would actually carry the big. The gear. Yeah, the, yeah that, they'd lay it down and it would shoot steam, yep. which I thought was effective. I remember when, I, when WCW ran those whole like things, they showed like that, you know, and it, the crowd was below him and he looked like this big giant guy and it was just like, oh my God, this guy's coming, this is gonna be great. And they showed up and he went, okay. Scott always tells the story about um, when he was breaking in and, and he worked with Sabisco. And like Scott was like the big jacked up dude that every, and, every, and you know that, those days a big jacked up dude came into a territory nobody wanted to help him out because that was just especially a big good looking guy like him he's gonna take your spot he's gonna take somebody's spot mm -hmm. you know he he's just he's physically I mean he, he always see that great working punch and people just and and he had a, a match with Zabisco on TV and. Larry just kind of wouldn't kind of kind of blew him off during the day, you know. And he's greenhorn; he's wanting to you know sit and talk about it. And they went out there, and and Larry went through with him. Larry went ten minutes through, and you know just kind of made Scott. And he was just like, why would this guy do that? But then he found out later on. Larry saw something in him. I think Larry and Scott have been friends uh, to this day because of that. Wow. Like you never forget the guy that, that, that kind of goes out of his way to, to do something for you. And, you know, and Larry's always been a class act. My first match of any significance in the Federation was uh, King of the Ring for the, when it was like the Intercontinental, it was like my first title shot. Mm -hmm. And we had the King of the Ring with Nyhart interfer interfering. I think it was in Philadelphia. And Brett was one of those guys that always thought if he had 20 minutes, he just he 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 blocked it like you know five minutes start, five minutes like he, he kind of thought psychology wise and how he set up, to, especially like a, a match of, of, of that was going to be you know like a pay per view match. Back then, you only had five. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, you know, these are, are huge events. And what people don't understand too is you're going into this match and you've been on the road for 22 days. It's not like you've, you've been at home resting, getting some sun. I mean, you know, I'll never forget, I, we passed Lawrence Taylor leaving the, the dollhouse at probably about four in the morning. And Taylor looked at us and he's just like, because he, we, they just did that little angle. You know, he's looking at us like, you guys got to work tomorrow. Like, you guys are in, is as bad as we are. I'm like, yeah. Mm. You know, and that was the whole thing. Like, I don't ever remember, like, the key was, for especially for our group, like, you never went into a pay-per-view without being hung over. I mean, that was like, that was that was a give me. For, for a pay-per-view? Yeah. 
Because you got to feel absolutely miserable because then your focus is just like. Because if you came in there and it was a great day, you wouldn't have, but it's just always that. that oh, God, we should have been. We should have got sleep. <laughs> that was one of those nights, you know, and then this thing here was, you know, it was like a 40 minute match, but it was, it was so, you know, when I looked at it, it was so much laying down time between getting them out and everything else. But my whole thing was this. They really didn't go over what the finish was going to be. And A, I, you know, I, I won in Madison Square Garden, which was our backyard back then. Like that was like, you know, that was, that was your payday. That was, that was kind of the basis of our, of our company was the garden. So to go over in a, in a house show was 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 kind of big because mm -hmm. no, it just didn't happen. Never happened. Thanks. And yeah, and it also, um, you know, going over the garden. So it was you know that that alone, and it was weird because you know three years earlier I was almost out of the business, and now here I am in the garden winning the strap in eight seconds, and I turn around I'm thinking. You know they're going to put this this weight of the world on me, and I'm I'm getting ready to accept it. Then I go to the Royal Rumble, and they don't want to put those Bret Hart eggs in the diesel basket. They don't want to hurt Bret. Maybe this isn't going to work out. So coming out of the shoot, you're a champion, but we're only we're only, your, your pitch counts thirty. <laughs> You know, right? No, you're right, though. And how do they say? How do they propose to you that 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 you're not going to go over on the first pay per view after you win the belt? It's just the way they are, and they and, it, and they don't realize that the business has changed. And when you get in the car that night, you got fucking three or four guys that are going, "That was fucking bullshit." That's fucking fuck them, right? You know, and they would just wind you yeah. up to the point because that's what they do. But do they say at least to you? Do they try and baby face it? Like, listen, I know it looks weird that we're going to do a draw, but we're going to have such a house for SummerSlam when you work with Brett or whatever. The, what the next one would have been, King of the Ring? Or... Yeah, we never. I don't think we touched until he beat me. So by, like a year later, was I think the next one? <laughs> but, but the office or the agent, whoever brings. No, they the finish, all, yeah, always. It? They always try. Yeah, you know, I'll never forget the day that. Um, when, uh, when they gave me the strap, Ben said, you know, this is, it's going to take time. You know, you're a new entity. You know, we're looking at keeping this belt on you like three years. You know, I didn't say that. He said it. So now it's, you know, Sean's really lobbied for that spot. Vince is starting to get it that he doesn't need, a, a he can't have a guy with 24-inch arms. The feds are on them. We're drug tested, mm -hmm. and it's a shoot. Everybody's, you know, everybody's nose be smaller, except I wasn't, because I was clean when I got there. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, they looked around after about six months and went, "That guy's still 320." <laughs> <laughs> Might be one of the reasons you got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's the only reason I got it. I was. We were had a garden show, and Luger was sitting, uh, was standing between Vince and, and Shane, and they were watching it. And they both kept saying, Jesus, look how big he is. Look how big he is. Look how big he is. And I walked back that night in the garden, and there was a six-man elimination tag, which I went over in. And Lex said, you're going to get the strap. I just, they just, you know, they just came all over themselves tonight. Like, they're going to go with you. You're the biggest guy now. They're going to go with you. I said, really? And he said, they're going to go with you. And wow. shortly after that, I got the IC, and then it went, it went from there. When do you guys find out about this stuff that someone's coming from the outside and going to be working up to a WrestleMania? Uh, I mean, I, we knew that there were negotiations with them, and it, I mean, the, the, it was the company was so much smaller. You know, then it, like now when you when I go when I went you know I went back in this last run it's like you have the feeling when you get to the building that like the Eagles are are there like there's 95 buses there's mm. I mean it just it's such a giant operation as opposed to you know a bunch of guys driving up in Luminas you know and then two TV trucks right you know we didn't have trainers we didn't have doctors we didn't have I mean, it was bare bone pro wrestling. 
So no secrets. I mean, you no, know I, something's you happening. know. I mean, everything's everything's. Yeah, it, there's, you know, and when you're together at that period of time, day in day out, even though there's factions and cliques, groups, whatever you want to call them, everybody's in it together because your payday is dependent on whether you like the guy or not across and you're making this work because mm -hmm. you gotta draw a house because if you don't draw a house, you don't do buy rates, you don't sell merch, we're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. There is no downside, there is no, my first contract I was looking at the other day, um, just was nostalgically kind of going through paperwork and seeing what we can toss and what we couldn't toss. And um, the only one I kept was my first Titan booking agreement. Which said? That I was guaranteed 10 shots at $150 a shot wow. per year. $1,500 guarantee. <laughs> you did considerably better than that. Yeah, double that. Be, back, to, <laughs> back to LT. So if, if you see this as a way for you guys to make a little money, put some more ass in seats, there's no resentment. No, because at that point, like this is when the, you know, this is the LT's changed the way the NFL's played. Like there'll never be another LT. He's actually changed, you know, the position of, you know, of of, of, of everything. I mean, all of a sudden, defensive ends are, are basically outside line. Like he's switching the the game of pro football, but he's also got enough of that pro wrestler mentality where he's in enough shit on a day-to-day -day basis where he kind of fits into the pirate ship. That's interesting, yeah. You know, I mean, he's, he's not that, uh, I don't think Tim Tebow would have worked quite as well as Lawrence, put it that way. R r running with you guys. You right. Mean, yeah. I made my first road trip with Dutch in the business. It was me at the wheel, Sid next to me, Dutch Mantel behind uh, Sid, and the one and only, you want to talk about your first road trip, behind me, oh, Baba, the Sheik. The Sheik. Sid, who's the fucking giant jabroni driving us with the mark? I'm not a jabroni, Sheik. Oh, of course you're not, Baba. <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck? Take me into that car for a little bit here. Uh, How long did you have to ride with them? It was, was it one trip or you stayed on the road? I, I, it was, people would rotate in and out, you know, but it was always, like Dutch and I had traveled a lot together. Sid loved to go to the gym, so that was a, a, a no-brainer. And then, you know, Sheik was a, a floater. He'd sometimes join us, sometimes you know, be with somebody else. Was, uh, was Sid a, a, a medicine man? No. No. No, Sid, I, I don't even think Sid drank. Right, and I know you didn't do anything. It's an odd car for cars to end up in, really. Especially when, like, 20 seconds into the ride, I can smell so we smoking <laughs> right, weed right, behind me. Right. And we stopped, we're, we're going to Reynoldsburg, Ohio. We stopped at the World Gym. On the way to the gym, she, oh, the big man, stop, get the Heineken. He, gets, he has like four Heinekens, joins us in the gym a little bit later. <laughs> Does like 135, like 135, just dropping it off his chest. Like, boom. he's got the clubs going. He's got the fucking stocking hat on. I mean, it's just like, and you're looking at just, I'm looking at Sid over there, and he's, you know, he's big old jacked up fucker, and he's just sitting over there, and you got crazy ass Dutch like, reading the USA Today in the front, the pro shop, he ain't even working out. Right, he's not even, <laughs> he's not, have to. and you're just looking at it going, and you look at it and you say to yourself, these are pro wrestlers. The circus these are, is in town. These aren't sports entertainment guys. Yeah. This is a fucking, these, these are characters yeah. that you couldn't fucking create if you were doing a skit. And I mean, I just, I looked at that as, and I remember like when I broke into the business, like the, the best time was always, because you're green, you know that, you, that when you go to the building, it's just a matter of time where you're on the card before you get exposed. So that's a horrible feeling. Mm. It's like that dream you have when you're naked and you got a one inch dick. Mm -hmm. And you're like in the mall during Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that, that whole feeling of, oh God. You know, you'd have a great workout, great day, a couple of good meals, tan, you're laughing with your buddies, get to the building, and all of a sudden your stomach goes, oh. 
I'm going to have to put in eight minutes of just, and I'm going to hear boring and all this shit because I'm going to grab a bear hug somewhere and I'm going to blow up. And it's, oh, God. And that was the whole thing, you know. It was just like, <sighs> but at night when you stopped and got your beer, it was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> then the stories would start, and you would right. always, and all you ever want when you break, when you, I don't care. I mean, it might change now, but all you wanted to do was at some point, because they'd always say, you know, some guy's name would come up, you know. Yeah, you ever work with Wayne Emery? He's a little bit of a dirt bag, but you know what? He can fucking go. Yeah, go give me a good little match. You know, I say to yourself, I just hope someday when my name comes up that I'm considered a good hand. Right. Like somebody that was fun to work with, somebody not like, God damn, it's like pulling a fucking anchor, you know. Who, so, who might you hear that about at this time? Who was pulling the, who, who, was, who was the I anchor? think Kazmaier was a fucking, was one of those guys. Oh, yeah. the, the, the Pillman stories on Kazmaier were classic. Yeah, that whole heart, anybody that, that you know, that, that was in that heart territory, I mean, you know, it was just, th th those stories are, are, are just, you know, I look at that and I said, if I had to break in like that, I, I'd be like, no. Right. I would have went home. Do you remember, did Michael screw up the ending when his one foot hit the floor and... Do you remember any of that happening? Yeah. Didn't they play it back a couple of times? Like they found like an angle where it was questionable? Because it was one instead of two. That's how they said it. And they said, well, yeah. no, it's two feet after hit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just, yeah. I, I, I do remember there being controversy, but it was one of those things like, you know, sorry, it's already booked. Right. <laughs> Talk about Pamela being at the event. She was sweet. I mean, you know, we went out and did a photo shoot with her in Malibu and got to spend a little bit of time with her. And then, uh, you know, she was, her dad was a fan. Mm -hmm. So her, her, actually, she was at the Rumble that Lawrence Taylor was at with her dad. Her dad, uh, you know, came and she, she was like a guest. And she was still with Tommy then. And Tommy, you know, Tommy was there too. But Oh, really? Yeah, Tommy came to the building and... Uh, God, what was that like in Tampa? The Sun Sun Dome or whatever that was. What that I have here? It's at the. Uh, I'm all, I know it was in Tampa. Sun Dome, Tampa. There you go. Yeah, it's a good memory. Not bad for an old timer. Um, Tommy probably would have fit right in with your running mates and yourself pretty well, no? Oh yeah, he would have been a good fit. Good one, yeah. Quote, yeah, I used steroids. It was in 1986 for the first time. I don't think there was a person, you know, in that muscle head realm of thinking that wasn't curious. It became almost chic to take the juice. One thing really made me want to come to the WWF was, that, uh, was the even playing field. They had a drug program that was, as they say in the business, a shoot. It was for real. But where I, when I was with Turner, everyone's on it. You got to be on it or you're not going to get promoted. With the WWF, it's the opposite. Did you feel that way at the time? Yes. Um, Plus, I was I was also in that early early position of being completely brainwashed, you know, because you're the spokesperson for the you know, for the corp for the company. Well, was it true? Yeah, we weren't. We were. We. I mean, it was so bad, it was killing us financially. And you would see it in your paycheck, but you would piss at the spectrum on a, on like a Saturday or Sunday do a double shot in Hershey and those fucking white coats would be in Hershey and they would piss you again. Do you pay for each test? No. You don't have to. But the company is. Right. And I mean, you know, they're not throwing samples out. Mm -hmm. Federal government, I mean, that's all they'd need is if there was any kind of tampering, we're going to go to a court case. I mean, it was it was a situation where fuck, I mean, you, you it was like you couldn't do anything. You couldn't smoke, you couldn't, you know, I don't think they were, and the thing was, it was just like, well, it was a situation where, you know, there's no alcohol clause in anybody's contract, and, you know, gimmicks are gimmicks. Mm -hmm. What did the company make of UFC at this time? This is when this is starting to take off. It hasn't. 
achieved anywhere near mainstream popularity, but it's, it's getting a lot of press. And maybe Vince sees this as possible crossover thing, or was it talked about at all? No, I think it was more that, that, that he, being from out in Vegas and kind of where that was kind of becoming, it was something in Vegas before it was something right. anywhere Right, so it's something else. Charles did Yeah, that. it was something that he knew, you know, Especially working in the bit in the in the industry that he he's always worked in, he's always worked in and out of the strip club. So you know, where do where do guys that are MMA fighters hang out? Probably the strip, library. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Probably strip clubs. So I'm sure that he you know had a had a a, a, a closer uh, field that that was something that was going to take off, and he incorporated that into into a, a gimmick that was you know if you look back at it was was you know light years ahead of any, mm -hmm. anything else. So maybe he's actually. He may be clairvoyant. I think they're going to do the George things. C. Scott clairvoyant, and they're actually going to put Charles in, in the George C. Scott spot. He could handle it. And he won't accept the Oscar. Um, talk to me about Matt and Jeff as enhancement talent uh, at the time. Did you take notice of them? or Jeff was, you? Jeff was. Um, I don't even know if Jeff was at legal age the first time I met him, and it was like in White Plains or something like that. And at the time, he had a haircut like Vanilla Ice, and we used to call him Vanilla Ice. Uh -huh. And, uh, but Scott would always handpick him to work his, his matches with because he was good and Scott would always give him stuff. Mm. And it would drive Vince crazy. Because, you know, it was just chopped meat. You never gave the right. enhancement guy anything. Right. Scott would always give him something. Scott would, you know, he'd take a drop kick and Scott would bump. Well, it's kind of nice of those guys. Scott right? knew talent. I mean, yeah. Scott, you know, he, he, Scott would always say, this kid's special, this kid's special, this kid's special. And, and he was, you know, and is. I never even actually talked to Cactus about it. I was mad at him because he was too stupid. Because he's going back and telling Todd and uh, fucking uh, Paul Lee, like, oh, I don't want the same man drunk for this. Now, that's the thing. I said, hey, it was great working with Cactus, but sometimes whoever I wanted to punch him the fuck out. Because he, wait, I had never heard him in a match. He, he had already, he, he, he knocks me out. And wait a minute, don't go back and complain to the boss and say, I'm being stiff with you. When you knocked me out with a, with a metal pin that you know you shouldn't have freaking, hit, you know, you just shouldn't have done it. Did you talk to him right after the match? No, I was clueless. I didn't wake up until the next day in the freaking hospital. And I didn't know where I was. And the doctor said, go back to sleep. And I only remember that because my wife told me that because they called her because I was in the back afterwards. I didn't know where the fuck I was. And I kept asking Todd, it's like, did I win? Did I lose? Did I win my match? And Todd's like, oh, you're, something's wrong with him. He was one of the first guys that I had actually talked to. Like I, it wasn't we were, we were in no way friends, but you know I'd, I actually you know, I knew him. You know, sat in the locker room, talked to him, and, and, and been around him a little bit. And um, but I mean, you know, everybody's um, demons are like before you ever meet that person. Like there's those, you know, the, the oh God, I, you know. That guy's a maniac. This guy's a maniac, and he was one of those guys where they said, "You know, he's completely, you know, he's." So when guys like that were were were, were going down, you know, it's completely different. When you look I, I, when you look back now. Like I was, I was talking to somebody. I have pictures of eleven, like me and nine other guys, or me and eleven guys, and there, I have pictures that I'm the only guy that's alive. And you know, like one has uh, had a softball game. It's like, and the last two guys that were alive in it were me and Mach, and then Mach just just passed. And now that made me the only guy. And you start to look at that and go, I, I ran pretty hard. Like when you know, you know, when well, you stop. Though. Yeah, but I mean, it's still it's just like you know how much, you know. I go to I go to cardiologist every three months, but it's just it's still. My whole thing is. I'm so worried uh, because of the lifestyle I used to live that someday I'm going to croak at say 60 and it's going to be, you know, I'm going to get this whole, yeah, he was one of the guys and he's on that list. And it's just like, no, 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 no. Number one, my dad died at 36. He wasn't one of the boys, <laughs> you know. I got, I, got, I got bad genetics and on top of that, 
when you go to the dog park, ask the fucker with the Great Dane how old it is. I guarantee you he doesn't say 16. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, so, and, and, and that's the whole thing, you know. It's like, I don't expect to fucking see 70. But now, Eddie, at this time in 1995, it's not, it's not epidemic yet. It's, it's no. happening a little bit. Um, so is there widespread cause for concern in the locker room, or are you guys refraining from doing stuff just because you're getting tested? Oh well, yeah, well, I mean nobody's nobody's smoking any. I mean it's that's not even a, uh, a consideration to get high. So, but when you're on the road that much, especially you know you're leaving, you're doing like eight shots in the Northeast, and then the next night you're in Anaheim. So you're like in Boston on a six forty-five. Mm -hmm. You go into Anaheim. You know that. Even though that's, I think, one of the longest flights. I think it's like 453 or whatever. I think it is the longest flight in the continental U.S. I think that's the longest. Uh, and you know these things because you better have your gimmicks and everything in you because you've got to be down when landing gear goes up because that's your five hours of sleep. You don't get that five hours of sleep. You're not going to make it to the gym. You're not going to, it's just, you know. And you get in and it's nine something o'clock and you can't check in right. you know you can't check in till three so it's like you got to still drive to anaheim from lax it's you know you're gonna run the form the next night and it's just like you know it's it's one of those things where it, it it's the culture yeah is it fun to get by uh, uh, get a buzz yeah everybody likes to get a buzz but also it starts off as a almost a necessity and you and we 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 you know we'd all deemed it the Elvis lifestyle, you know you got you got to you got to drop the landing gear, but guess what? Bing bing bell time. You better you got to go this way, and good luck getting a fucking cup of coffee in half these arenas. Back if you couldn't get a cup of coffee in Mass Square Garden if you had a winning lottery ticket. They didn't do any kind of catering Nothing. for you at the time. Not a fucking thing. For TVs even, because you're there a long oh, fuck. time. We were cutting back so much. We're going to catering, you have ham sandwiches. Wow. You go to catering now, it's just like, geez, are you kidding me? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. We had to lobby to get him in. Why? He had the, you know, he had the problem with Arn. Oh, the stabbing, yeah. Yeah, that whole incident had, had came out. He had that loose cannon, like he wasn't all there. And I remember sitting, the first meeting that Vince had with Sid was in the weight, was in the Titan Tower in the weight room, in the locker room with me and Sean and Sid. And we basically sold Sid to Vince. And we went forward from there. But like, like I, you know, we were, you know, I always, I always got along with Sid. I've always, you know, thought he was money. And, what, uh, um, why didn't you think there would be problems with Sid? He's always kind of had a rep. Why did you think it would? be? Well, I mean, when, when somebody sits there and looks at you and says, uh, "We're going to give you Hulk's boots, and you're going to take it, take it forward." Yeah, Vince, but I kind of want to be a big vicious heel. <laughs> No, we're going to give you the, the key to the fucking kingdom. Yeah. I understand that, but I really think my money is this big, vicious heel. <laughs> it's kind of hard to get a guy back in after that situation. You know, it's just like Vince is like, fuck, I've got. And it was almost one of the things like, you, deal, you fuckers deal with him. Right. Right? You want him, you want him part of this deal, you deal with him. It's your, you work it out. You know? And I was like, cool. So it came in. It was kind of cool because they had like a uh, a post thing out at uh, at a place called Rawhide, which I, I, I later it was in Phoenix. I later you know, I lived there at the time, and uh, which made it you know perfect. It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't like they had to fly me anywhere. Oh. But the, the the kicker was that they waited so long, and they, the limos were all gone. So waited so long for what? They waited so long to book a limo. Uh. I think they're like, you know, who's ever in charge? And I, I know it was this fucking Lisa Wolf bitch. 
if you're out there, fuck you. Why the heat? I hated her. She came in from the NFL. They brought her in. It's another one of these people that come from an outside entity. And the first time I ever had a conversation with her, she looks at me and she goes, it's just like the NFL. You're the quarterback. Your wife is the quarterback's wife. She's in charge. I said, do you understand, bitch, that we don't all fucking play for the same team in the same fucking city? I'm the only motherfucker in Phoenix. My wife isn't going to fucking be flying around me. It's No, it doesn't work that way. This is the work. <laughs> and she's in charge. And she's like third and, like she's got power. Wow. And it's like, now it's, it's almost like a witch hunt for us. We're just trying to drive a stake in her heart as quick as we can to get her out of there. How did, how, how did she go finally? We, how long did she oh, last? We, we fucked her at that NFL 50th uh, anniversary thing. She got us, she told us we were going to, you know, Vince wanted, I think Taker was in gear. This is how, you know, this is still at that point. I would gotten heat for showing up on Kathy Lee in a blue suit in right, Regis. I got right. fucking, I mean, I got serious heat. I got, as soon as I got off that fucking show, man, it was just like, you need to call Vince. Wow. Because I wasn't in my fucking gear with a belt. Right. You know? So Taker shows up in... In gear. gear. And the rest of us, they get us off the rack fucking uh, tuxes. And I mean, you could have put three of me in mine. And I just and I just was waiting. It was something that she did. And I just said, you know what? I said, it's time. And I said, I ain't fucking going down there. Luger's over there in a fucking custom-made Calvin Klein, you know, tux. And I, I look like, you know... I've got Abby's coat on. And it was her job to, to arrange for all this. All this. And I said, I'm our world champion. I'm going to go down there in the fucking NFL's 50th on television with Diana Ross singing. And you're, I'm going to fucking have this fucking thing on. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it. So they had like, Chinese tailors come to our room and like work just in a frenzy to try to get this thing together in the hour and 45 minutes before we go on air. And it was just one of those deals where it was just like that. It was like, wow. the, it was like the, the, we, she was on the stake, and we finally just went. And, that, and, she, and she was gone. She was gone day. shortly after that. And fuck you and good riddance. By the way, the bill for those Chinese tailors was eleven dollars <laughs> and sixty-seven cents for the entire time they were there. Sixteen hours. <laughs> Ain't another one. Oh, is a talker? Ah, oh, man, he's cold. He's cold. I don't like to really work with him that much, but. What's that? <laughs> another guy, I don't know, he's a pain in the ass. He's a prima donna. He's been, he's been known to be a prima donna. With you specifically? Well, with everybody, because he changed the franchise. You know what I mean? I'm sure other people have told you this. Well, he I can't was, be he the only here. guy that says everybody's a prima donna. <laughs> I, you know, he could say, call me a drunk, Shane, but you know, you're a you know, prima donna. I guess we all are to a point, but isn't ego a prerequisite? It has to be. Business? I mean, to get to the to get to the heights there, yeah. There's a, your ego is the reason that you're there. You didn't just. I mean, you might have stumbled on it like if you were a football player or something like that. And you needed to make money, and you did it like that. You know what I mean? But um, but for the most part, yeah, you gotta have an ego, or you or you just. Uh, I, I don't know. I just don't think you do it. I mean, you know, ego plays a lot. To ask a CEO of a company or just somebody who's a high up manager in a company or something like that. You know what I mean? I think ego has to play, has to do with their job just as much as it has to do with my job. Deluxe Express went up. That was a pretty, when you're, Go into a town to do TV, and you get there, and like I've said before, you know, this was prior to cell phones. Prior, I mean, you pull up to fucking some place, and there happens to be the Smith family reunion, <laughs> and there's no hotel rooms anywhere, and you're fucking sleeping in cars, and all of a sudden, right before TV comes, this fucking bus, this air conditioned bus with this guy in it that's not getting over, you know. I mean, I love I love Lex. I think he's a. And there was the thing is, it wasn't like anybody didn't like Lex the guy. It's just like a, like a, here's a, here's here's a, a typical one. We're in Halifax. 
and we're getting ready to do TV. It's taped. And they've got the, I don't know what it's called, but you know, the, the steel poles with the curtains to, to kind of cor coordinate uh, or... Cordon the, off areas. Yeah, of and the, it's, yeah. this is like the backstage to where you mm -hmm. go and Lex is gonna, and Lex gets tangled up in it and like takes down like fucking about 40 feet of this shit. And fucking Scott just, just jumps up and goes, motherfucker, come, I, is anybody watching this besides me? Because this is when they, you know, he, he, Scott's on TV with the American flag when they're doing the thing and he's behind just as sarcastic as he can. Scott's got two of them and he's walking up and down the aisleways with Lex going. Mm -hmm. Like Scott's this going, is during his push. This is yeah, during Lex's and, push. And Scott's going like, you know, fuck that. Yeah. This is this. I'm, you know, how about me? I know I don't. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the squeaky wheel. I know I fucking. I've had the belt, the IC belt, fifteen fucking times because I'm not afraid to do a job for anybody because I'm bulletproof. But come on, really? Did he ever try any pull uh, Lex? Rather, did he ever try and pull anything with you guys from a power standpoint as it was shifting away from him? And no, because he knew he needed us. When you can't fucking work, last thing you want to do is fuck with a guy like Shawn Michaels, who will not be afraid on, on, on a pay-per-view or TV to make you, or fucking look at you and go, get off the ground, you fat piece of shit! Vader. <laughs> Leon. <laughs> I mean, he's, I mean, you know, Shawn's a different cat now, but boy, I miss that old one. Would he be reprimanded for what he said about Lex in an interview. Because right or not. wrong, you don't... Uh, not, not Sean. No. Sean was the only one that could kick the door and tell Vince to fuck you. Right. Did he? Yes. <laughs> because he was money. Always. But it was, on top of that, it was just like, nobody had more passion than Sean. Was he agenting? Yeah, he was one of my. He was a, like a, a, one of the first guys that really. He um, while I was bodyguarding, I, I we went over to Europe, and Chief was the uh, it was a road agent, and I was opening a match with Virgil, and we actually put together like a, a decent match, and uh, Chief would just kind of construct little pieces every night, and it, it was like his baby, like I was kind of his you know his project. You know, some nights you'd come home and you, you know come, come through the, the curtain and you said, "Chief, how was it?" And Chief would sit there and go, "I never understood what it meant, but I knew it wasn't good." He said, "You could have had that fucking match in an iron lung." <laughs> I don't know what it means, but it just doesn't sound like it's like an accolade of any kind. No, it's not positive. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, Chief was uh, and Chief uh, came back and we ended up me and Virgil ended up having that match on Raw. Like, so Chief was good at yeah. his job. I only hear jabs at him and what he did. Well, you know, it's one of those things where when you watch a tape back at, 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 at Chief J. Strombo's uh, work, it wasn't like, but you know what? I've never seen a fucking tape when he fucking drops those fucking hands back and starts doing his shit. I don't see people sitting on their they pop. asses. No, they pop. So to me, it's just like, that was still the era of he's getting away, he's over and he's not doing shit. So obviously he knows. Right. He's getting a response and he ain't doing shit. For us to, you know, he knows. So fucking pony up to him because it's, that's, it's still people don't give you everything. You know, a guy like Lawler, I remember the first time I worked with Jerry, I said, fuck, I can't wait to work with you tonight, man. If I can get some of your knowledge. I said, fuck you, man. I've been working 25 years to learn this shit. Learn on your own. I was like, okay. Sorry for the potato. Do you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> My bad ahead of time. <laughs> what did you say uh, to a young guy who would come up to you? Were you more of a Lawler or more of a Chief Jay? I would, I would be more than happy to tell somebody that they had a match that, that could happen in ironing lung. No, I, I've i never considered myself, I've been more of a, J, a Chief J. Strombo in my career than I have a Bret Hart. Like for me, to me, to come out, to come and tell you something like, uh, when you're doing that fucking uh, Chinese fucking whatever you guys do, where you roll around and do that shit, 
I don't think you're doing it right. I wouldn't fucking know. <laughs> but it, when, it, when it got to the era of the, I grab you, flip you, you flip me, and it, you can, and it just looks like two guys from Cirque du Soleil doing a tumbling routine, and you can obviously see that they're helping each other through the, right. the movements. It's just like, at what point do you go, all right, I can't chain wrestle, but that fucking blows. Right. I mean, just from a standpoint of I was a mark at one time, and I actually watched this, and I would not fucking watch that. Yeah, as a fan, you're not bothered. Yeah, it. I yeah. just have I'm uncle. You know, uncle on that. <laughs> Doing these kind of things, is, is the press, the legitimate press that's there, are they taking it seriously or, or are they always snarky and like suppressing always. a smile? Always, always, yeah. Always, 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 always that. Right. Mm, we're here, you know, they do draw a crowd, but you know. God forbid, let's fucking, uh, let's, let's cover that sweet ass fucking Masters for six hours. Fucking, I'm brought to you by Ambien. Is uh, the thing with LT kissing Bam Bam, was that planned or is that an LT thing that was spontaneous? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that, you know, it wasn't like Lawrence wasn't, and, and that was the key, you know, we, we did it in New York, we had Lawrence, so we knew we were going to get press. Yeah. And that's like that's one of the reasons you, know, you you grab a guy like that, um, but you know in, in the long term it was like that that match got more hype than me and Sean did. So once again, yeah, I'm I'm going to my first mania on top, but I'm not on top. We'll get to that. I set up the whole box thing. I had both of us wearing the same. Thing. I got the red white. I got those pants at um, at uh, Gary Gary Wolf, one of the pitbulls. His dad used to do um over in Jersey. There was a um a racetrack, and he used to have a, a a flea market there every day. I still love flea markets. And I found them pants there because we were going to do this uh, Terry fuck out of the box thing. You know what I mean? And everybody thought that was a great idea. I I was the one who set the container up. I just like the. The scaffolding match, I was the one that set all that shit up. The sca I did all that stuff, whatever we were doing, gimmick matches. But uh, the fuck out of the box is the greatest win. When you see him in the ring and he's got the and he's got the, the cloth that I went to a store and I bought like uh, two, square, two, three square yards of cloth because it had to cover everything. And we wanted to get him in the ring. And then when he pulls the thing off, to, and, he, and the, the, um, the hard camera's behind him and he's just turning like that. And you don't even know on the hard camera that it's Terry Funk yet. Just watch the people in the audience's reaction when he spins to the crowd. And then when he turns around and you see it's him, it's, it's, it's some, some riveting shit. With the press we're talking about and the testing and stuff, the office is probably pretty irate at this news. Yeah, the only thing that kind of, I think that, 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 you know, Brian wasn't really, you know, he was kind of in the middle of the card. Right. You know, so that was kind of the only kind of saving grace if there was anything. But, but in the press, there's those letters oh, WWF yeah. and steroids and guns and... and... I'm thinking, I remember when that went down, I'm thinking, Kona? Like, really? Hawaii? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. really? Like, with the, you know, this is before dog. I mean, like, wh right. what the f How do you get busted in Kona with, with like, anything? <laughs> Did you know he lived there? Yeah. Uh, you know? I just, I just I said, you know what? The fuck? Blonde mullet on the island didn't work. <laughs> Did you have fond memories of him? He has some Great past, guy. of course. But. Great guy. Funny as fuck. Really? I mean, yeah. Really dry Bob Newhart sense of humor. Really? Yeah. Traveled a lot with him. I mean, like just him and I. And he was another guy that you know. I love a guy that, that that no matter what you do the night before, how bad you get, the phone ring. If you if you look at each other in a complete stupor, say we're getting up at eleven and going to the gym. And at eleven o two, that phone rings. He's like, downstairs, are we going to the gym? Like, I'm coming. 
I got my coffee in my it's like I, that you you because you need that. Mm. I always, that was my philosophy in this business. It if you, if I spent if I made a dollar every day that I went to the gym, and I went out and spent ninety eight cents, I still had two cents left. If I went to the gym the next day, and that that was kind of the if you kind of had all the bullshit addictions that you had that were were unpositive. This was the one positive addiction that made a difference. It did get the toxins out of you. You felt better. You went to the building with that pump. You were warm. You you know, you kept yourself strong. You did your cardio. You did, I think that was a difference. You know, people look at me and they go, you really, like when I dyed my hair black, like, you really haven't aged since like 95. And I'm like, well, yeah, I take care of myself. I always ate good. I, didn't, I never ate shit. I always went to the gym. I, you know, I was smart. I knew that once my body was, I came into this business fucked. Mm. I was crippled. I was, you know, I couldn't. I, I was done. I, I blew my knee out so bad in, in Europe that right. I was never going to have an athletic anything. And then when I found, when I went and watched, I watched Hulk, uh, Joe Lewis, and I watched him work, and I watched what he did, and I said, I'm I'm a better athlete than he is, even on one leg. Not to be a dick. You know, just, but that's it, literally what convinced you that you could do it. When you I, watched yeah, because I watched him because he was all about charisma, being bigger. I thought when they said he was six foot nine on TV, I thought he was six foot nine. Right. He walked down the aisle way, and I was like three rows back, and I'm looking on top of his fucking hat. I'm like, he's six four. Hmm. I'm thinking to myself like, fuck, man, like this is this is I, I get it. It's this is such a fucking work. See how many careers Hulk has inspired. When you think, I was of a that. mark for him. I thought, I mean, he's he's one of the he's the reason I got in the business. What about the raver? Raven Dreamer feud, the matching awesome. of those personalities. It was great, man. It was just great with the girls involved and everything like that. And both those guys, freaking uh, super intelligent guys, when it comes to this business. And um, it was just, it was just great business. I mean, great, but to get all that to culminate into somehow Kimono Wanalei and 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 Buell McGillicuddy making out. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, by the time it was all said and done, and and the pregnancy thing. I mean, it was just, it was awesome. Did they get along behind yeah, the scenes? Yeah, everybody got along. You gotta understand, you get along no matter what. Even if you don't get along, you get along. I mean, you don't get along when you go home and tell your family about it, like, I hate this fucking guy or something like that, you know what I mean? But pretty much, that was, we all we all dressed in the same locker room, you know what I mean? It was it was a, much more of a family than it would be, like, say, mm -hmm. today in any, in any locker room. Uh, is anyone afraid of getting involved when there's gonna be real fire? You one of us were. We you didn't were. Give a shit. No, nobody cared about that. Yeah, we're freaking more worried about getting our necks broken or something like that than a little bit of fire. Not at all. We'll talk about working with fire. Are you doing anything different? Are you being more cautious? Are you not? Well, I done it with Sabu. You know, I mean, like flash paper and stuff like that. But no, no, I mean, I mean, if you if there was somebody pouring gasoline in the middle of the fire. And like I don't know, I, you know, have, have I been out there with the Dudleys, the Dudleys fucking um, using their lighter fluid? Um, yeah, but even then, yeah, you know what? No, I've been near one of those tables and it was real hot, but yeah, never really. In fact, I had to slide them the lighter because they didn't have a lighter. They lost the one that they had, and I had it back up in my pocket. Hey, catch me! I, I, I slide them all the way on one side of the ring, and they don't have a lighter, and I slide them the other one. Um. Is Paulie saying anything to you before you're working with real fire? Is he reminding you of a lot? Yeah, why is it, are these? These sounds like lawsuit questions. <laughs> sound like it sounds like a lawsuit. It sounds like a, it sounds like I'm being deposed. Yeah, All right, who got of, hurt in the fire? You know what I'm saying? No, it totally sounded like I was being deposed here. Are you, Razor, and Sean all tight at this point? I mean, has a click formed yet? From the, the day I walked into the Albany locker room, hmm. the 
the first day, the first day that Shawn Michaels turned around to me and he went, Hi, I'm Shawn Michaels. I went, that voice comes out of that motherfucker? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, you know, when I, I mean, I've done nothing in my career. It's my first show. I've, I've, I've went to Steinbrenner's house and met, and met the fucking owner of the Yankees. Vince. In circumstance. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I met Vince. I've been mean, in our business. He's like Steinbrenner. Right, so right. I've been to Steinbrenner's house. You know, he comes to the door with an Eichel Pro. Hey, how you doing? I'm oh, bigger than I thought you were. Come out to the pool. An Eichel Pro t shirt, do you mean? The fucking cut off belly, fucking loose neck. Oh, fucking classic, you know? Pull Was up. he jacked? I, I, he always has been in good shape, yeah. you know? He's, he's fucking Vince, you know? But he's, and he, you know, the good hard handshake. He's a guy. He's a, Vince is a guy, you know? The guy's a guy. You just know that the minute you meet him, you know. He just, you know, ah, uh, fucking Vince. <laughs>saying that stuff on TV was not was probably a no-no not even not yeah. done it was probably yeah. not and we're starting to push that envelope too we're, that we're starting to realize that you know this is the, the kind of the there was that era where every guy that they brought in was just like you weren't a wrestler you were an occupation you were a plumber you were a trashman you were a pig farmer you right. were a blue blood you were Everybody had to be, and then all of a sudden it, it was starting to get to the point where, no, this sh the way this is going to work is guys fighting against guys. It's worked in fucking pro boxing forever. Still, I mean, when there's really a fucking a, a top prize fight, you know, Mayweather or somebody, if Mayweather fights Pacquiao, I don't give a fuck what anybody says. You could have the return of every UFC guy on the planet run a show that night and ain't one motherfucker gonna watch that. Cause still fucking, when you have a shoot boxing fucking gimmick, and it's especially with that HBO 24 seven, the way they package the it out. up, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, fuck, I'll, I'll, I, they, those things get me, I, I, neither guy even speaks English. I'm fucking reading subtitles going, fuck, I'm buying this thing. I wanna <laughs> see what the guy that fucking had the cast on earlier wins or not. But, uh, you know, that was the whole thing was it, we started to realize, it was like the angle we did when, when Owen fucking kicked Sean and we put that together in the car, the whole fucking thing. And I remember looking at, looking at Sean, I said, and everybody's got to come out of the locker room Rick kayfabe. Like, Hill's got to be out there. And I said, and this is right after Ripken had, had went over the streak and he, he made the, he went around the stadium and uh, Boomer didn't say a fucking word for like two minutes. It was like the first time I've ever seen a sporting event where they just let it become organic and right. let, let the moment tell the story without somebody going, oh my God! Ah, ah. And I said, I said, and I said and the, the thing is to make it real is the commentators gotta shut the fuck up, stand up, take off their headphones and people are gonna buy the fact that Sean's fucked. And then they bought it. People bought it. People were calling around trying to figure out what hospital it was in. It was certainly, we got to the point of the realer we can make this in this, the way our society is changing, this is, needs to be real. You know? And, and be, that played a part in those dropping those words like I'm going to go yeah, over right. here and there. Okay. And it was just like, you know, because we, we knew that there was, the one basis you can always count on is the smarts. You know, the smarts are always, you know, I love, I, love, I love when a smart says, you know what, that was the worst fucking pay-per-view I've ever seen in my life, and I will not fucking buy another one until next month. <laughs> because that's, there are, I mean, whether you hate them or love them or don't, you know, and I'm such a darling of them. You know, I'm probably one of the top, top five guys of all time. They love you, they love you, me and, they love your title. Right yeah, now. me yeah. and uh, me and uh, Shiguro Onaki that uh, worked in the Corkian Hall last night for Match of the Year that four people saw. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs>
Like my wife is actually going to go to WrestleMania. Why just WrestleMania? Because they'll fly her in. Because they have fucking basically pigeonholed her to the point where Linda is actually, please come, please come. Uh, you know, so I know my wife's going to be there, which is the added stress of, you know, even though it's just across the fucking road, I don't want her on the pirate ship at all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so now I, I've, I've got Sean, who I know is going to try to fucking blow me up. I know for a fact he's going to try to blow me up. He's going to try to outperform me because he wants my fucking spot. We're best friends, but I know what his fucking motivations are. But you're a bit, you can lean on him a little. Oh, I did. Blow him up, yeah. Okay. I fucking, as soon as I fucking saw him suck that hair down his throat, I fucking hooked him, boom. <laughs> <laughs> How we doing now? <laughs> exactly. You know, but, but you know, if you ever watch that fucking opening three minutes, I mean... Fucking bolt cutting around that fucking those spots any faster than he was running, yeah. you know. And then we got out and got tied up in all those fucking press and had to shoot fight through them to get to the spot. In fact, we went back in. I was just like, oh man, we got like twenty four left and I'm gone. Does he? Uh, do you? What do you talk about before the match? Your friends and you know you really have to have a spotlight match on this card, even though you're not in the yeah. main main event. We'll get to that. Um, what do you talk about before the match? The beauty of, of working every fucking night of your life is you've had, and, and, and people have to realize that we only had an hour of television back then on Raw. Right. You know, so, and for there to be a, a match of any significance on Raw was very rare. So, I'm working let's say, Brett on the house shows. And then, I've, but I just got done working, say, Lex for three months. Now, this is the first time you're gonna see me and Lex on TV. We've touched 90 times. There's none of this fumble fucking around. It's, you know, everybody's got a feel for what everybody does and, every, and that's why the matches are, are pretty damn tight. You know, and you're only going eight to twelve if if it's a match of any significance. So by this time, Sean and I have been in in some form or fashion involved with each other for almost three years. So I know every even just sitting on the apron for the six or eight months that I was his bodyguard, I I knew everything he did. You know, I knew what he called everything. I knew I knew the sequences. I knew wh how he would rotate out of things. So it was like, I knew, you know, like in the, in the movie Patton, Rommel, I've read your fucking book. Mm. Like I knew Shawn Michaels, and I knew what he was going to do. But he doesn't even walk by and go, going to go real fast for the first few minutes. Get ready. Like, no, he's not. If, 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 if he needs to tell me that, I shouldn't be where I'm at. Right. You know? But maybe to, um, to, to shake you up a little bit. I wouldn't like, have done that. Yeah. I said, fuck it, I'll knock you out. <laughs> Can't do much when I don't get hit in the temple. No, but that was, Sean won that spot. Everybody knew the fucking Sean was lobbying for that spot. And it was just like, that's great, but guess what? When you go through the fucking airport, I'm still the biggest guy. <laughs> Vince don't care. He still thinks it's a big man sport. You gotta convince him. Oh, I know how you can do it. Take the worst power bomb in the history of fucking pro wrestling for the finish. How's that possible? Sean could fucking stand and take a power bomb without anybody giving it to him better than he took the one in that match. Why? Why not? <laughs> Talk to me about who, who went down the fucking uh, zip line at the next WrestleMania? Was it Diesel? No. No. <laughs> I rest my case. No animosity though. I mean, that's just hey, that's that's the the shark environment. If you couldn't fucking, if, if you could go fuck with somebody else and you can't fuck with the guys in your car. Right. I mean, that was the way, it, it was, we were all, hey, we're 1099s. He's Hickenbottom Enterprises, I'm, I'm Spartacus Entertainment. We're LLCs, we're doing our things and, you know. Right, friends or not, it's still. It's know, still business. Right. Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, two of the names you hear uh, very often as being uh, guys that you want to work with in the ring. Compare them for me. Uh, 
God, I mean, you know, so many, that's the, 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 the problem they did this is they're so, even though they're, they're chocolate and vanilla as far as, I mean, you know, it, it's, they're competitive, they're, you know, Brett would always look at you and say, it's real, it's all real. And if he put you in that sharpshooter, fuck, you thought you were like, Jesus, easy, dude. And, uh, and it was the same way. I think that, you know, Brett being uh, born into that, basically just genetically engineered to be, you know, a pro wrestler. And when you, you know, even when you watch a guy like Cena, you know, watch a tape of a guy like Cena, here's a guy that's got, a, at eight years old, has got a world belt made and put around him. And Sean's, you know, got, you know, doing suplexes with his buddies into the, into the pool. I was playing sports, I was playing hoops. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, my mindset's completely different. I blew my knee out of, of what my dream was, and I looked and saw something that still let me be an athlete that I could pull off with fucking one and a half legs. And I said, and I can make cash? Like, right. And I learned as I got into it, I mean, I, you, you, you know, you either do this and fall in love with it or you don't make it. Like if it's, if it's just, I guarantee you, it, you go to fucking White Plains and you're paid these 300 fucking bucks on top, you're really not fucking doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. That's when me and Scott left. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm tired of doing the fucking starving artists. I'm ready to do the fucking signed lithograms. When you went to WCW? Yeah, I mean, yeah. just like, I'm tired of it. I just, I can't, you know, I love the business, but fucking, I, I, I actually love money more. I, um, know. It's reported in the, uh, at the time in the tabloids that Sean, uh, got into an altercation with Pamela Anderson's husband backstage because Michaels had a fling with Anderson before she's met. Any truth to this? No. Okay. Um, okay, let's get to it. You're in the main event, but maybe not. Kind of like that. You're our guy. We're going with you, but maybe not. Yes. Yeah, we're going to give you 60 pitches this, uh, this outing. You don't close the show. No. Should you have closed the show with Lawrence Taylor on the card? Yeah, because we're the championship, we're the title match, and it's not like The Rock coming back. It's not like you, one of the boys is coming back. It's you don't know what kind of match they're gonna have. Thank God, Bam Bam was so you know was so talented. He was, and and Taylor was an amazing athlete, and they pulled it off. But that was that was Bam Bam. I mean, you know, people have no idea what a great worker he was. Mm. You know, yeah, he, you know, just Scott never gets enough credit for that, and he was, you know, he was very anti-click. You know, he, he we, we, you know, we weren't like buddies or anything, but I mean, I remember we had a meeting one time and we were going over different guys, and it was the click was having a meeting. The click was we were going on strike. I remember this. What was it over? Um, a couple. Of, one of the things was um, you called Vince, didn't you? Yeah. We called them from like, I think we're in Indianapolis. Yeah, we're in Indianapolis. We're at like a Spring Hill Suites. And we went across the street to a Coco's that was hooked to a La Quinta's. And there was two pay phones up front. And we'd already been grumbling. You know, shit just wasn't going the way the click saw, thought, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> so you're running the... The world according to the click just wasn't working. It wasn't working. And... Are you trying to run the company? No, because we're trying... We're, we're not trying to run the company. We're trying to make the company as successful as possible because we're all in a position to reap the benefits. Okay. It's like... And it's one... And I think this is the first time in the history of the business that guys are going... What'd you get for Survivor Series? I got 60 grand. T tell me your fucking line, Sean. I got 60 grand. I got fucking 45. Scott and I worked the whole fucking match. You came in and super kicked and you got more? Fuck this, boom, bam. JJ, what the fuck's with Sean's payoff? Uh, hold on one second, big guy. Vince, they're fucking talking. Big D! <laughs> I look into that and get back with you. Oh yeah, counting there. I call my wife. I said, "You'll be a FedEx on the fucking on the, on the doorstep tomorrow, fifteen grand. Just make you grab it, put it in the bank." Is that a shoot? Absolutely. Wow. 
So there you are on the payphone at the La Quinta, and you say what to the boss? I said this fucking. And it was it, it, the first thing that started this whole thing was that that Montreal incident with Pierre, with him or with uh, El, uh, whatever the fuck the pirate, Carl. Carl Lule. Um, them not backing again. You know the same thing. You know it became, it comes from work with Brett. And have the fucking forty minute through. Second tier. WrestleMania. Go to sold out Montreal. Uh I listened to the crowd. It seemed like maybe seventy thirty me. Oh, is that a quote? Yeah. Uh-huh. Before they you know, they say, say my name, they say your name, you know, this is my hometown. Maybe maybe we do a count out. So you fucking kid me if I can take my finish. But did he maybe just want to come back one more month and then take your finish? Keep the houses up one more month? I don't give a fuck what he wanted to do. <laughs> I wasn't the one giving the finishes. I, I was right. handed the finish. Right. I, didn't, I didn't know up until this point it was for debate. Right. That wasn't the way this fucking this company ever ran. You didn't fucking sit down in the committee and de- determine, yeah, but what if it was... Right. And people got beat with fucking people's finishes. So That's you get what on the you phone did. with Vince. And he, him and Hawes and Gurria and him, by the, by the time he gets through, Gurria and uh, Sarge, neither one will fucking make the, make the move. And we go out there and we have, and, and I got him in a fucking, now I, I, of course, the prick that I am, since you're so fucking over, I'm going to work heel. I'm the one got him in the fucking chin locks. And they're fi- I got him down, and they're fucking chanting, Diesel, Diesel. I said, sounds about fucking 99.1% to me right now, buddy. You want to change this? No. Not a problem. We'll have a shitty fucking deal. If you could have been in the car ride from fucking Montreal to Ottawa with the click oh. in a Lumina van... I can't fucking believe these motherfuckers don't have our backs. It's a, it's us against them. So now it's that now it's starting to be that. It's starting to be like, and like guys from like Takers Group, the BSKs are getting fucking BSKs fucking tattooed on them. Yeah. I mean, there's starting to be some really strong, you know. It's like the families in New York. <laughs> What does Vince tell you when you say you, you, you guys are going to strike? You're not going on that night in Indianapolis. I don't know. Him and Pat got on a plane. We're, we're in Columbus in about an hour and 45 minutes. They came to the venue. They came, they came to Indianapolis. Right. Well, that's where you were working that night. I'm no. Assuming. We're, oh. We were working in Columbus. Oh, but, oh, you weren't going to leave the hotel? No. Uh. We're, not, we're not moving. Did you want money? Did you just want no, we uh, wanted, assurance that it was going to go a different direction? We wanted fucking, like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, we, are, we trying to, are we trying to run a wrestling company? Are, 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 is our heat so much of a deterrent to everybody else that, I mean, what's, the, what's going on? What's your feelings? Because we're not ever, we never talk to you. We only see you at TV once every three weeks. It's not like it is now. You know, it's not like you have that access to vents, and we didn't. And it, and it was it was never an open door policy with vents. You know, vents was busy. What was the resolution? Well, we sat down and we just and immediately we told Paul, who just kind of came in, we said, "You're not in this. You just stay up in your room because you don't. You know, this is this is gonna there's gonna be heat, mm. and we you don't need to be you, you don't need to be collateral damage." Well, and that went, and, in retrospect, we should have really galvanized him and he probably would have been a little bit more bulletproof after we did the, the garden thing. But uh, we just kind of, t- it wasn't like, fuck you, it was just like, this is how we feel and then they just went through guys. I remember Bam Bam's name came up and everybody, all the click guys said, you know, I don't like him, I don't like him, I don't like him, I don't like him, but he definitely can play on our team. Mm. You know, like Scott Bigelow can definitely play on our fucking team. And that was, you know, and we just kind of went through some things and we went to Chili's and Vince and Pat went to Chili's with us and we fucking sat there and pounded beers. 
It was just one of those things like, this is what we fucking do. Do you understand that? This is, we're kind of, this is what we do every fucking day of our life. This is what, I, this is what our day consists of. We're not at home. We're, this is what we do. And it's like this, when all you do is eat, sleep, piss, drink, wrestling, guess what? This becomes pretty fucking important. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm spending more time touching men around naked men and I mean it's just like it's not even a healthy environment you know I've seen so many naked guys you know, every night you got somebody's brute on you or something it's just like you're working with Scott and he's got the brute splash on you know and, and, and it's like one splash on you know Tarzan's hair if you're in there it's like he's got the same gear on for 11 days he smells like kitty litter you're going Jesus it's just like fuck really you wonder why I'm taking a handful of fucking pills when I walk out of this building? <laughs> did you accomplish anything? Did things change? Yeah. After I, that I, meeting? I think things did, you know, because there was, there was several sit-downs, like, before major pay-per-views. Now we're in, the, in your house. Like, we're starting to get towards that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're starting to get, to, like, more towards we're going to have more, uh, the more pay-per-views. And... Um, Though we're, we're talking just the 95, you know. The thing that made me leave, the one specific um, incident that assured me that I was not going to renew my contract was the In Your House Louisville, where I wrestled Brett and Taker came through the bottom and grabbed me mm -hmm. and, and stopped me from... from uh, and the key to the match was that Taker had beaten, had Brett beat. I came down and flipped him off, and it cost him the match at the Rumble. I had to have Brett beat in order for it to make. We're co headlining this 12. Right. And we were all in a room, and we're going over it, and Brett refuses to take my finish. Like he won't be beat. And I'm like, dude, we're just, I'm going to get pulled in. You're just going to climb out. It's not going to hurt you. And, oh, the, the people will have the, you know, the feeling that I was beat. I'm like, look, and, you know, he said, well, that doesn't do anything for me. And Taker, who never says anything, never raises his voice, is always that really kind of reason, the, the, the voice of reason, fucking jolts up out of his chair and goes, motherfucker, not everything is about you. Like, you know, this, this, this helps make our fucking match mean more mania. Makes our reel before our match mean something more. And they threw it around, threw it around, and we got there, and the day of, the Vince made the call that now he's not going to take the power bomb. Mm. And that night, I walked in, because Scott was already gone. And I walked in, in, in uh, Louisville, I walked down, and Scott was in the shower, and I walked over there, and I, he had some shampoo like, I, that left, and I borrowed it, and I looked down, and I had shampoo in my head, and I said, I said, tell Bischoff I'm mad. That's where you told him, right there yeah. in the shower, huh? He fucking turned around, looked at me, and he almost wanted to hug me, like, because he wasn't oh, going on his own. It was just like one of those, two guys naked in the hey! shower, <laughs> I'll catch you later. <laughs>
you know, so that was one of those things. And of course, you know, with the Hop, with Kaufman, you know, doing his 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 gig with Lawler down mm -hmm. there, you know, it was one of those things. Like I wanted to go down there and work, just to say I worked the territory one time, you know. And I I, I never got to go down there, but yeah, I, I remember it was it was almost like a bone to Scott, because Scott already went in and said Scott wanted um, more money. To be gone is because you know, he, he was having a lot of like, you know, real strife with his wife at this point, and you know they had two young kids, and she was pissing and moaning, and it was like for what he for what she was having to do as a mother, and you know it's always your wife thinks you're on the road, and it's just a fucking party twenty four seven, and it is. <laughs> But they don't need to know that. <laughs> There's work too, though. Yeah, you read it for the articles. At, at eight, at eight, yeah, at eight, yeah. I only go to the strip joint because they have the world's coldest nine dollar beers. <laughs> but uh, but that was one of the things. I remember one night, she, you know, Dana called my wife and said, "You know where they're at right now? They're at a strip joint." Da -da 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 -da. And my wife said, "My husband worked at a strip joint, put me through college. I really don't think I can call him up and tell him that he can't be in one now." She just kind of went like, okay. <laughs> that brings up a good point, though. Were the wives aligned? We told we hear about the click. How about the clickettes? Nope. Nope. They know each other. They hang no. out. No, no. We went. We went to Scott's birthday party. Uh, brought my son was probably five months old. In my arms or in my wife's arms the entire night. And later on, that's when Dana said that me and Hunter were in the bathroom all night doing coke, and I was holding my child. She came out like a National Enquirer. Oh, I didn't know about this. Okay. Oh, yeah. She, she came out. It's just like, I know that Hunter's never done an illegal drug in his life. Mm -hmm. I'm not a cocaine guy because my dad died of a heart attack. There's one thing I won't do. I won't do any uppers. I've never been an upper guy. I'm very uh, Almond Brothers. Um, and it was like, like, fuck, like, you know, at that point, you know, when, when things like that come out, then that's what my wife, like Rick Rude told me, was one of, the, one of my early mentors, and Rude told me, dude, if you want to keep your marriage, keep your fucking wife the fuck away from this. No matter what she says, do not let her ever come around it. Don't let her talk to one of the guy's fucking wives. They're all psychos. Mm -hmm. He said, keep your fucking wife insulated as much as possible and do not sit at your fucking house and talk business on the phone. Don't do it. Don't sit and talk business on the phone because you're going to start laughing and they are going to know it's a fucking 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> that you would do it for free. <laughs>
the respect of the boys. I, I kind give of you a perfect example. Like Francine didn't have it at all. Francine, I mean, she paid her money to go to wrestling, to do a wrestling school or whatever. But because in, in our big, in our big ass freaking locker room, she for somehow she ended up sitting always next to me, and everybody always sat in the same spot. And um in the locker room. So, and somehow she ended up next to me and then finally after a couple months or something, I was like, girl, there's no, nobody's gonna wanna use you. You sit here and you read a Harlequin romance. You know what I mean? I say, go sit your ass in front of that monitor. And, uh, and then finally she went and sat herself down and, and sat herself down and then like a couple weeks later, I, then they make her a plant or something like that, and she like kid was wasn't she like a Stevie Richards rat or something in the very beginning? Yes, yeah, so something like that. But yeah, then she spun that into a into a career, man. And I got to hand it to her, for, for, you know, for that. And then um, and then she really got respect when uh, what, was it was it Anthony that um. Super bombed her. Is that Some super bombed her through a table? No, oh, he super bombed table. her through yeah. a table. You know that she's all right now. She's one of the boys. Paulie wanted to bring in Art Barr, but Barr died, and then Eddie was the replacement. No. Uh, I mean, I've heard that, but I don't know from Paul's lips. Um, giving Guerrero the uh, the title on his first first match in. Is that you only have you one do? place to go, but Daryl. Hey, didn't they do that to? Did they do that to? Uh, Kid Cash or something with one of them titles up in WWE or something like that, or he or one of those dudes. They give they give you the title your first night in, you have no place to go but down. I mean, even by, although Eddie Guerrero, which, and in our company, is it's not like a Vince company where literally you have no place to go but down there. But I mean, you, it's you know because Paul will just find some other angle to do something with you or something like that. And Guerrero is such an unbelievable town; it's just amazing. Waltman and him were t were, mm -hmm. were kind of like the, they were tight, mm -hmm. and um, it was one of those things. Whoever came into the territory, always worked with kid first, like that was the measuring stick. So like you know, a guy would come in the territory, and we would just sit there at the curtain, and kid would walk back, and kid would just go, like. Not gonna work. It ain't gonna work. Okay. But if he came back and went, I mean, that was that was it. That's mm. and for us, because kid can go. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Kid can go with anybody. I mean, he's probably one of the most underrated workers this business has ever seen. I watched him work in that Juggalo match this past year, mm -hmm. and I mean. It was unbelievable. Like four o'clock in the morning, fucking mist on the. F I mean, you couldn't pick a worse condition for a guy our age to just be able to just go. You know what? Fuck this. It's walk and talk. He's going a million miles an hour out there, bouncing around. And I just said, I said, you know what? I said that's. That, I, I just was just like, fuck. You know, mm -hmm. like you should get another run. <laughs> you know, it's like fuck that. That alone should give you another run. And why the Doc Hendricks thing? Is it just Vince's thing to never acknowledge I, anybody I, I who never, was made outside of the film? Yeah, I never understood that. And I, I, still, I still don't to this. I was amazed when I came back this time that it's like, why are you calling me Kevin Nash? This, I, I go to the Rumble, I'm Diesel. I come back, I powerbomb him, and I'm, now I'm Kevin Nash. But I'm coming out the NWO music. <laughs> but I can't put Nash World Order on a t-shirt because I'm going to make too much money. Right. God forbid. Yeah. Do you own, what do you own? You own your name, obviously Kevin Nash, but yeah. NWO isn't yours. No, it's uh, not Diesel mine, but, it, but I got, when I contractually, right. I mean, I get a nice... You have a piece of it, but you can't go outside. No, I can't go outside, but boy, when I'm in, when I'm in the fucking farm... <laughs> <laughs>
A bunch of wrestlers on a plane. Always insanity? For an overseas flight? Fucking didn't even have to be overseas. <laughs> If it was over two hours, fucking number one, man. If you fucking fell asleep on an overnight on an overseas flight, you were fucked. Yeah. Minimum, you're gonna have a shaving fucking shaving turban, shaving cream turban, right. missing an eyebrow. Right. Fucking your sunglasses super glued to your face. I mean, you were gonna have a sharpie fucking Hitler mustache if you didn't have a mustache. You were gonna get fucked with. So it was just like I remember when uh, Savio fucking cut. Uh, Scott and Sean's hair. Like fucking took a little piece of the mullet. Did he ever fall asleep again after that on a flight? No, they didn't. But fucking, I don't think Savio. No, was did Savio ever? No, I, I don't think he was around much longer oh, after that. Right, right. I think he was pretty much uh, adios amigos because fucking Scott brought him in. Scott yeah. brought him in as a buddy from Puerto Rico. And he fuck, I don't give a fuck what they did to him. You don't fucking. I guess he didn't know what the food chain was. What about the plane? Uh, first class, I mean, is Vince flying with you? Mm. No. So. And, and you got to realize, too, now, nobody flies first class. I, I'm flying to India. I got Yoko on one side of me and Taker on the other. Yoko flew in coach? Fuck yeah, he did. How? He just took two seats. Wow. He never, he would never, he would, even when he was, he didn't like sitting in, first class was uncomfortable to him. It was amazing when Yoko would sit down because he was so, you know, his, 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 his ass was so big. Like, when, when he and I, if I was driving, he was sitting next to me in a town car, mm -hmm. he was like this much taller than me sitting. Because he, you know, when, his boost. Yeah, I mean, high. yeah, it was amazing. It was crazy. You would just be like talking to Yoko like this in the car, and you're like a seven foot guy. Wow. You know, but it was, it was. And I remember, I remember like one time we we went to Israel and we it was the same thing. Like we for like twenty days on the road. And we're gonna go to Israel for like six days. And Taker's got the broken ribs and the fucking flak jacket, and he's still doing the no sell thing where you know he doesn't sell anything. So when you work with him, it just he just blows you up because he just he, boom, he just comes right back up, sits up, he never mm -hmm. sells anything. Scott was the first guy in a dark match to grab a hold. True. Because yeah, oh. because they, they were switching around tapes and they fucking I don't know they tried to rib him or whatever, but you know Scott must have thrown nine hundred punches. And you know, Taker would come down, come mm -hmm. back up, and do his shit, and finally Scott said fuck this and grabbed him in a fucking hold. The people came. And then all of a sudden, you can put them in a hold. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, those, because we were so, you know, even though we were, you know, you're in the locker room every night together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you're so, you know, like the click, the click, you know, was in there. We, we did our shit. You might see each other at the gym. You might see, you know. Like, you know, in this area, like the, the diner at Lookers, everybody would go through there, <laughs> let alone maybe stop by and just chat with one of the gals. Yeah. Talk. You know, get one of those $9 beers. But, uh, you know, you the only time, like when you were on, like the European trips, like you were on the bus together. Yeah. And that's when it just, that's... I mean, you would it becomes high school again. A bit, yeah, right? but I mean, you just the thing was the thing was over there. Like everybody's like, you're spending twenty five dollars a day, like just in tanning beds, just because there's just, like, there's nothing to do. So everybody looks like they've been to Club Med. Everybody's fucking just. I mean, got a million. Again, we used to call it the five hundred and fifty mark tan. I mean, we're just fucking golden. But man, you, if you were to peel that off, you would have seen just fucking gray skeletons. I remember one time, Kid came on, we were in Hamburg, was the first night, Kid walks in the locker room, he unzips his bag, he goes, boom, and he puts this big fucking jar of pills on the table. And he goes, he goes, they're phenobarbitals. I don't know what they do. So everybody's looking at the thing, we're looking at him. There's no, there's no, no desk reference. So we look at him. Desk reference. I, I, I come up with a conclusion of, 
Well, each one of them has 325 milligrams of caffeine. So no matter what, they're probably, if you take four or five, I'm gonna, if I can pick you up. And that was the whole thing with the boys. It wasn't like, you be the guinea pig, it was just like, Ooh. What'd they do? I don't know, he has much other shit in you. Just like, no. <laughs> rainbow <laughs> stew, it's like, you know. I don't know, but I mean, I, it was just one of those things, you know, I remember one time, kid just vanished. He'd work his match, and he'd vanish, he'd get on the bus and sleep, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? It's just like, I'm smart anybody up, but I found a doctor in London to give me some liquid codeine. I just like, how's that? He picks up his shirt, he's got abs. He's got like a six pack of abs. He goes, all I've been doing is drinking water. <laughs> he goes to the ring that night, he's halfway down, he takes, his, he takes his fucking gimmicks off his fucking shoulders, rolls his fucking shirt down and fucking goes like this. And he, but he turns to, because we're all at the curtain watching him. And it's just like, that was the thing. Fuck 12,000 people. You're only entertaining, entertaining your friends. Yeah, you're entertaining yeah. those 16 guys back there. That's why we always make references on shit when we're in the NWO. Four people got it. I mean, we didn't give a fuck. It was just those four people at home that went, oh, I get that. Mm -hmm. And when people say, what does that mean? It's odd that they would invite them in, that Paulie would... Well, those guys probably trying to get a job that Paulie got for super cheap that was a little bit of a name because, you know, our company's rolling a little bit. Guys want to come work for us. They're like, hey, I'll find myself in, Paulie. Just put me on the show. You know what I mean? Probably something like that. Gotcha. Or, you know, hey, probably, especially with Marty, um, I'm sure his and Paul's paths crossed somewhere like down in the Mid-South or something like or Cornette's thing or somewhere at some time. You know, just might have been a favor. Paul brought a gun to that show and a girlfriend. That's what I remember about that fucking show. He was driving his, his I don't know, like a Camaro, a Z, whatever. Paul had a girlfriend and a gun out at that show. Because I remember I was driving with Todd, and we were the last ones leaving or something like that. And I just remember Paul and a girlfriend. That, that's the only thing I remember about that show. OK. And, you know, you give me a little bit, I could give you that one thing. But I, I couldn't have told you I worked with uh, Draymond that night. Um, only because I remember it was the only time we ever worked at that place also. But to, talk to me about the fans in Delaware. Any difference regionally when you guys were moving around? Was it always the same kind of bloodthirsty heat or were they... No, because you got to remember, those people were the people that were watching the people be the fans that were just as much as part of our show as we were when they're watching it, when they get home from the bars at 2 o'clock in the morning on Madison Square Garden or Sunshine Network or whatever crazy channel that we were on, you know what I mean? Our fans taught them how to be fans. They really did. Paul was a real different cat. Like he showed up with with uh, with with uh, Kowalski, with Walter. Like at the first set of teeth. I want to think the first. He like maybe the darks were Wooster. Or... But I the, the, the funny thing is is like every Saturday afternoon when we're on the road, we would watch the Saturday night, the WCW afternoon television wrestling show. And like our guy was terrorizing. And that was Triple H's WCW gimmick. He was terrorizing. So like when he came into TV, he's got like a fucking, he's got slacks on, a fucking jacket. And this is back in fanny pack. You can't, you it's gotta have black jeans, yeah. black jeans, fanny pack, Magnum fucking, the high tech Magnums, the black fucking combat you know, fatigue boots. Um, some kind of fucking gimmick shirt that you got from a radio station. Right. Or you can wear anybody else's gimmick t-shirt, but you can't wear your own. Can't wear your own, okay. Can't wear your own. So I can wear takers, Scott can wear mine. You, you, you can, you know, when we would, it got to the point when Scott was getting ready to leave, everybody wore Scott's t-shirt. It was yellow and it was fucking, it would drive Vince crazy. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're like, you fuckers, then they had the purple one. We didn't wear that one. That's great. And, uh, but uh, here's this guy, you know, and I remember it was so funny. He walked in the building and Scott just immediately got up out of his chair and walked behind him and just walked like step for step right behind him. Fucking Paul stopped, turned around, looked at him, and Scott went. And it was just like, he looked at us like, what the fuck? So, you know, it's time now. It's just like, man, it's, it's, it's the time of the night. It's monitor time. Time to fucking rip every motherfucker that comes to the monitor. Just sit there and a the guy would come, oh! So here comes Paul, he's got his match. Well, I'll sit there, well, I'll sit there, and he has his match, where I'll go. So we, he comes out and he's sitting there, he's taking his tape off his wrist. And we walk up to him, we go, who are you driving with? He goes, I'm with Walter. I go, okay, well, how long are you with Walter? He goes, well, there's this trip, I don't want to fucking leave him. I said, all right, and I said, you're with us. Why, just because he could work? Yeah, he had, he just, you, you could just tell he was money. And so then once we got to talk to him a little bit, we realized like his passion. And he was smart too. Like he knew the business. What he got knew. someone invited into the clique? What was the checklist, if you had to make one? He had to love the business. It had to be like a priority. It wasn't something you did. You know, it wasn't like cutting the lawn. Ah, I gotta cut the lawn. And you could just tell when he he just. Most guys really kind of, like, especially then, there were so few dark matches and so few fucking tryouts. You know, when a guy came in, it was just like, wow. You know, like, this guy's getting a tryout. This is, you know, getting a tryout with the Yankees. Right. That's a big thing. That was a huge jump back in those days. To go from WCW, I remember when, when Sean, when, when I first was asked, um, Sean asked the Steiners if they, if they knew me. And, Robbie said, fuck, he said, I've known Kev like before I ever got into business. We trained at the same, used to train at the same gym in Atlanta. And uh, he said, do you think he'd be my bodyguard? He said, fuck, I'll call him. So they called me and I was just like, but there was still that thing, apprehension of, you know, I'm not ready for fucking, you know, I'm not ready for the big leagues. Right. You know, like that's a, that's, that step was, poof, you know, and. So the click sees a guy and it looks like he's ready for the big leagues. And he was, you know, and he and, and it, it was a, it, it was such a plus to find out a they didn't drink or do anything. Well, that's an interesting point. He doesn't party. Would what made you think he'd fit in with you guys? That he wouldn't be disapproving of your lifestyle? Well, it, 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 I it, I think that at that point, if you're going to be with somebody, like you want to be with somebody that's kind of got a little bit of stroke, you know. And you also, I mean, for us, for him, you know, when we found out that he didn't do those things, it was just like, for me, it was like, finally, oh, fuck, finally. Mm. Like finally, I don't have to drive every fucking mile of every fucking trip. the whole women violence thing I know that was something that was always brought was up great. in CW. yeah I don't know I thought the violence was great and, and the fans loved it you know what I mean as long as they would sell it and did she wear I don't know the girls would wear like neck braces like they pulled the Joel Gertner thing wear the neck brace for uh, for like well his whole career at Gertner but um uh yeah the violence with the women was good I mean what else you always trying to up the ante here you know what I'm saying he's changed he, we're, we're in the middle of fucking revolutionizing fucking wrestling you know what I mean boom it's fuck with the women. Are you hesitant as a male wrestler? Not at all. To, no. They're out there. They're you know they, you know they've gone through wrestling school and stuff like that. They know how to bump. It's my job to take care of them. What about the crowd's reaction? Could it have been misinterpreted? What? Did the guys like to beat up women? Yeah, guys do. I mean, seventy-five percent of 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 calls that policemen take all over the world are domestic fucking violence. That's what guys like to do. I mean, seriously. I mean, the, the, that's that that's not the fact. That's not like a Sam man just made up out of his head. Seventy-five percent of calls that policemen go to are domestic fucking issues. 
That's we our cops. We, we we pay all these cops to do that. You know what I mean? It's domestic violence is so huge and nobody talks about it, but it really is. You know? I mean, how many times have you just wanted to like, oh, bitch? You know what I mean? It's just. You know, how many times have you been hit by a woman? I mean, it goes black, you know, the violence goes both ways. Take, you know, take some hairspray in the eye. Wow, or in no, the mouth. The throat, that was, oh, I breathed in on that, that was horrible. And I'm like, listen, you're worried about losing to me. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Would you rather lose a cheap? If you watch how cheap that fucking loss is by him, I'm like, that was a thing of difference. I'd rather you hit me with your finisher twice than lose like that with Nancy hitting, Nancy hitting you in your calf with a cane. But I mean, he didn't want to do the job, so. That was his way of coming up with. And so Nancy was, was happy. She she caused it. You know what I mean. So in the retrospect, it looked good because Nancy was Nancy was a little bit more integral being out there than, with me than like than like a, than just for looks. You know what I'm saying? Right. It keeps her in there. It keeps her involved. So it was probably her idea. She talked Shane into it. Now that I think about it, she was very smart. I, I mean, was she just going to say talk. She had Kevin Sullivan teach her. I mean. Listen, you know, Kevin might be a nut or whatever like that, but Kevin was doing shit that Paul he was doing 10 years before it, 15 years before it, you know what I mean? So, so you know, Kevin was a brilliant mind, and she was with him for all them years that she learned, man. Uh, Shane has said that uh, when you got the belt, it was one of many examples of how ECW was no longer what he originally preached uh, it should be. <laughs> what, what he preached it should be? Hey, well, Shane, you weren't the booker, so what the, what the fuck you were preaching wasn't what was going to happen, buddy. Sorry. And he had as many diff as many differences than anybody did with uh, the booking direction. You know what I mean? Shane was already doing his own shit, but Paulie, besides that, he was doing whatever the fuck he wanted. No matter what Shane said or the franchise proclaimed should be. What's it happening, man? Nobody nobody had control like that. All right, Paulie, I'll let you do whatever the fuck you want with yourself, but you know, the rest is is is, is not is just not your say. I remember 911 fucking wrestling fucking Ron and it ended his career. Fucking the guy got his name chanted hundreds and hundreds of times during the show and he keeps telling Paul, I want to wrestle, I want to wrestle. And I remember Todd telling me that Paul was like, fuck, he's going to do in his career like that and then it buried him. The match was the shits. I mean, Ron can work. You know what I mean? It definitely wasn't Ron. It was fucking, uh, it was 911. You know what I mean? Well, then he, he buried wrestle. him. He's buried, which was great for the Sandman because why? Watch what my career really takes off is when the Public Enemy goes to WCW and 911's gone. Then it's Sandman Hour. Boom, Sandman for open the show. Boom, your third, your fifth, and then you'll finish too. So before Paulie they gave let me him the wrestle, ball and Paulie let me fucking run. Before they let him wrestle, though, he's just he's just choke slamming everybody and, and doing that that whole push. Where's the plan? If you're Paulie, where's that going to go? Because if you're it not going to go anywhere in the ring, why? Why? That's what everybody else would have done. Paulie ain't like everybody else. Paulie knew his place. Paulie said, as soon as this guy's got to fucking wrestle, his career's going to be over. And you know what? The, and he was Teddy's boy. So the public enemy's gone. That's probably probably was half and half of Paulie being like, all right, well, you're Teddy's boy. You're out with the, you're out with the trash too. You know, you know what I'm saying? He was totally there because of Teddy. I mean, granted, Al was fucking six foot, whatever, 11, big ass motherfucker. Hey, but all he could do was choke slam and Paul knew, Paul knew, knew fucking his limits and, and, he, and he took his limits to, to high limits, but the kid wanted more. He wanted to fly too close to the sun. Man, a oh, tough bitch. I remember raking the like, fucking it just. I don't. I can't remember the black hearts. They used to do that. That the, they had the hoods. And she, I don't know. Did she come in with the black hearts. Uh, she actually or gang or whatever. She, she did a run in. She run used run. to scratch dudes and seriously fucking like rip their backs up, man. Oh, she, you know, nobody's ever told you that one. How about her claws? Oh yeah, man. She would really rake some guys. 
She was she was crazy, man. That was crazy. What's the reaction from the other ladies in the locker room when a new wrestler? You know what? Fucking check your fucking ego at the fucking door, bitch. Just like all the boys do. That's just like what the girls do. Did they do it? Yeah, I mean, I, you got to understand, if anything if anything like that would have happened, fucking one word of it, it would have been squashed, right? It would have been, you know, especially because Dreamer had control of the girls and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Dreamer, he fucking knows how to run a locker room, you know what I mean? He's good at what he does. Because it's a way for me to beat Cactus and retain my... Oh, that you know what? I'll figure it out right now. That was Cactus's way. That was Cactus's way of, because they were buddies. You know what I mean? Hey, let's throw Shane in here. You know what I mean? And then I really didn't lose to Sandman. You know what I mean? I, mean, I, don't, I don't remember this Cactus-Shane feud. Do you guys? I don't remember those two ever even working against each other. So, you're so saying what did they hoard? They hoard me for the night to get a pin. That's exactly what that sounds like to me. That's why I don't, that's why I don't even remember it. Guarantee that's what happened. Magnum, tell for uh, first time he came in, he was doing something with me, and it was pretty fucking elaborate. And I'm sitting there, and I go, uh, like Todd Gordon's here, Paul Heyman's there, uh, Fonzie's right here, and and Nancy's right, and Nancy's like standing like right behind me too. And we know we're all huddled, we're talking about this. And Paul, he's like, yeah, Fonzie do this, Fonzie do this. And I turn around and I go, and I go to Todd. I was like, I was like, Todd, can this fucking guy, you know, because you know I like my shit being fucking tight. And, you know, I don't know Todd, Todd Fonzie from a can of paper. He looked great. Came in with the fucking uh, the gold watch, to, uh, you know, because he was still, you know, because he was, you know, it's his first day in, and that's how you used to dress when he worked for fucking uh, WWE for all those years. You know what I mean? He was looking like a million fucking dollars his first night in. So then anyway, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And Nancy goes, don't worry about it, Hack. He's good. I was like, all right, let's go. And they, But he heard me say that, you know, and he was like, who the fuck is this guy? You know what I'm saying? And Alfonso would say, what the fuck is this sand man, this blonde hair, bleach blonde hair dude? You know I mean, I've been around the world with fucking, uh, who, who'd they make him babysit the dude, uh, this Argentina basketball player or something, they put him in a monkey suit. Gonzalez? Yeah, they had him fucking babysit Gonzalez for about eight months a year at one time. Now he, but he, I mean, he he was a heat magnet. Did any of the workers resent the, the, the oh, heel? Man, heat we just he, loved fucking people getting over. You know what I mean? You gotta understand a lot of fucking. We just want everybody just wanted to get over because you got a lot of the guys had never been there or had been there, got a little bit of a taste, and then weren't good enough to stay there or something like that. You know what I mean? Like people, you know, getting fired out of WCW and stuff like that. But everybody just wanted to get over because a lot of people are, are just still just so worried about getting themselves over what they're doing. You don't have time, you know what I mean? It's a lot of young people striving for a goal. It's more like a football team. You know what I'm saying? Trying to win a Super Bowl. And our Super Bowl was our first pay-per-view. Did you ever get slopped? No. Who was the slop wrangler? Who was in charge of all that shit? Who knows? I remember his fucking Paul having that match in your house, and he had big gashes on his back, and he's wallowing around in pig shit. And there's Man. nobody there with even peroxide to clean it that night. And what was, like, was it? It was like just dirt. No, it was like almost like a like a almost looked like fucking oatmeal kind of that kind of consistency. Mm -hmm. But they had pigs in, that were out in that shit that night. They had pigs in the thing. They were, they were shitting all day long. He's got his back gaffed open. He's, I mean, he's still got those gaff marks. Mm. You know, I mean, they weren't, they were, they, it was, it's funny when you, every time I see him, and I'm, I mean, like the other, when I worked for, at that uh, TLC match, he's walking away from me. And I just, as he's walking away from me selling, I'm, I'm looking at his back and my mind saying, fuck, he's still got those fucking scars in that pig match. Yeah. You know, like, 20 years later, I'm going, I'm looking at him going, fuck, he's still got those pig money.
I think at that point, I remember that summer, instead of running an A and a B, we ran a super show. We combined and ran like like eight, eight instead of having like, you know, two or three matches that were of significance, we, we ran a top to bottom card that was really solid. We had a little bit of pyro, it had a little bit more feel of what the TV show was, and it, and it drew, it was successful. And I think what they did at that point was they thought, we won't charge them as much as the major ones because it's not going to be, you know. Right. But it's still, you know, there's, at, at this point, I think they're starting to realize that, you know, that this kind of niche, like wrestling is kind of starting to change. It's like we're, we're doing little small things, you know. We did Rock and Jock. We did some stuff on Nickelodeon. So we're starting to do a little bit of crossover stuff where it was starting to get, uh, we weren't pop culture yet. But it was starting to kind of turn that way. And I think that they were trying to, um, you know. And I think Shane had a lot to do with that because, you know, I think Shane was really um, has always been underestimated. That he he doesn't have that great wrestling mind. But as far as like knowing what's cool, knowing what's current, knowing I mean, as far as just from a media standpoint, like mm -hmm. he was always ahead of his ahead of the game. Um, he was a, he was a he was a, he was a, a he had a lot of attributes that Vince didn't have. He was very current. And um, I don't think that he ever had that, you know, Stanford kind of mentality to him. He had more of a, you know, more, he was more of a New York guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that he was kind of pushing us in that direction to start to get, you know, the magazine started to change. The magazine wasn't as cartoony. Right. You know, it was just the the whole cartoony feel of 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 the business was 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 starting to it was starting to be more you know about guys fighting for the and the belt was really you know that was you know that world championship was was still really you know it didn't jump around. We're basically almost. You know, our styles are, are are comparable. I think I'm a better worker than he is. I think I'm more fluid. I think, you know, I sell better. But I just, when I see, like, any, any two big guys on a marquee, like, people are like, oh, I'd like to see you and Big Show at WrestleMania. Why? Do you need to take a nap? You need something to calm you down after. I mean, why? It's like I can't do nine. I have four moves. I can't do any of them to them. <laughs> I can't pick the fucker up. I can't snake eyes him. I can't. I can't do anything with this fucking guy. Like, where's the excitement? Right. Why would you book that? Too similar. Yeah, it just it doesn't make sense. And it's just for me and Sid. I remember I actually fucking jumped over the top rope on the Sid in that in the middle of a. It was like a lumberjack match in Nashville, right? It was in, uh, I'll tell you exactly where it was. Uh, well, this, no, this one's in Syracuse. The first thing. Oh, uh, I was the first. Yeah. worked them again. Yeah, I worked in, I, worked at, I think I worked at Lumberjack with him in Nashville later on at, in your house. Did you hurt your elbow in this match? I have in the notes that you may have injured your elbow. That, this is where I, um, I, I hurt it, but then I work with, um, I always call him Papa. I worked with um, Kama at TV, the mm -hmm. next set of the next set of TVs, and we did a double clothesline spot to go down. And my elbow was it was this one here. My elbow was like that, mm -hmm. and it was I couldn't straighten it. And when we connected, I felt something pop. So, uh, and I was gonna do a. Uh, a shoot note because we were close to um, the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. So we were going to go to the, to the Basketball Hall of Fame in Mass. Um, and Russo was going to do a piece on me for the magazine. So uh, I got up in the middle of the night and I, and I rarely ever have to get up and piss. But I thought I had to pit, you know, I thought I had to pee, you know, and I just, I said, I'm like, and, but I was sweating. I was like, what the fuck? So I go in the bathroom and I take a piss, you know, and I, not, I mean, I piss. And I turn and I mean, I, now I'm starting to wake up, man, my elbow's killing me. So I, and all I got is like that little light that's on in the bathroom at a hotel that has that little 
you know, like a nightlight type thing mm -hmm. that they, they used to have at some point. Uh, most of them don't have them anymore. And I just put my arm up like that. And when I did, I went, what the fuck is that? And I turned on the light and I was black and blue from here to here, just like, mm. I mean, just, I mean, and that black, I mean, purple. You know, so I mean, I knew I tore something and it was bleeding out. So I did the, uh, we had like a couple of days where I was in like the New York area. Like I did that, that thing with, at the, and I remember coming back because that night I was back in Sanford and like all smart wrestlers would do and you're completely, you know, bleeding out. Let's go and do some incline presses. Let's see how fucked up it is. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Started with the bar and I went, huh, okay. Put 45 on each side and I went, that's not too bad because my delts are strong. Put two and a quarter on, push and I went, oh, something's wrong. Yeah. So, um, you know, typical, you know, next stop, fucking Birmingham. You went back on the road? No. Got to go see Doc Andrews. Oh, oh doctor. Go see, go see Doc. Walked in there, and he took an MRI, and he said, he said, yeah, you tore your tricep. So I was like, okay. He said, yeah, it's about nine months. I went, all right. And lo and behold, three weeks later, I'm, I think, in a tag match with Tatanka, right? Me and Tatanka, right? We'll come to it if this is if this is the year. Yeah, but, but I mean, I was I mean, I just I sewed that bitch up. I, I'd come, I'd come home after the road, and my wife would squeeze it, and big fucking hunks of blood and tissue would come out of it, and I'd just butterfly it and put add two elbow pads on. It was just because you you if you didn't go, you didn't get paid. Right. And I was on top, and I just remember Orndorff, you know, sitting there and telling me, you know, when he fucked his neck up. And ended up losing fucking all that size in that arm. I kept saying, "Why didn't you get it fixed?" He goes, "I was on top with the man. I was printing money. Yeah, like you. This is it. This is. The, I waited a year for this angle to fucking pay off. I've got to get my money. So it's just like I'm. I'm on top. If I fucking if I take nine months off, that's it. My run's over. Right. So it's just like, you know. And to this day, this thing is fucked. You know, it all it hurts twenty four seven, but were you part of this? Yeah, and it, it was also we were in like a room and it turned into a fucking like a grievance meeting. You all just Fielding your complaints uh... against each other. Oh, I thought you meant against the company. No, oh. I remember Bam Bam standing up going, oh, "Fucking, uh, I got it. I got a problem. Uh, fucking uh, it's last European trip. Um, Scott Hall was 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 working against uh, Nash and Michaels, and he was on their bus every night. <laughs> fucking." <laughs> Before he could even get it out of his mouth, fucking Sean popped up. Hey, motherfucker! <laughs> I'm on the road 350 days a fucking year. Don't you tell me who the fuck I'm gonna spend my life with. Fuck you! He goes, you dumb motherfucker. He says, yeah, because Bam Bam made a reference of you know these people were following the buses like in a caravan. He goes, yeah, you dumb motherfucker. By that time, Scott jumps up. He goes, hey, Bam Bam. Think about it. They're going to fucking each town watching the exact same fucking match for 14 nights. I think they get it. We've got their money. They're not good. Like, they're following us from town to town. I don't think fucking us getting in a different bus is going to. And it was just one of those kind of things. Oh, yeah, it was tight and tight. Bullshit. It was like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Wow. That's Can we get out of here and go back to the hotel now? Unbelievable. <laughs> Thanks for the video. <laughs> Thank you.
that I is, loved it. That's something that I would just I would I would just watch just for because that was just those guys was just unbelievable. Just unbelievable stuff that I couldn't do, you know what I mean, or never do, but I I would love watching their matches. Um, was it an important counterbalance to the other stuff that was going on? Oh, yeah, there's a, that's the reason. That, that's probably another, you know, one of Paulie's genius things. You got your blood, sweat, and tears on the one end, and you also got the guys that can work their ass off better than anybody in the world. You know what I mean? Like, look at the, guy, the people that he brought in. And, and then when those guys left, with the, like when, when, when the Guerreros went, when all three or four of those guys, well, I guess they left Shane out, so it was three of them, Malenko, Guerrero, whatever. Then he brought in the Mexican guys. Everybody hated Taz then because he believed his own shit. And then Van Dam had to smack him in the locker room fucking that one day. I'm sure you guys have heard that story. And Taz and his team, Taz, and he used to abuse the dude, like the Chris Chatties and stuff like that. And then he's making his own belts and stuff like that. And he just believed his own shit. I didn't care. I didn't, but you know, it didn't matter. Let the guy, I don't care what the guy believes or whatever. You know what I mean? He, he never did anything bad to me. So, but, but no, he had some heat like that. When he, his character changes and he has, you know, the hair changes and all that, is, is that when he starts to... Well, you got to understand the one... Wait, wait, didn't Paul try five different little, like, st if you go... Th I'm trying to think of he was this Taz, he was that... Th oh, he's not just Taz, he's Pete. Then he, wait a minute, Paul, he tried five different spins with this dude until the, until the one stop. Hey, Vinny Vegas was, you know, and fucking Oz and all these different guys, you know what I'm saying? But finally the Taz thing got over, so I got to hand it to him for that. Paulie's dad, Paulie. It, it was an embezzlement of the company. He embezzled the company from Todd. Todd brought him in as a Todd brought him in as a partner. Paulie says he's got investors, but they don't want you, Todd. The investors is himself. He embezzled the company from Todd. But Todd, really, Todd would have fought it, but he didn't feel he had already dropped his million dollars into it. He didn't want to drop any more money, so Paulie took it over. But it really was an embezzlement because Paulie is HHG, and he was Todd's partner before that. When HHG comes in, do they settle the debts that? Todd I never had, had outstanding with you. No, I didn't. Really, I never had a problem. I had Paulie owed me some money, but um, but I had pretty much always gotten paid. Okay. You know, some guys always got paid. You think Van Dam was not getting checks and shit like that? You know, there were you know the high school paid guys were getting paid. I mean, they, all in all, you know, Paulie's paying me one hundred seventy-five thousand a year. Van Dam went back in like ninety-six or ninety-seven. I'm making a hundred. I think I was making one hundred fifty then for Paul because ninety-six I moved to Florida. So yeah, and then he signed me for uh, 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 three grand a week. So you know the guys, the top guys that were getting paid, they got paid. You know what I mean? The, the cuts came somewhere else. I mean, some guys might be owed some say of royalties or a couple pay per view checks, but for all in all, the top guys got taken care of. Shane knows to the penny. He told us. Do you remember the amount? One hundred and fifty-three thousand something something and forty-three cents. Good luck getting it. Okay. Um, now, when HHG makes the big purchase, what's Todd's... What big purchase? That's what Nobody I mean. fucking knew no big... Well, Paulie's still in the locker room, right. fucking, you know, there's, there's no big, there's no thing at all. You know that what I mean? That was the... the Paulie might have had a little state of the union, a jets or whatever, because Todd stopped coming or whatever, but... But that's what I'm saying. Is Todd still... Is Todd Everybody still knew it was coming, because I was telling people that it was happening. What's Todd's role? Huh? What's Todd's role after that? Is he still around? Uh, yeah, he... they... they... They, they did a thing where Todd just stepped down because of business and family things and stuff like that, but it's fucking wrestling. You know, I, I don't even remember them coming in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you remember them there. So yeah. Did you like um, Chris? Really never spent much time with him. I remember he took a hell of a powerbomb from me and uh, fucking that island, Victoria Island, on a feed-in. He took, I mean, just unbelievable, just the height, he, he was just unbelievable. You know, he, I knew he could work, mm -hmm. you know, because Kid, you know, Kid had put him over, so I knew he was, he was a good hand. I just, you know, at that point, I just didn't have any, any, any real 
interaction with them ring wise and then um my uh one of my friends was kind of involved uh, to a degree with uh there's a funny story about that <laughs> friend that Uxpot told us she was wearing a one of those mohair sweaters I, one you know day, what then that's his... my fucking story because he, he oh, didn't no, he, see it he was here first that motherfucker um, oh, it was unbelievable. He had a pink beard that night. Yeah, he came out with that fucking cashmere just all over his face. We're just like, <laughs> and there's fucking Chris. And we're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you think Chris knew? How could he not? Really Story on this. You, know, you always hear all these fucking backstories about, you know, when, 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 when they were in ECW, he would go in and take an hour long shower and. You know, this would happen and this mm -hmm. would happen. You'd always hear those stories. I don't put, you know, she never made a pass on me. She was nothing, I mean. She, what was wrong she, with you? Well, I'm sure because I, I you know, I was, a, perks? I was a prick. No, you're a prick. Francine comes in here. Now, uh, was she really dating Stevie at the time? Is that how she got in? Uh, I seriously doubt it. Okay. I seriously doubt it. Why do you that. say that? No, I just do. I just seriously doubt that that would... Uh, yeah, no, because she wouldn't have been dating anybody because Paulie probably was telling her you can't be near any of the boys. You know what I mean? And Dreamer probably had his claws in her freaking... Uh, you know what I'm saying? Tommy's good, you know what I'm saying? One on the road, one at home. The Gangsters make a surprise debut. <clears throat> Love the Gangsters. I was the first one to meet him. New Jackie was pissed. I met him down. I met him at a, um, at a, at a bar uh, right by the water, 95 in, like, in the Blue Room 476, a place called Tinicum. He drives out. He drove up, and he was pissed because Paul E. Something about him. You know, how many of the other guys that I picked up at the airport that were pissed at Paul E. Uh, or met him? You know, on the way down, but uh, yeah, but, but typical Paulie promised them this and the plane tickets. They ended up driving. Who knows what? But um, I, Jack's a great guy, man. Did they fit in right away, or were, was there? There's just kind of that natural. Oh, they were fine. Yeah, man. they were fine. Especially did they come in and work right with the public enemy. Yes. So you're fine. You know what I mean, Teddy? Teddy had all the respect. If you know, if Teddy said you were fine, believe me, you were fine. That was good stuff. Is this your first barbed wire match? Yeah, and I'm glad Cactus walked me through it, man. Like I said, it was, he said, listen, if you really watch, he doesn't, I'm doing shit to him most of the match because he had done it before. And he's like, listen, he's got like three pair of dungarees on and shit like that. And he's like, here, do this to me. Do this. He gave me like four or five spots and we just went out there and worked. And I was like, thank you so much, Cactus. Because, you know, I'm a little nervous, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I never done one. Not because not you're going to get cut because it's a totally different style of, of everything, you know what I mean? Just that it would look awkward. You were more worried about it not looking. Well, right you know, opposed. because it's just it's a gimmick match. You know what I'm saying? And if you're not, a, you know, if you don't know how to work gimmick matches yet, then you, you know, thank God you're with somebody, with somebody that has it and can walk you through it. You know, like I had to walk Raven through one. It took us a year to convince Scotty to have me do one. But I think Paulie had to promise some more money, and of course, never gave it to him or something. But he was such a pussy. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm like, oh my God. See, and he knows it too, and I'll tell you. How were you chosen to be the one to do this? Was this something you volunteered for just because you were the champion? Yeah, that was, that was, yeah. I was a press secretary. Right. Face oh. of the company. It's your job. I don't know how many people are aware that these Hall of Fame ceremonies happened before the, the big hubbub. Was it an annual event? And only one person would go in, or was it? Like, yeah, because it, yeah. It, it, uh, nobody went in the year before. Like the only guy that was in it was Andre. Oh, actually, and that was like, like that was the only. And he was just kind of on the wall in Titan Tower, like this big giant picture of Andre, and mm. it was just kind of like that was the Hall of Fame. Ah. Wall of Fame, whatever you want to call it, but it was just 
everybody knew that Andre was the, the shit, and Andre was the, he was the only guy in the Hall of Fame. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, people started to, you know, like that, it's almost like that slammy thing that kind of went back and forth, you know, like they had it, they didn't have it, had it, didn't have it. So it was kind of like that. I, you know, I, I went to the Hall, the Hall of Fame this year, mm -hmm. and maybe the, I haven't watched one in a while, but now the guys that cut the promos, you know, that, that are being inducted can, you know, it's like a production. Go to the video wall. Show me this. Show me that. It's like, did you not, was the production of this year's not? They only aired the, the one hour, right? It was a very oh, edited see, band. It, it, what, it was being, chopped to shit. Being there, you know, being there was just like, I, I thought to myself, like, this is actually, like, pretty, I mean, it kind of has a feeling of an actual award show. Mm. I mean, there was actually some legitimacy to, you know, and I remember sitting there going to myself, like, God, I would never want to go up there and have to give that speech. Well, do you, do you and your compatriots view it as a legitimate honor, or is it just a big party where people who tow the company line get to blow themselves for a night? You know, you don't have Backlund in, you don't have Bruno in. You don't have Rick Rude. Right. What is the Hall of Fame? I mean, in your eyes, you know, it is and it isn't. You know, it's hard for me to say how, how's Coco in it and my and my and my my boy Rick Rude's not. You know, it's hard right. for it's. You know, I don't think Henning's not in it. Right. Edge is. Yeah, but to me, it's just like, is anybody that is in the Death Club, are they not? Eligible to be in the Hall of Fame because because they're passing paints and negative light on the company perhaps Because now they got to be put in you know, and it has to you know, I Don't know my whole thing is until you, I won't I won't go in before those guys. I would never do that You wouldn't if you if you were called no Nope I just think they were going back to the bodies. <laughs> Plural. <laughs> the bodies. Going back to more that, that, that steroid look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's always like size. You know, he's always, I mean, he was a you know, big guy. <laughs> I don't know. So I could have another fucking stinker. Do you think his reign killed that whole King of the Ring gimmick? Not the tournament, but where that they where they were the king for the year. Nah, it, he was. They were over. It was different. I mean, it wasn't like they were. He, he wasn't over. You know, it's just that. To me, it was like at that point, like I was like, I'm not saying I'm like a total hipster or anything like that, but I was listening to rap music and I knew what like. It was so just fucking white bread, you know? It's just like, to me it was almost like guys doing like the old school blackface. <laughs> you know, it really was. It was like, you know, mm -hmm. You know, and I just, I thought to myself like, why wouldn't you like bring in some like, and it wasn't like, like, like Mo was, a, he, he was, I went out, I took those guys out to Detroit with me. They were down cool dudes. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I like, I like, I like this, I like, you know, I like Mo. Asha was fine, but like, <laughs> you can tell me that's the best fucking rapper you can find is Oscar? That was supposed to be a stadium bomb explosion match yes. with me and uh, me and Onita, which I wanted to do really bad. Why didn't it happen? Because it's Paul E. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> you know, the guy's got delusions of grandeur sometimes. He also told me before I brought my first son in, he goes, Hack, I got this great idea. He goes, uh, when we're doing, we're going to do the angle with Raven, he's gonna, I'm going to bring Macaulay Calkin in to be your kid. 
I'm like, Paul, how about this one sitting right next to me? My son, he goes, great idea. Let's use them. I'm like, Paul, seriously, Macaulay Culkin? You know, because Home Alone was huge then, right at that time or whatever. I'm like, Paul, shut the fuck up. We're using my son. So this is just more of his... Well, you know, but he wanted to get there, you know what I'm saying? He wanted to get there, but he eventually didn't. But, you know, to be a guy like that, to be a Hitler, to be a, you know, to be a Winston Churchill, you got to have these delusions, and you're going to reach some of them you're not going to, you know what I mean? But, you know, the, you know, to him, the, the battle's getting there. You know, and you might not get all of them, but I'll tell you what, freaking, he got a lot of them. Motherfucker got us a pay-per-view. I mean, seriously. Got us, we were the hottest... We were the hottest wrestling company on the planet for a couple years there in the, in the mid-90s. You know what I mean? He did his job. Was this the one Kerry Von Erich died? Was this sad? Kerry Von Erich died two days later, maybe? I don't know. I don't have the date Does it that. say who I wrestled? Well, this is the convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that night. That night, I wrestled, wrestled Larry Sharp's champion. I don't forget. And we both. I punched Todd, and he punched. Or no, Dennis Carluzzo's champion. And Kerry Von. What's the date on there? Does that make July sense? July first. Kerry Von Eric died on the third. Monday on the third. We'll check that later, we'll though. It. But yeah. I have a feeling that was that, that was the. Hey, Kerry was off. Nancy was there, and Kerry came out, and um, uh, yeah, he he yeah he was feeling pretty good. But at this, at this internet fan convention, this is, again, very much ahead of its time. Credit Paulie for all that stuff. In 95, the internet's in its infancy, but there, there was definitely an importance recognized to bring the fans you know, in and have access to Absolutely, that was part of the extreme, you know, changing or going from Eastern to extreme. Paulie knew how to exploit anything and everything, you know what I mean? And those internet people paid our freaking bills. That was brilliant shit on Paulie's part, you know what I mean? Just... Just even just to know something like Vince wasn't doing it. You know what I mean? Nobody was doing it. That's why that's why I say the guy's a fucking total genius, you know? That's just that's just smart business. Were you guys all on the same page too? Would, would, we weren't on you any page. Paul was on his page. <laughs> we were on whatever page, you know what I mean? We weren't on Paulie's page. Paulie Paulie was like an enigma to us. You know what I'm saying? To most of the guys in the locker room, he was an enigma who you, you, you wanted to talk to him, but you kind of knew he was going to lie to you. And, and you, you know what I'm saying? And, and because you heard all these stories, but he's, you're, he's going great for your career, so you really don't want to be like, all right, whatever you fucking say, Paul, you know what I mean? But you would do you know, Like, he comes and says, you're going to meet internet fans, and you're not going, Come on, I want to wrestle. Leave, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, Paul, he would send Debbie or somebody like that to do something like that. You know what I'm saying? One of, one of, one of them girl lackeys that he would have. Uh, you know, he, he wouldn't do that dirty work. Or dirt, you know, he wouldn't do that. He was above that. You know what I'm saying? But, but as you got to understand, Paulie was like a, I don't know, like an archangel kind of the company too. You know what I mean? It was kind of, it was, it was, it was almost a little, Paulie had, Paulie was the James Jones of ECW. You know what I mean? Guyana, we, we were drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. And it was working, man. Our company was taking the fuck off. Taking the guys from that movie, uh, the slap shot, the movie or whatever, the Vance and Brothers and stuff, and then making Ted Other Sign guy, this brother, but you know what I mean? That's just great stuff. So you all got it. You all got it. No, I didn't get it. I didn't care what the hell he was doing. I just thought it was cool because I like the sign guy signs, and, I, and they're bringing in new different characters, and I'm like, all right, this is interesting to me. Oh, is this right before he you went to Flair. Dean Douglas yeah. and yes. was back six months later? Yeah, not a good move, I guess. Well, no, because, but that's not his fault. I don't blame him at all for going to Vince. But the thing is, once you get there, man, it's it's you could be a you could be a, a whale in a pond, or you could be a guppy in an ocean. You're a guppy in an ocean in WWE, WWE, whatever. You know what I mean? You're a guppy in an ocean. You get swallowed up quick, and it happens. When a guy not, not necessarily that it's his fault. You get stuck in a, in a shitty gimmick. Or, you could be the Red Rooster. 
Hey, but the rev, that was a rib on him, but he turned it into something. You know what I mean? Jeff Jarrett, the, the blinking hat, shit like that. That was all rib. It was all total rib, but they got it over. <laughs> when someone working at the top of the card for Paul, he comes and says, listen, I'm going to New York. What's the reaction? Was he supportive? I was he I don't know. Like I said, we don't know. We don't know what the fucking Archangel's doing up there behind Isn't closed. he around? You know, no. Yeah, but he's more going. like, he's, you know, he is. He's fucking Oz. He's fucking he's Oz, you know what I'm saying? You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain because Paulie, Paulie was very good like that, keeping everybody separated from everybody. So not everybody, because he would think that that was his way of controlling everybody so everybody couldn't get, gang up against him, kind of. You know what I'm saying? Because, mm -hmm. you know, Paul, Paulie's, you know, he's smart. You know how precarious certain positions are, you know, like booking and stuff like that. You know what I mean? You got all these these talents and stuff like that. I'm sure Paulie wanted to keep us... Uh, Keep, uh, keep us separated as much as possible and maybe cause some tension between some people that was needed at some times too. What about you guys when somebody was going to one of the big feds? See ya, go make money. Right. You didn't feel you were being a bad No, I was like, all right, there's another spot for me. I guess I'm one, three, five, seven, and finish tonight. So they finally got rid of that fucking crook, huh? Tony? Fuck. <laughs> Him and his boy fucking Red, Billy Red, or whatever the fuck his name was. Billy Red Lines? Yeah. yeah. All I know is every time we went up, that motherfucker had a new Cadillac. How were your payoffs? The shits. Fucking Toronto, fucking by the time you did the conversion rates, you owed the company money. <laughs> um, At least the building had a great atmosphere at fucking Toronto Gardens. Talk about the gorilla. Everyone's got fond memories of gorilla. You must. You know, I mean, it's just... Once again, I mean, there's a guy that you meet, and he's, he's a bigger-than-life guy. Like, he, what a great laugh. Like, you never saw a fucking, you know... He, he could have been in the middle of Hiroshima, and fucking he would have looked, turned around, and belly laughed you. Look, we made it! Ha ha ha! Fuck, it was a gorilla was that kind of a guy, you know? I mean, even when he lost his son, which had to have been just brutal, like fucking, he just, just no-sold everything. Really? Yeah, he was just, and he was such a, you know, and, and when you really, like, start to, you know, when you know everything, like how those guys had a piece of the, of the pie at one point yeah. underneath the old man, and, you know, I mean, they, you know, aren't, aren't, you know, like all those guys, you know, and you, you really see how, like, there's a, like that, that to me is what was, was fascinating was, you know, Vince's descend into power and how he was able to, I mean, that, that just the, the manipulation of him being able to control all those parties and get them under one roof again and be able to. to and get everything back consolidated. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that, that alone is, I mean, for a guy that young, I mean, you talk, you know, you can say what you want about Vince, but just as, yeah, I remember I was sitting there one time and I just, I, 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 something happened and well, I, it was the, the, the story I was, I was, I was, I got sidetracked on when I finally was told that I was going to drop the strap to, to Sean. So, and I mean, this is just classic Vince McMahon. So, um, go into the office. No! We go down, and Jim Ross is sitting. Where they're down in the sound studios, where you would do like redo voice, voice voiceovers. And me and Vince are in the fucking studio with a glass fucking partition, where Jim Ross is sitting over here acting like he's being busy, but he's looking through that glass in case I, because <laughs> they don't know. They don't know how I'm going to react. So he goes into this fucking, I'm not kidding you, a 35 minute pitch on how I'm going to fight Mike Tyson in Central Park. Okay. And he's pitching this to me. And I look at him, I'm like, I'm, and I'm thinking to myself like, 
All right, he's going to knock me the fuck out, but what's the payday? Charity. So I'm going to be brain dead, and we're going to give money to who? Walt Mittman? What do we, what, 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 I'm like, and then just as he throws all this, he just kind of goes, yeah, it's for charity, you're going to drop the belt to show him. <laughs> what? I'm dropping the belt back to Brett to get to Sean? Yeah, that, you know, back to the Tyson. No, what, 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 what happened with the whole? Was well, there a process? I don't give a fuck. No, I don't. Fine, I'll do it. I'll drop it. I don't have a problem. What Did do you he want? concoct the other story? All that to shit. Deflect. Instead of just fucking pulling me in, and going, I know what I told you. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing when you look back and you're like, dude, you know, it's your fucking company. I'm probably one of the few guys that has sat there in a car, in a plane, and thought to themselves, I'm in charge of my wife, my son, I take care of you know, maybe a couple relatives here. Yeah, this, my, this person lives in one of my houses, this person lives in one of my houses. Yeah, do I take care of people in my life? Yeah, do I, I don't have to, but do you do it when you, when you become more fluent? Yes. This motherfucker is in charge of not just the 230 people that work for him, but the umbrella that lives underneath those 230 people that lives on a, mm -hmm. that's a big fucking pile of shit to fucking eat every morning. So I look at that and I go, if he feels better about it to fucking swerve me with the Tyson thing, if it makes him not as anxious to do that, I get it. Mm. You know, I get it. I'm not pissed off about it. But it's just like at this point, I think we're 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 close enough. I'm close enough with Vince that it's just like, Kev, you know, numbers are down. We're not drawing. We're gonna go a different direction. We're gonna go with your fucking. We're gonna go with your best friend. Mm -hmm. Oh fuck! Well, that's I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> right out of the gate, basically. exactly. Yeah. Uh, July twenty third in your. You're like house. having John Wilkes Booth as Lincoln's fucking vice president. <laughs>
Well, yeah, because, you know, you know, it's it's just at the forefront now with the NFL changing their policies. I mean, look at how many hockey's lost more players to concussion injuries this year than they have in the past 25 years. Mm. You know what I mean? It, this is very prevalent in the news right now. You know what I mean? And so, so obviously, it's there, it, you know, it's prevalent for a reason. Do you feel you've got lingering effects? From Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I'm alive and a lot of my friends aren't. With Scorpio, pile driver, yeah. because Taz will tell you that if he's sitting right here, he had his head back instead of his head forward, and that's how you guys neck broke. I was going to say, who's responsible? Is it Scorpio? Taz knows. No, I've heard. I've actually heard that from Taz's own mouth. That he knew he had his head back like that. You, when you take a pile driver, you tuck, man. You always tuck your chin. Your, this business is tucking your chin. That's all there is to it. Johnny Grunge, uh, Rocco Rock, Nancy, uh, Dreamer. They're like, you're not going to get Mikey like you got Tommy, are you? I mean, Tommy's a big boy. He can handle it. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, no, no, no. So we said, I took it easy on him. But uh, like 10 people in the locker room came up to me and they were worried about for Mikey's safety. You know, did you little, take it easy on him? Yeah. Was yeah, he, I set did it he, up. Did he want you to? Or was he okay with? Oh, no, he wanted me to. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he wanted me to. So if you if you really go back and watch it, I tell him to keep his shoulder right up at the top rope level. So the top rope takes a lot of the shots that I'm giving him. Gotcha. This, you lose TV in Florida. As a yeah, <laughs> big surprise. People, excuse me. People might not understand that, you know, we were paying everywhere we had to be on TV. Well, they weren't paying us. We were paying them. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, what, what, what commercials were we doing? We were selling, um, you know, our own merchandise. We're really our own commercials. And then another one was like a, some exercise machine where they'd pay five bucks for any call that they got on there. But we were paying a lot of money to be on TV. Is Paulie freaking out? Yeah, right. Paulie's thinking it because he's probably the only one thinking, oh my God, this is going to be on the opening of my fucking show every week. Paulie loved it. And he, the only, I'm thinking, think about this. You watch that. Think of how much, think about kid, you know, um, last year in Ohio or whatever, uh, the tornado came, took the people who were on, to, they were on stage performing, killed like seven people. That, when that when that ring goes like that, if you figure the 50 people that are in there, the 2,500 pounds that the ring weighs, people could have died when that happened. Paulie was happy as shit. Not like he would have ever paid the fucking, uh, you know how many lawsuits are out there for all ECW shit? Paulie knew he was never paying any of them. He knew it would never have to come to fruition. The company would be gone by then. You know what I mean? So he didn't care, but he was happy. But, you know, that's some good shit. Where did you ever see that happen before? You know what I mean? How many firsts can, can the guy have? Oh, good. That's what Jack said. All right, Jack beats up the guy. Why? Jack, the guy fucking spit on me, of course. It was all his fault. I mean, this is wrestling, people. Of course he's going to say that. I'm surprised he didn't say the guy took his wallet or something, you know? <laughs> How does Paulie react to these kind of things? Because All right, that's the boys. If the cops ain't here, you know, if you get arrested, we'll get you bailed out or whatever, you know what I mean? But, but the boys will be boys. You know what I mean? What do you expect, too? What? How did, was New Jack always getting into trouble? I mean, did you guys feel that he was a liability? Because guys always had to we jump in. We didn't care. And if the, break we, it up. I, I don't care. It's not my. It's not my company. I, you know, I've, I've I've been in the hood to get to get drugs with Jack. Me and Jack have been tight. Me and Jack have fought in the locker room. You know what I'm saying? But um. But the boys will be boys, you know what I mean? And everybody just see, I mean, there's not too many um, tight ass uh, Republicans fucking in, uh, you know, in your locker room, you know what I mean? Everybody's pro abortion, you know what I mean?
What was the scene backstage? Has had it's bad because like Jeff, you know, Jeff was one of those guys that that um, on like B loops and stuff like that. Like you know, when when the click would get like split up, you know, like half the click would be on A, half the click would be on B. Like Jeff was always like he was like first in line to get in our car. Like everybody got along with Jeff. Jeff was you know old school. Like you know he was one of us. You know, mm-hmm. grab grab your beer and talk wrestling. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, there was, a lot, I mean, I, there was a lot of, like, Canadian trips where Jeff and I, like, Jeff and I worked together. That that was one of the things, you know, that I had Backlund. They gave me, out of the shoot for for house shows, they gave me Backlund first, and then they gave me Bundy. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Jesus, I mean, how, how about this? How about fucking, you know, you, you give me Tony Francisco from fucking Long Street. We have a fucking, I mean, I just look at that and I'm just like, really? Like, why did you even prop me up in this position? And I, let's just go one further. The return of fucking Kevin Nash, 52 years old, best shape, looks, looks great. Okay, let's pick... What one match would you not fucking think Kevin Nash would have any chance of pulling off? You're talking I, about your most recent... Uh, I would probably say, I don't know, maybe the 52-year-old fucking ladder match. How many times does somebody get painted in a fucking corner before they start to go, is this coincidence? But what do you think? But what else would it be? Sense of humor? On someone's part? Maybe somebody that just didn't bite into the fucking shit sandwich deep enough. Maybe somebody that always fucking treated this with what it was, a business. Mm. If you're not a mark, they can't fuck with you. If you don't give a fuck who beat you, finger poke at them. Everybody says, what the fuck? You, You motherfucker, you booked yourself to beat Bill Goldberg. Yeah, because I was I was almost as hot as you were, Bill, at the time as a baby face. And you know what I did? I turned around and fucking got the belt and took your streak because, boy, I sure had fucking bragging rights for fucking 24 hours when I turned around and went boom. That was for me, Bill. That was because... And I want you, motherfucker, to find one time in my career that I said, and I fucking ended Goldberg's streak. Sorry, dude, I'm not a fucking Mark. They were chant- having to fucking put in Goldberg, Goldberg, because they were chanting Goldberg sucks in the buildings. Go to Salisbury. Watch that tape back when he puts his hand through the fucking deal. Mm-hmm. You go, right. he, they took his fucking ass, and I told him, I said, do not put him on the fucking top of this thing. I said, you're going, to, you're going into fucking New York territory, and you got me and Scott there. I said, this, we've never been there. This ain't, a, this is a fucking Vince, this is, you're going in Vince's building. Yeah. He's going to fucking, they're going to, they're going to chant Razor and Diesel. Wow. They, they did it. Yeah. And fucking Scott went with it. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> well, just, yeah. just fuck with the mark. Why not? <laughs> <clears throat> Are the two of them uh, friendly? No. Is this a time period where they're... Were they ever? No. Okay. Always tolerable. It was always a respect. Right. You know, just, you know, I think it was one, you know, it was like two gunslingers, you know, it was like, you know, but I think that when it came down to it, you know, the, 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 the running joke is always, you know, Sean, you know, I'm better than you. You know I'm better than you. I mean, that's the ongoing thing, but it was a shoot. I mean, as far mm-hmm. as, you know, and I, I, I will, in my life, say that Shawn Michaels is by far the best guy I've ever been with, as far as in the ring. But he would say that to you. But he would tell you he was the best. Right. But it would have been like Michael Jordan doing that. Right. You know? Brian Russell tries to get him, fucking Juton Jives, puts it over and over the jazz, game's over. Well, by the way, I'm the best there ever was. I know that. Yeah. Not much want, you can say. I just wanted you to know that I know. Right. <laughs> what would he say to you, uh, Sean, about 
bread. I mean, they were amicable, there was respect, but in the hotel rooms, in the La Quintas by the payphone, <laughs> what would he say to you? The best one ever was, Sean and I never argued. We just never did. We just never had a, a real argument. And um, this was part of, of what, this is what ignites the whole um, having Vince and them come to Indianapolis because I've, we're getting out of the car to go into Coco's. And Brett's been difficult with me. And I just have had it. You know, we've already had the situation where he won't, won't do the thing in Louisville. And uh, he's not going to do it. And I just said, you know what? I said, fuck it. I'm not dropping a strap to him. Just as we're getting out of the car. You would have thought that I said, oh, by the way, I raped your entire family and set them on fire. He goes, motherfucking what? What do you mean? You've you got to drop the fucking strap to him. It's going to me. And I said, not if I don't drop a strap. <laughs> like, fuck you, yeah, I'm not doing it. He beats me in the shoot, he beats me in the shoot. I'm not doing it. And I, I mean, it was just like, he, that was the only time I had Sean in my entire career of, of, of being his bud was like, fuck you, you're doing it. And that's, and that just, and I, we sat at the table and that's where I said, this, 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 this. And it was almost like Sean got up like, well, fuck that. I'm squelching this right now. Right. <laughs> Boom. This is fucking bullshit. Da, 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 da. And since the whole direction of the company was going towards him, he had to get this thing back on the track. And I just, I basically was just doing it just to fucking, you know, right. at the beginning to just, but when I saw like, like how fucking like vicious he got at me, it's just like anything else. Like, I've never hit my dog with a fucking baseball bat before, but fucking if he bears his teeth long enough, and I got one in my hand. <laughs> I'm sure that was that might have been JT Smith letting the shit get out of the. Do you guys know JT Smith that he worked for Todd and that apparently there's like all you know because I you know I know Todd and he tells me all the stories and stuff and um there's like scams that people will run on you like when they come into your store like somebody will get you like looking this way while the other guy's got a hanger inside your like case and stuff like that so. J.T. Smith was working for him, and he got. Do you guys know who J.T. Smith is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they ask you if you ever do an interview with him. Ask him about that. But I don't remember no smash and grab. Well, this is three people ran in and smashed the counters with the sledgehammers and made off with a hundred thousand dollars of jewelry. I don't know. It sounds like an insurance scam to me too. I said, Hey, am I being deposed for that one also? How many years ago is that? By right, statute of limitations is out right. on that one. It was great. He did what he did. He kid from fucking the local kid from fucking Baltimore with his look. I mean, the guy. The guy got over. You know what I mean? I got to hand it to him for doing that. How did he get over? This is what I want. The to get Shaw to. thing the, and his look and just just have just having that little something that the crowd can connect with or something like that. You know. So I mean? is this a case where the crowd made him? Well, no, I don't. Or uh, or did he engineer? No, he made the crowd. I mean, you make the, the you know you know what? I, I, wow, it's tough with somebody like him. It could have been it could have been somebody that he was working with at that point. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if he had a program or something because that can help you out a lot too. If you're in a program with a guy that's over, it can help get you over. You know what I mean? You know because there are a lot of guys who want to go in there and do the sha sha sha. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I don't know exactly what it was with them, but I know he got over in, in his own way. How was it working with him? A P, uh, if it was bad, I would remember it. So it obviously was good. Yeah, if it's bad, I remember it. Yeah, that was one of the most brilliant interviews the guy ever cut because he, he figured out that he couldn't turn heel because the people would still fucking cheer him. So what he did was he didn't turn on the wrestlers, he turned on the people. 
He turned on them and he goes, fuck you people, I'm not going to kill myself every night for you and stuff like that. I mean, that was brilliant. I mean, that was so intelligent just to do that. Because I'm thinking to myself, how's this guy going to be, how, how you, how's this guy going to be, oh, they, don't care. they don't really care if he's baby face or heel. You know what I mean? They just want to see the carnage. You know, but I thought, I thought that was great. Were you friendly away from the ring with Nancy? Well, she lived in Atlanta. I lived here. You know what I mean? It was pretty much, you know, when we were, you know, when we, she would always travel with me to shows. I'd pick her up at the airport. It would okay, be me, so, yeah. her, Todd, Scorpio, and Fonzie, all five in the Sandman van. Uh, in one of my vans, we would always travel together. You know what I mean? So yeah, we, yeah, we were cool. But it's not like we lived. You know, we saw each other outside of wrestling. The Sandman van. I can't let you get past that without expanding on that. Uh, well, custom conversion van, TV, four captain's chairs, a, a bed in the back. You know what I mean? That's what I because I had my kids and I had the house in Florida and the house in Philly and, my, they, and it was just a pain in the ass flying with them. So I had vans that, I, that that like three or four different ones through the years that I had that uh, we would all travel in. Uh. Yeah, it was fun, man. Having like five, six, seven of the boys, you know what I mean, in the van going from show to show. What'd you have to do to get up in the hierarchy to be invited onto the Sandman van? Uh, Just, I don't know, just be one of us. Rick Rube was part of that crew at one point. The Pitbulls were part of that crew. Todd, Scorpio. Cactus has made a couple runs in it. Uh, Fonzie, obviously, a million of them. Nancy. Not too many other people, though. You're the champion and you're not in the game. I guess we can continue along the lines of uh, odd decisions with the man they're going with. Mm. Who makes the game? Uh, Bam Bam makes it, Brett, doink. There you go, uh, Lex. Well, I should, well, who told me that I, I actually, somebody told me that I shouldn't be in the business according to him. So just. You'll see that if you watch the DVD we get yeah. over there. Um, uh, what was the. What that hurts was, coming from him too, I just want you to know that. There are a few people that, I mean, when Matt Bourne looks at you and says, you should have never been broke in, that's about as... as, as so I guess you saw it. I just... I'm uh, trying to remember what, what was, why... Word. What fake. Was, oh, because you said fake, you're right. The that's F right. word. I you thought said I, the F I, word. I, I watched it on YouTube. I had to watch it twice. I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. And I said, really? I said, Did, are you that... I didn't say fake first. He feels you did. I, I, I don't know. I don't know in a promo or to 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 Matt personally. I don't know. He heard you say fake, and that was it for him. Kind of rambled about it. Yeah, yeah I, I I don't remember him like like putting the boost me over it. No. Oh. I should have never been broken. Obviously, that's the case. I didn't make the midway game. He did. So I guess he got the last laugh. Is there heat towards Sid for being careless? I said before we hear some things about Sid. This is one of them. Yeah, I mean, he, you, you knew it. I mean, it was, he, was, he was a little bit of a, a cement mixer. But you had to know that going into it. I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of room. I mean, it's like, I'll give you a couple of Idaho's a night. Mm -hmm. That shit in the corner, about one out of three are pretty live. <laughs> yeah, but that, this is, I mean, I don't know if you ever put anyone out, but this. You know. No, I, you know what? I don't think um, I, uh, Jack Dunn. I threw. He was a referee, and I told him, "Do you know how to take a bump through the ropes?" He said, "Yeah." And he, when he didn't, and I shit canned him, and he fucking just went like this through the ropes and broke his wrist. Um, I think that's. I don't. I don't think I've ever fucking hurt anybody. I should have hurt Show, but I didn't. I told him before that. I said, "I." I said, dude, you're, I, I said, because I'd gotten him several times real easy. But at this point now, he's almost 600 pounds. And I told him, I said, dude, I said, I went in the back and I can't even get my hand around him. Yeah. I said, dude, I said, on top of that, I'm going to down you with a pot of coffee. I'm not going to be able to, I said, let's get this thing gimmicked. I'll hit you with a pot of coffee and then I'll fucking smash that fucker you sell down and I'll fucking cover you. Mm -hmm. 
I bet you in retrospect, he'd had that finish over the other one. Mm -hmm. And then Hulk stirred it, saying, fuck it, he dropped it on your head on purpose. Oh. If you ever watch it, try to pick up somebody 600 pounds, and the minute they get to the apex, on, on just physics alone, drop 200 pound arms behind them. I couldn't even get out of bed the next fucking day. He was in, I was in worse shape than he was. Right. I tore my fucking back to shreds fucking trying to hoist that fucking stegosaurus. Did Hulk in fact say that? Uh, yeah, yeah, he told me. Sh show told me that Hulk said, well, Hulk told me you did it on purpose. Do you have heat with Terry over old stuff? No, that's just common, that's just... <laughs> We'll stir. They had their mid-ring farewell, and there was some genuine emotion, I think, uh, in the audience. Well, not so even in the, in the audience, but you got to think about it like this, too. Look where those guys have been before in their career. Both of those guys have been over somewhere else besides the United States. Paulie brought him in here, gave him a fucking shot, like not like anybody else would fucking give him, and they made careers and then went and then rolled in ECW and made a shitload of money too, you know what I mean? So those guys are happy as shit also that Paulie came along and the time in and giving them the chance and everything, you know what I mean? And the people in the crowd knew that too because it was the internet and they knew what was going on everywhere. And they knew these guys weren't over in the United States fucking a year, two years ago, but they certainly were then. What's Paulie's reaction now to the defections? Is he trying to stop anyone from going? Is he offering more money? Just stay for a little longer. Uh, I don't know. It was '95. That was probably, that was the year. That probably I got the big raise. So um, yeah, but I don't I don't know it. You know what I mean? But yeah, I'm sure there was a bunch of people getting raises that he wanted the guys that he wanted to keep. Does anyone think the work rate is going to drop when these well, guys? Because we know. talked about the balance. No, it's, it's kind of like asking the Patriots. You know, if somebody gets hurt, hey, you still going to make it to the Super Bowl? You know what I'm saying? Paul, we all had confidence that Paulie would plug somebody the fuck else in there and get him, and they'd get over. You know what I mean? Because you got to think about the, the, uh, not just '95, but through some of those years, there was a big changeover, and the company was still fucking over. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, and this is the one where we're we're now no longer going against Turner. We're now competing against Disney, and you can have a ladder match, but you can't use the ladder as a weapon or be violent with it. Was this where they made the change? Yes. We sat in the room till four o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how the fuck to have that match. And if you watch it back, knowing now what they're told, it's brilliant. And what they Hunt, were able to do with and it. And Hunter was the guy that laid half of it out because everybody else was completely mine, just fucked. And Paul laid out half the, uh, more than half that match. You know it was Sid that was supposed to originally be with Sean in this match. Why did they swap him out? Was it, uh, they said it was due to an injury. I don't know if that's legit. Do you remember? They just knew that... No, that I'm sure that I don't know the backstory of it, but I would imagine it probably went something like this. Are you fucking kidding me? You want me to carry that motherfucker through a ladder match? I am not going to do it. Give me Scott. Right. <laughs> this is Sean speaking. Right? Yeah, I would imagine. And that's, you know, the, you can say what you want to about him, but it's just like there's no, I, I never, you know, I, I'm saying things like, you know, tongue in cheek about Sean because I love him to death. And I'm, we're doing an autograph thing, uh, you know, next month. I just can't wait to spend that quality time with him, because you know we're we're both we're both dads, and it's that's like kind of what we do now. Um, but like I never like I would like when we would be apart, and I would watch him, or he would do something. I just used to always get this incredible high, because it was just like I liked, I loved what I did. It was his life. It's a big difference, you know? It's just like it was, he was so passionate about it. And it was mm -hmm. just like, and when it was, 
when you watch him get that belt at, at, at 12, and he's sitting there and he's holding that thing, he's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, and I think that, you know, people that don't know, that was kind of where he spiraled and started having problems. You know, like the, the, the crazy Sean, you know, um, because, and I know for me it was the same thing. When you get into this business, especially at that point in the business, um, that belt didn't go anywhere. And that was everybody's dream was this was the federation. And to become that federation's champion was as high as that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, you were out in fucking center field with a plaque in Yankee Stadium. That right. was as good as it got. Because that belt didn't move around much. And when you got to that point, like for me, you know, I probably, I, I, I'll guarantee you if, you if somebody was to count, they can say that this guy, like, I don't know who the youngest champion ever was. Was it Brock? Yeah. Okay. I would, I would, I would like to count the number of matches, including Don and wherever he broke in, Ohio Valley, actual matches that he had to me getting the belt. And I'll guarantee you, nobody's had the belt with less matches than me. Mm, interesting. I broke in Master Blaster. I bet you we had 30, 30 matches before that thing was shit canned. Mm -hmm. I sat on the fucking shelf for a year. I came in as Oz. I probably had 12 matches. Mm -hmm. I came in as Vinny Vegas. I worked a little bit on B shows. I might have had 50, 60 matches. I went in. I was fucking the bodyguard. Right. After that, fucking then I, then I, then I worked. Right. But I mean, I, I didn't have any. I had no fucking experience. And. Um, to me, it was just like all of a sudden, you know, fucking the old man tells me, fuck, you're going to go over to the garden. I'm like, and now I come home, I, we go out to scores and fucking we go to Smith and Walensky's and then the boys go out to scores and I come home and fucking I unzip that fucking work bag from the back of the fucking deal and we're standing at the Sheridan and I fucking laid that motherfucker on the, on the bed and I just went, hmm. now what? Like, I, I'm, I'm at the top of fucking Everest. I guess there's only one place to go. Not on the Midway game. <laughs> <laughs> Downward from here, brother. <laughs> but that was the truth, and I think Sean yeah. was the same thing. As once you get there, and it's, you know, it's so work shooty at that point in the, in the business. You know, nowadays it's just like... Uh, you're gonna win this in seg six. You're gonna drop it in nine. Don't worry though. You're gonna lose it in ten. Yeah. You know, it's just like I'm watching this. A guy comes out. I don't even know what the guy is. He's a six-time world champion. I'm like, what the fuck is going on in this business? <laughs> How are you a 13-time world champion? You've been in business nine months. That's definitely a, a negative with today's. Power. I rest my case. It's my, it's my, 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 my soapbox thing now is. Let's see if we can just keep the belt on Punk till next May. That's my thing. I tweet about it. Just leave it on. Not this May, a year from this May. 13 more months, and then let's see if he doesn't fucking mean something. I tell him not to, he, he's... He's hurt, number one, he hurt fucking one of the Samoans. If you hurt a Samoan, you're fucking, you know? I mean, if you fucking hurt fucking, and I think he hurt Keish. Mm. I mean, you hurt a fucking, it's one thing to hurt a body Donna, it's another thing to hurt one of these guys, but fucking, and he went through fucking, he went through about six or eight guys that he hurt. When you hurt a Samoan, now it's time to go, okay, fuck this. Shut the ride down, it's over. And what he did was he just would stand over the guy and fucking kick his legs out and his fucking ass would land in your lower back. It was the equivalent when he did it to me. I told him, don't fucking do that right. to me. And he fucking did it. And it felt like when you're in the sixth grade playing flag football and you go across the middle and that hard ass fucking football bends your finger back to here that's what it felt like in my lower back. I was supposed to go off the top. I could barely feel my legs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, fucking, this dude paralyzed me. 
I've still got to dive over the fucking onto the steps onto them, which I hit them and bounced off like a fucking uh, accordion, like a cartoon, and landed on the steps all fucking. I mean, it was like. I might as well have just set myself on fire like a fucking, like a, a, one of those fuckers in Vietnam. Though he landed on your back, I think your abdomen is what got strained, right? That's what I have in the notes. That the was, notes it, it was, it, yeah, because it was, yeah, it was, it, what it was was basically the compression bent me this way right. and it just stretched all this shit to the, you know. Of course, getting there the next night, I mean, getting to the building the next night, well, don't go there. Take me into the locker room. When you walk in, you talk to him, don't you? I don't. I don't think I was talking. <laughs> I was probably yelling. I just motherfucked him, you know. I just, I said, what the fuck, dude, you know? I said, I told you not to do that. And then they were going to fire him on the spot. You know, Vince gave him his papers right there. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, eh, that ain't going to happen. Hey, you're not going to fire him. So and fire him, fire me. Yeah, I said, yeah. I, yeah. I said, he made a mistake. I said, but let's just let's make sure it doesn't fucking happen again. I said, fuck, he's killing everybody. And he wasn't around much longer. And I'm sure I did, my endorsement to keep him was all he needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's go the opposite. Paul never liked him anyway. Whatsoever. Yeah. Paul never, those two never, just, just never got along. And? I don't know about this particular instance, I, I don't remember, is whatever, but I just know those two never, ever got along. Was he in liked by the rest of the guys? You? I, I didn't really have to deal with them much, you know what I mean? Because a lot of the, you gotta understand, a lot of the people that I ended up with are people that you work with, that you do a program with, right. you know what I mean? Some other guys, like like Malenko's, Guerrero's, however long they were in the company, uh, Benoit, fucking, I didn't talk to those guys. Really? They weren't my boys. They weren't the guys that I hung out with, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. People like hanging in the locker room and stuff like that, but a lot of times your friendships develop because you happen to be worked with a guy and done a program with them. Gotcha. I guess, you know what, I think, I guess we all have this concept we meaning anybody that wasn't in an ECW locker room, that because you were kind of all shared that renegade spirit and you talked about the Jonestown and the Kool-Aid and everything, that it was maybe kind of like a gang. Yeah. Where, where there and was New Jack was the only one carrying a gun and Paulie that one time, you know what I mean? But uh, Why did Paulie uh, carry the gun, do you? I don't know why he had one on him. That, maybe because... Did he uh, got street he, creds I, in, in front of New Jack? Maybe, I, don't, I don't even know why I, how I even saw it. I just remember him sitting in his car with it and it was just... Yeah, it was probably street. Yeah. Did he say I'm down? No, Paulie. <laughs> we we refer to it as the Helter Skelter. It was in the Sharon Tate involved. No, no. just the fact that there was on the hallway that they were in, it was actually in the Marriott in Los Angeles, there was fucking blood like smeared on the hallway. Like when you get up in the morning, you're like, what the fuck? Like what happened? What the fuck happened? Because I mean, there's, I remember one time we had this, me and Tager that was sitting, this goth girl came and sat down next to us. It was, it was in that same hotel. And the fucking, the boys fucking gimmicked her. Hit her with H-bombs, which is Halcyon. Uh, which is actually, I mean, people have used that as a legal excuse to fucking murder their families. You know, what was on Halcyon? Oh, fuck, I'm not guilty. So, but I know that it happened after, because I was told the story. But I knew in my mind that she would remember sitting with me and Mark. So I come down that morning and I got my bags and I turn around the corner and she's crying. Got a police officer on next on both sides of her. She had black hair about down to here one length. She's bald from here over. She has one side of fucking hair. And I fucking backed around the corner. 
there's a downward way that you can go down one more floor and you can get out the side of the Marriott that's below the actual where the lobby the, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just like the wrestler escape route. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I called Take and I said, Take, I said, fuck, and I said, that black haired girl that we were with, uh, I said, fuck, I said, I don't know who fucking buzzed her, man, but she's up in the lobby right now with two fucking cops. I said, if you're fucking, guy, I said, you know, definitely send somebody else to get your car. I said, you know, he said, okay, we got you, big man, cool, thanks. And um, I don't ever know who did it, but, you know, I, they, I think who, who, who was the, and I'll probably get a lawsuit if I say it, but um, if I was to guess, I think if it was. If you were writing a fictional story, who was it? Who? It was the gigolo. The gigolo. Jimmy Del Rey. Oh, right. I think that. Uh, but Chris, um, but Tatanka's incident was uh, an was, assault? No, this was that. He was with Del Rey. And but this is the woman. This is the woman that's to. making what the reference. What was the blood? I don't know. I don't know if she was on her period. I don't know what it oh. was. But all I know was that Chris was and wasn't. I know for a fact that he was. He didn't do anything besides be at the wrong place at the wrong time. As a main, event, a main eventer and a champion, does this affect you at all, your pay? No, but it does, you know, it, it does cut out the chance of being in Erie, Pennsylvania three times a year. What's the venue in Erie? That fucking square ass shit building that I guarantee you, you couldn't fucking give away money and draw 3,000 people in. Just the fact that they're doing it from the mall just spells WCW. I mean, in just the biggest, fucking, broadest brush strokes that you can, you know what I mean? Like, you're sitting there like, where are they? They're doing it from, from a fucking used car lot where? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, who? Th that's the beauty of it. I told Bischoff this years ago when, when he was on his way to New York for, for the first time. And I said to him, I said, you won't appreciate what you accomplished. Because I've always said that there's only one person that can look in the mirror and say, I beat Vince McMahon at his game for a year. He's the only guy. There's mm -hmm. nobody else that can say that on this fucking planet. And I said, when you see that you basically beat the U.S. Army right now with the revolutionary fucking troops, <laughs> You know, I mean, from what he had from an actual, uh, the machine, mm -hmm. the machine and fucking log cabin, whatever the fuck that place they had that office in WCW. In Atlanta? Yeah, oh, yeah. New Smyrna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, uh, it was just, you know, and it was. <sighs> but was this scene as significant at the time? I know we're joking about the mall, but yeah, it, the fact that there would be head to head competition. You know, Hulk was like a buck 30. Right. You know, it was like, it wasn't, you know, it was like, it was almost like the senior circuit. Now Lex shows up. Once he <sighs> but nobody him. knows that's coming either. True. Nobody. You talking about K Fave and something, man. Not, no, when he walked out, we all went. Who were you watching it with? Um, just probably my boys. Okay. Yeah. Because it used to have like a, you know, like a, I think about that time they started to put a monitor on the back of the truck that had their show, because we were, you know, we, they were they were going to go against us on Mondays. So the WWE truck had a yeah TNT monitor. Yeah, there. so we could watch, and it was it was pretty. You know, it was you know, you got to realize like you know, before the NWO came along, like they were still fucking. King Curtis was going, Sullivan, my son, and they had a monster truck thing where the giant fell off Cobo Hall and came back and fought fucking the Yeti. I mean, it wasn't like they were fucking on fire over there. <laughs> but the Lex thing was a coup. I yeah. I mean, that was a good one to pull off. Yeah. I think that, I think I really hurt Vince uh, because like he bent over backwards for Lex 
And then he like put Lex on the bodybuilding thing, which Lex really liked. Like he brought Lex in from WCW under a WBF contract until his WCW thing was over. That's right. Remember you know, that. so he kind of you know he he you know he Vince did things for him, and then you know he and he fucked him, and then the the second dagger was when Randy booked, because nobody knew when Randy did Bushkill TV, and then fucking boom, he was gone. Did Vince ever sell it? Around you nope. guys? Or? Fuck. The fucking, the feds were up his ass. He just got his neck fused. Mm -hmm. He fucking walked into a White Plains TV. Hi, guys. Because that was always a barometer. You know, that's what I always tell people, you know, when they hit turbulence, I said, you know what? When the fucking stewardesses sell, that's when it's time to worry about it. I'd always look at Vince. When that motherfucker sells, I'll, well, I, he's fine, I'm fine. <laughs> It wouldn't have mattered what his attitude was. He was fucking dead. Because of the gimmick? No, he was dead because he was like the like he was like the indie guy. Like he got over like, you know, he was like that guy that, you know, like he was he was dead. He was he was like, you know, he's not he's not going it didn't it wouldn't matter if he wanted to get over, he wasn't going to get over. Well, he comes in, and we talked before about somebody that the click sits there and goes, oh, you can hang with us. Now, Shane is definitely not someone who gets that nod. As a matter of fact, he ends up getting a little bit of heat with some of the members of the click. Um, never with me. Never with you, and actually, we, he just told us uh, on a show I always like, I always, that he liked you. The other thing was that... that alone. He, he liked you alone. Yeah. Not with anybody else around. All right. Yes. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. Uh, he's an intel. I mean, he's smart. He's, he's an educator. He's a smart guy. You know, he's one of those guys. And you said it's nice to be able to talk about something besides wrestling. He was one of those guys that, you know, read Time Magazine, and you know, mm -hmm. it was just, it was, he, he actually realized that there was another world outside of that. But you know, he was he was fucked. Kid, he kid, he didn't have a good match with Kid. Kid gave him the fucking stamp of death, and it was it was over from that. All I remember is we're leaving. As soon as we get, we, as soon as we wrap this thing, that's going to take about an hour and a half, <laughs> so we can get some sleep before we get on the plane and go over to Europe for about 20 days. I've got my wife, who's ovulating, and we're trying to have a kid at the fucking Weston in Sanford. I've flown her in because this is the only. I, I've come to the conclusion. When she's ovulating, I, I, guess what? You actually have to like mate. Yes. It doesn't really work any other uh, uh, way. So she's waiting for me in the room to see if we can have a child, and I roll in and I can't even do anything because I've got to grab my bags and get on a plane because we're there till fucking the sun comes up. She must have been thrilled. She loves this business. I think that she would. If she was sitting here. She would, it would be nothing but accolades to to what this does and, and how it just bonds a couple and normal makes life perfect. makes a nice normal life and it's so easy to take your husband like to like a dinner and he's down at the end of the table saying motherfuck every third word and has no idea he is and doesn't realize like why the fuck is she kicking me was she got, got like a nervous twitch or like why is she kicking me and I'll just look at her and she'd be like you know, finally, you know, you think, if I get like a, a monkey, quit saying fuck. Mm -hmm. Read that on the napkin. Fuck, gotcha. <laughs> How long did the tapings take? All night? Oh, fuck. The only thing worse than that one was, I don't remember if you remember this raw one, was like Taker is walking, we shot it in the, in the naval fucking uh, shipyards. The ring was on this fucking, the ring was right here and it was like fucking a hundred feet to this shit. I don't know, even there were rats out there and we had a match and fucking, we were like running the ropes and if this fucking rope brought, we would have fucking died. Mm. We're just doing it. How much you get paid for that? Nothing. 
how are those things done? Who's in charge? Who's directing you guys for this? Do they bring any outside people, or is it Kevin Dunn? Oh, it was always, I mean, Kevin, we didn't need it. When, you know, Kevin can do anything he needs to do. It's just, when you go outside of, of your comfort zone and, and now you bring in a helicopter. Yes. That now makes you, easier. Yeah, now you've, you've added the... You should put some camels and kids exactly, in Exactly. You know, now you've got the intangible of a helicopter fucking pilot that doesn't know anything about wrestling that's basically going the wrong way and doing everything. Mm -hmm. and again from the top, again mm -hmm. from the top. <laughs> And it's it's basically if you remember it's like a battle royal type situation, which yeah. even if it's shot perfectly, and it's a one time take, is a clusterfuck shit. Just everybody go to a corner so you don't blow out a knee. I mean that's just yeah. you know that's just what a, a, a battle royal is, and it just like you know just the, just that alone was just ugh. Well, the the ratings come in and. Uh, Nitro beats Raw 2.5 to a 2.2. Um, what was the reaction? Now, Raw was a tape, so maybe it wasn't going to be as hot, but there must have been now a little bit of concern. Yeah, d definitely. Definitely. I mean, it, now it's just like, ooh, shit. Because we, I, know, I, I, I sat and watched that show, and I thought, I don't see how anybody could sit and watch that show. That night, I just thought, ah, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But... At any know. point, do they say to you, we have to raise the stakes here? Is there a meeting? I think that's when they brought in Doink and said, what should we do? And he pointed and said, not break him in. At least get him out of the video game. Um, no, I mean, they... Once again, it was the no sell. You know, what's that lump in your neck? I don't have a lump in my neck. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do. It's a, it looks like maybe a goiter. No, I'm fine. First why reference. You, why, why you got a turtleneck? I'm just wearing a turtleneck now. He was my boy, we started together. He was the first guy to send me to a hospital, give me a fine headbutt. We were doing, we started it in school together, to, you know, like the same night. And you know, we worked, you know, he was my first probably 10 matches were, were him, you know what I mean? Joe Goodhart had his, we would open up the, his a show for maybe even more than my first 10 or so, you know what I mean? But uh, we started together and then we went to Memphis together. And then uh, they sent him home. They liked me. Uh, and then um, he ended up working for Todd. A great guy, a great all-around guy, but he's just another one of those guys who you made it to a certain level. And then, How did the Italian thing start? I don't know. Fucking maybe Tracy Smothers or Paul was just somebody just saying. A lot of times somebody would just be like, yo, what about this? And it wasn't like... And it wasn't like, uh, like, oh no, you couldn't come up with an idea. If it was like a lot of those ideas just fuck what just, cause Paulie would give you rain doing your shit. You know what I mean? It's like the Dudleys making the different Dudley dudes and, and, the, and the other guys that were with, um, with Guido and Tommy and Tracy and stuff like, you know what I mean? Just, it's, it, it's, it's just shit, it's just funny. Hey, wouldn't that be fucking funny to do that? All right, let's do it. What about the thing where you missed the spots? Who, was that JT? contrived? Yeah, was that uh, a, a... Yeah, I'm sure, but it probably because he... Something like that comes bef because you would miss spots, and then, well, all right, well we're going to make a joke out of it now since you missed so many of them, you know what I mean? Yeah, awesome, man. I I got to work with the uh, uh, with uh, with Scorpio. It, it was actually in um in uh, Jim Thorpe. I think it was in Jim Thorpe one night. Perry shot on me a little bit because he didn't like to, he didn't like that I would drink before the matches and shit like that. But um, but uh, I love the shit that they did, man. Because they it was just another strong team, you know, to bring to bring into the to bring into the mix. Cause you got you got the Eliminators. You you seen the gangsters. You got the freaking pit bulls. You know what I mean? You need you need strong teams. And their finish was awesome, man. They finished whatever they did. People loved that thing. Uh, 
Uh, the Lucha Invasion. Now, you talked about the absence of these guys, so maybe it necessitates... Oh, he plugged them right the fuck in, man. All right, here comes who? Rey Mysterio, uh, Psychosis, fucking uh, uh, Super, King, Super King, maybe, and... Um, Conan. Uh, yeah, Co yeah, Co I worked Conan. For, uh, okay, if they just came in... Uh, I thought it would have been in September that I worked Conan, and you got you got that yeah, one coming yeah, up in there. Yeah. All right, because I'm Conan's first match in was me, and I had and I knew that he was coming, and I if I had just gotten lucky or something, I had saw some tapes of shit that he did that he had done before that he had done before. So we got it. I was like, don't worry about it. I got you, brother. And Conan was cool. He's like, all right, you're you know this is your place. You know, we come in. I I called a couple of his spots for him. Came back. Me and him were good friends. Still friends to this day. First of all, is he a real attorney? No. No. Okay. Um, if he was, if I could, it was the shits. Too, <laughs> too dangerous to try something so topical in wrestling? Controversial, maybe, you know, the whole Johnny Cochran. If deal. they wouldn't have fucking sugarcoated it. Right. If they would have committed to if they would, It's like anything else, you know? It's... I just, I don't understand why people don't get that. You can't be half pregnant. There's no such thing. You're either fucking, you're either, you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no half pregnancy of how it works out. And we were half pregnant on that. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the, if you can take anything away from this fucking interview, please. Jesus, if you're gonna fucking commit, commit. It's a bad idea, fucking, you'll know quick enough. Mm -hmm. You can always pull the plug and fucking redirect. It is pro wrestling, but it's just like, when you, it, 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 and I hate to go back to, but let's go back to Royal Rumble. Don't commit to me. Let's go 40 minutes and have 55 run-ins. And people will say, oh, boy, they went 40-something minutes. and oh, What a great battle. And they shook hands at the end. No. We're half pregnant. We, didn't do, we, we did nothing. We treaded water for th 40 fucking minutes. If nothing, if nothing, you fucking... I turned water for 45 minutes, and as I got out, she said, next time you do it with a 45-pound dumbbell around your neck. Thank you. And no midway game. Nope. Steve came in, I was happy as shit to be working with him. He was a piece of cake to work with me, him and Mikey doing three ways. Is that what you have there? He yeah, broke out, uh, yeah. he gave me a hot shot. You know, he was just easy, easy to work with. I mean, look at it, it was freaking Austin. He was a freaking, um, I mean, but even before he was off, he was just a, just a regular guy, man. He just wants to get you over, the match over, everything over. This is when you do the leg drop hanging from? No, that leg drop hanging was, was in Boston. This I did a hanging leg drop. That was up in that was in Revere, no, Boston. You, did, you dropped it on Mikey. Uh, hanging from what? From the lights. Not in the, the arena. Middleton, Middleton, no, Middletown, New York, Sportsland Cafe. Oh, okay, all right. I, it was at a bar or something. Right. Yeah, okay, I remember that one. Now, at first, I would have said the only time I did it was in Boston. But now I remember doing it, doing it there. Was that yours? Did you just look at it? Or was it something yeah, you Yeah, you just see it. Yeah, some of them spots I do, I come up with them right before I fell asleep fall asleep at night, some of the best spots I've ever done um, have come to me right before I, right before I fell asleep. But that, but the, the hanging one, but the, I, I think, I, but once I saw it there and then it was in my repertoire, if I can use it in a building or something like that, you just do it. Is, it, is you this know? something you tell Mikey beforehand? Ah, uh, probably, yeah, at that point, probably, yeah, but the first one I ever did in Boston, probably I didn't tell anybody, I was probably just out there and probably just did it. I think there was, oh, I, I don't think Sean ever had a problem with him, but I think when they separated and he kind of like did, didn't make, you know, he was kind of gone shortly after that, you know, Sh Sh Sean was the star. You know. But in coming back? There wasn't any, I didn't feel any heat, but there was that, there's, there was definitely that distance and it was almost like, 
Have you ever seen a guy like at like you know at an outing and his ex-wife's there and they never really had like a fuck you moment, but at the same time they haven't seen each other for five years and it's they, an icy hello. Yeah, it's just that you know. Yeah, it was just it was, and, and those kind of things are always uncomfortable anyway. It's one of those things that it, it was so uncomfortable. It wasn't like it was even brought up in the car. Uh -huh. Like nobody, want, I don't want. You know, it's just like. I'm good enough on instincts to know that this just doesn't feel cool. Fucking hilarious. Talk about Austin his, was his, doing them interviews. Right. And I didn't, because what, you know, a lot of times we saw interviews is because after the show, we went up in the hotel, we went up on the 16th floor, and uh, and everybody did their interviews till 7, or 7 8, 9 a.m. in the morning, however, however long it lasted. But all the Austin ones I got to see for the first time, like watching our show on television, and they, they were just great. He was exactly what the company needed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it was, it, what a professional, you know? So they all came from him. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Paul, he was like, Paul, he got guys and he just said, you know, listen, freaking just, this is what you do, go, you know, go do it. Mm -hmm. He sure, how does he know your character better than you, especially when you're a Steve Austin type? You know what I mean? Because he'd been around, you know, coming out of WCW and stuff like that, you know what I mean? It wasn't like it was his first day. It got so bad, you know what Steve Carino actually figured out though, that when Paul gave you a check, Steve Carino would call, because money might not be in there, because some guy, it got to the point where some guys would put, would get their check in on a Sunday, or I mean super duper early Monday morning, the guys that, you know, the guys have been in the business for a while, and then Steve would do, Steve would have to call and say, is there money, you know, because we would all be putting checks in it, and you could charge them, what, 35 bucks or something Return, for a bounce check yeah. or something like that, you know? So he finally figured out, no more of them, he would just call and just hold it until there was money in there. <laughs> um, what was the consensus in the locker room? Did people feel they're being screwed, or, or, or are they buying it when he uh, says his wallet and his checkbook were stolen? No, people ain't buying any of that at all, but people know, people know there's money problems. I mean, fucking not at this point, but, but you know, because it was a little bit later when the real, real money problems, and people, see right here, you know, in 90, I don't know, maybe some of the people did believe it in 95. It's early you know on, I mean? so yeah, maybe. You know, in 90, yeah, because, yeah, so maybe some people did believe it at that point, but I'm sure the smart guys didn't, and me, I, I'm not sure what I, thought, what I believed. My favorite part of this is uh, he tells everyone that the checks will be reissued with extra money to make up for inconvenience. <laughs> Was yours one of the ones with extra money for inconvenience? I don't know. Don't, don't recall. I, I just don't okay. remember a lot of money probably. You know, it might have owed me some money at the end, but we had all made pretty good money with him. Nobody else was paying us $150,000 a freaking year, you know what I'm saying? And we are making more than some guys in WCW were. Probably not at, at this point though, right? 95? Yeah, right then. It was right, right when this stuff was happening was when, when, when everybody started to get bumps of money. Does he bring his video camera with him? Is this the show of the infamous Man Mountain Rock? But you know what I'm referencing. Yeah, this is the one where, but he did it, he did it on the bus, didn't he? Wasn't it on the bus he did it? The funny thing is- Is that the bus? The video? Was it that? He had little pieces of- uh... I know you can hear me in the background talking on one of them, because I, I, somebody showed it to me, but I was just like, you know what, fuck, so, I committed the Kennedy murder. You know, I'm talking about it. Dumb fuck, unless I'm fucking chewing pills in front of you, you really ain't got much to go on. And everybody thought that was such a big deal. I'm like, I don't remember fucking him being in our car. I don't remember partying with him. I don't remember doing anything with him. You're stupid enough to, I mean, obviously we were right. And I think his, he didn't make the midway game either, did he? <laughs> Hey, 
And that was a small ass locker room, man. That locker room was scary because it was out. It, the, first of all, the place is literally built on the top of a f freaking mountain, and the whole, and it's like the whole, and it's, and the mountain's not like flat at the top. It's like a point, and there's like, there's like 60 foot big ass, like this wide telephone poles that are holding up the whole place. And we're out on the, there's like a balcony around the, around the whole, around the whole building, and you, and it's just, it's just a straight down drop, like a hundred, you know, a hundred yards down like down into a cavern. That place, and it was all rickety, and we would get out there with like, because I, I wouldn't stand in certain places with like Big Sal and stuff. Like, if there was a certain amount of heavy people in certain places, I swear to God, I would, I'd be, I'd be like, no, I'm just coming right inside the door here, and I'm gonna sit my shit right there. That's how scary that locker room was. It's it was like it was good, like we were gonna fall off the side of a mountain. Hey, I mean, it was old too, man. Old. The Flagstaff, this is right. Yeah, here. top of a freaking mountain, scary locker room. Would someone's stock rise or fall with that if they stood up for themselves, if they thought they were being cinched up on a little too much, and, and they went after somebody? Yeah, Would the boys no, look at it as him being a shithead or standing uh, No, no, no. Well, it, 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 with certain people it would. With, I would say like 30% of the people would look at it and say, yeah, 30% of the people would look at it and be like, who gives a fuck? And 30% of the people would be like, stupid fucking kid, he's going to get fired now. All right. You know what I mean? You went at it with... Uh, and the other 10% were drunk at the bar like me that didn't even know what happened. You and New Jack had something, right, at one point? I think yeah, I just, it was, that was one night and it was for, it was for 30 seconds. And well, how, boys will be boys, you know what I mean? Some mm -hmm. of the people that I've been best friends to to this day that I went to high school with, that relationship started in a fight. I don't know if you guys have ever been like that, but I've had a couple people in my life that have been like that. Uh. That sounds like Paulie saying I tried to do something, but oh, I couldn't get it past the mayor's office. I, I never even heard of that thing, but that's exactly what that sounds like. Well, that's pretty much it. He says that the uh, main event is scheduled to take place outside, but can't because city council has complained. Okay. Uh, what did I say? I'm, sure, I'm surprised he didn't say the mayor and fucking self, Rizzo, or then, or whoever the hell it was. <laughs> um... But it brings up a good point about the neighborhood there. You know, Philly's the iconic city for this. Did you have problems with locals no, man, not no, wanting was... those fans around? Or no, because because really we're not freaking. There's a bars up at the corner though, but we're we're in an industrial. You know, it's an industrial area for a couple hundred yards, and then the houses start. You know what I mean? But we were all we didn't really have to bother. You know, there was if every single person that went to the show went out front the front door, we wouldn't be in front of somebody's uh, with somebody's uh, house. You know the whole fucking bodyguard thing? It's a shoot. Like, he needs, you know, he, he, he will run his mouth and his head. He don't give a fuck if it's two six ten guys. Because his philosophy, the worst thing he can do is beat the fuck out of me. <laughs> you know, he, he's not going to back down from anybody. Sean, Sean, he'll, he'll go. And they, you know, and I talk, and, and I'm, I've always been friends with, with the Harris guys. And it was just like one of those deals, like you know, when I, when I they were they were still there when I came back from the ro next road trip, and you know they just they pulled me in the, in the in the fucking shower and they told me what went down. And I said, you know, I said, you, if you, you know, I know you're gonna do what you want to do, you know, whatever, you know. He says, there's five of you, there's only two of us. And I said, oh, you got to take her and yo, you know, it's not like a, you know. I said, I said, I said, you know, just tell me what happened. He told me what happened. I said, well. You know, I don't want you beating on my friend, but at the same point, I mean, you kind of push you guys in the corner. And I said, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, Sean's cool with it. Sean let it go. Yeah. You know, if, I, if I came back and Sean said, we got to do something, you know, that would have just, it's like almost like a prison yard thing. But it, is it, it, is Sean's mouth sometimes, I mean, would you have defended him in any circumstance? Maybe you'd ask, yeah. Hmm? If he'd asked, yeah. At that point, did he deserve some of what he got? Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, when I when I heard what the incident was, I mean, 
you know, he, he put them in a situation where they just, they, they, it was just, a, and it wasn't like they put the boots to him for 25 minutes or anything like that. You know, it was just, you know, shut up. Is that why they're fired? Do you know? It just, you know, it was one of those deals too where, like you said, they, they cut the bees and guys weren't fucking, there were guys starving. Like there were guys living off the draws, you know, getting 200 bucks a night and bringing that home and paying bills. And, and this is back when shit, you know, you, you, make or break was WrestleMania for everybody. You know, everybody lived in a shit fucking house. Nobody bought new cars. You didn't have any guaranteed money. You had no idea what you were going to make. And if you ever got hurt, it was, you were done. So you were either stupid and lived, you know, above your means, or you lived like a fucking guy that was getting a 60 hour instead of a 40 hour shift at the fucking plant. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I looked at it. I remember when Bischoff came to my house when he was at, you know, the first time he met me and I lived in a little fucking track home. And I mean, I had an S-Class Mercedes, but fucking it was four years old when I bought it. It wasn't like I bought the fucking deal. My house was paid for. It was like, I could have, you know, I could have walked out of the business that fucking day. I didn't owe a dime to anybody. I could have fucking went and got a job at a strip joint and paid my bills. And that's the way I always looked at it, because that's one thing Chief said. Chief said, don't fucking live above your means. Get yourself a fucking pay, p place that's paid for, because they can't take that away from you. He says, he says, he says the, the guys that buy the deal, that fucking think, you know, Vince will always tell you, oh, yeah, I'm moving to my neighborhood, yeah, so I can have a... Eight million dollar fucking mortgage and work till I'm sixty, mm -hmm. you know, and that was that was the whole deal. You know? And that's one thing Chief said. He said, "Just be smart." He said, "He said, you know what?" He said, "Why do you have to have a new car? You drive a new one every day. You walk, you drive a new Cadillac every single fucking day. You're on the road or, or a town car." He said, "Why do you have to have a new car? You're home for fucking three days. Yeah, well, that's true. Why do you need seven thousand square feet?" Mm -hmm. You need a washer and dryer to wash your fucking gear, to repack your bag, you need a bed to fucking hang out with. If you got a kid, they need a room. I mean, when you really look at it, fucking, if you're a pro wrestler and you got just a wife, you need a one bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is she gonna do? She's gonna be in 7,000 square foot home by herself, fucking scared shitless? Yeah. Dick. Didn't get along with him. Never liked him. What happened? Just a fucking bully. Bully. He tried to. I screamed at him when I was a greenhorn. He fucking. We had a match. We were in center stage. He, he said, "What the fuck got a punch?" That he said, "Nash bend over." And he fucking drilled me with a punch right in the side of my head. You always hear that he would do that. Ask guys to get on the. You know, and I fucking. I just. I just stood up. And I said, "Fuck, dude. That's the best you got." And just no sold it and walked away. He rang my bell. But I know in his mind he thought, ooh, it's a big old fucking dude. And all of a sudden it was like three weeks later, I'm in his office. He's like, think about making you a fucking uh, big rugged baby face. <laughs> Fuck you. Even here in WWE when he No, came he came in? back. So this is, this, is a, this is a great story. You're talking about little side stories that... And I don't think this means anything, but I know that people that, that there's people that'll enjoy this. Me and Yoke are a dark match. Fucking vent, they're putting up a fucking cage. And I don't know if they, they brought in fucking people that have never put a cage up before, but you gotta realize this is that old blue cage mm -hmm. that was made out of Louisville fucking aluminum fucking mm -hmm. baseball mm -hmm. bats. You know, so they're putting this fucking cage up. It takes 40 minutes to put this fucking cage up. They're fucking with it. They can't get it right. I got one of the sides the wrong way. And finally they get the thing up. And Watts, you know, is at the fucking gorilla position. He goes, tear it down, boys. I said, you got it. Yoko goes out first. I go out, I got the strap. We get out there and fucking Yoko's, you know, does this whole breakdown where he's smacking and doing his fucking shit, you know. And I said, I'm going to charge you. Duck the clothesline, line, hit me with a Samoan slam. Boom, he hits me in my land there. He looks over me. I said, drag me to the corner. He drags me to the corner. I said, go up to the second. I'll move. 
I'll fucking grab your fucking leg and hook you one, two, three. We go fucking 20 seconds. No. We go 20 seconds. Fucking, I roll out, fucking Yoko's sitting there pissed off, he fucking then does his hair, shakes it. I go out the fucking cage, fucking raise the fucking belt, walk back, fucking Watts is fucking waiting behind the curtain. He looks at me and goes, what the fuck was that? And I said, obviously you're out of touch. I said, did you not fucking hear it? It was time to go, the people were right. <laughs> I took like three more steps, I turned around, I said, oh yeah, by the way, here, I eat you on the food chain. Fuck you. From back in the uh, yeah. referencing the center. It was one of those deals like he doesn't know it, but I actually did the Willem Dafoe around the corner. I dropped on both knees. Oh! <laughs> 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 Fuck you! Finally! <laughs> wow! How many years did you wait for that? Oh, not, you know what? <laughs> Put it this way. I, I look at the smile on my face right now. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, fuck you, you prick. You remember, you remember any of his ideas that never saw the light of day that were particularly good in WWE? I don't even know why Vince brought people in because it was always his final say. It was, it was just, I guess, it was just somebody for, for to him to kind of like talk, like for him to give background music while he decided what he's going to do. The only person he listened to was Pat. I'll never forget that when it, when this thing all went down, and um, like one of the dirt sheets, I think it was Meltzer's, like gave their account of, of this whole situation. And the one thing they put was, Sean Waltman, and they put in parentheses, legitimate tough guy. <laughs> I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Like, what, are you really, like, Sean Waltman, of all the guys you can pick up, you, you would rather fight Davey Boy than Sean? Oh, you didn't realize that that's how he was perceived by all of us readers? <laughs> I didn't know. No. I just sat there oh, and I went, wow, wow, wow. That, was, I mean, that was an ongoing joke. Mang and Sean. Yeah. That's the order. Um, what happened? Take me there. Take me to... Uh, Wasn't there. Once again. Syracuse. Don't fucking book Sean without me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have got the story as soon as they got back. Well, right? I, mean, he, he, I, I heard that he, he, would, he was in the bar. And there was a bunch of service guys and fucking one of the girls just, you know. But he was fucking, I mean, bombed. They got Sean out to the car and they went back in. Now, that skinny guy might have beat the shit out of Sean, but Sean was passed out in the front seat with the door unlocked. Whoever got to him got to him while he was... Because mm. Sean don't know what happened. So Sean just, you know, Sean, Sean got fucked up, but it wasn't like anybody kicked his ass. They fucking beat him, you know. It's like getting fucking beat up in your sleep. Uh, a response to your friend Bill Watts' comments about the event that um, if he hadn't just quit WWE, anyone there would have been fired for coming up on the losing end of that fight. Bill would have fired Sean, uh, one, two, three, and... Um, Davey Boy. How do you not quit the day before? And that probably speaks volumes for why Bill Watts was in there because Bill, it's fucking fake. It's only real when you've got power and you can fucking abuse it. Dustin has, has stated that he was very comfortable just playing the part, but were other people a little freaked out? Well, I, I think that going into WrestleMania when, you know, he, he, they do the thing and he unzips his shirt and it's his, he's got a heart that's his razor painted on it, and Scott says, like, goes into events, he goes, and that's, Cody's probably seven now or eight, and Cody's getting older, and Scott's like, my kid watches this fucking show. He's, it's kind of hard for me to go home and explain why some other man's got his dad's name with a heart on his chest. I don't really want to have to, to go, divulge my son at this age that there's that there's a homosexual lifestyle. As we say on Seinfeld, not that there's anything wrong with it. 
He just really doesn't need to know about it right fucking now. And why all of a sudden is two weeks ago we were against Disney, now we've got a drag guy. Like, you know, it's it's almost like, what is it, are we... I guess we had to do something against that fucking Dungeon of Doom angle, which was on fire at the time. It's, it's still the shortest IC title reign on record. Did they not have faith in Douglas that he'd be able to have, to, to be able to carry it for any significant amount of time? Even if they wanted to get it to Razor eventually, why so quickly? Might have been an appeasement. I don't know, I don't know if the time frame was, if that's when Scott went in and said, let me wear Japan. I remember one of the things he would always tell Vince is, you know on that merchandise, if you just move that decimal point over one fucking spot, instead of us getting like point zero 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 nine, maybe if we got like point zero 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 nine, mm -hmm. it might make a difference. He goes, you know, he's always calling Rich Mang. He's always saying, you know, Rich Mang probably doesn't mean much to you, but to me, family, if you just move that fucking decimal over one, and if I could just work maybe, you know, Three weeks a year in Japan, you know, just make some extra cash. Mm -hmm. Just you know, you can do an injury angle. I just I keep my door open in Japan. And I was like, no, 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 because he was always looking to, you know, at that point he was a big star. He would have got huge payoffs in Japan and compensated for the fact that we weren't making a whole lot of money. He was a good old boy, you know what I mean? I mean, me and him, like, I said, you know, I never, like, really yeah. worked with him a lot, you know what I mean? Worked a couple times, but we were telling him we were close, and he wasn't one of the boys that was traveling with me, you know? What's your take on all of your People die, man. Brothers you get pressed, that... you push the fucking, land, you know, like you said with, um, you know, it's the way our personalities yeah. are with our egos, and, you know, it's just... One, it's just, it's just doing stuff. You do stories for 25 years, you're gonna blow your heart up, especially if you're drinking and doing pills with it too. You know what I mean? It's just, in 20 years from now, it could be like kind of, you know, you get a concussion, you're out for like six months now. You know what I mean? Suppose, uh, you know, we're getting choices. We're getting te technological wise, medically wise, NASA wise, the, any kind of science. We're getting twice as smart every five years now. Who's to say in another 10, 15, 20 years that we don't realize that the concussions are the, are the reason for a lot more shit? I mean, how much do we know about what our brain really does anyway? About 8% of what it does. You know, we don't know what the hell goes on up there, you know what I mean? So, so part of this, part of the concussions, part of the drugs, part of just have to, to be a person to be in this kind of business. I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll find out sooner or later or maybe just this is the way people are. You know, Whitney Houston, you know, you know, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, I mean, I don't know, maybe we're all interconnected somehow. Entertainers. I don't know. I think I was the first one to ever even use one in a, in a, in a, in a ring. But yeah, I loved it. I loved props. Props were great, man. You know, it was just something to do because I wasn't like a, I wasn't like a wrist lock, a wrist lock guy, or or um, or you know, you know, a work a hold kind of guy. You know what I mean? So I, the more props, the better. What about losing it to Mikey? Is he someone that you were happy I to help? I didn't care at all. You know, I didn't. Even, to me, I, I, to me, I, I just didn't really. At that point in my career, I didn't know obviously like I, what I know now. You know what I mean? But now, man, it was cool. Mm -hmm. It was totally cool. You know, I, I didn't care. Most of the time, I was never. I never was really supposed to get the belt anyway. Uh, the only reason I got the belt a lot of times is because somebody left, and they were like, "Ah, fuck, we gotta put the belt on somebody." I mean, not. I mean, maybe the first time T Todd had me beat Magnificent Morocco, um, maybe '93 or '94 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, but besides that, every other time I got the belt, it was by, by happen chance. So, you know, it came and went. You know, I had it more than anybody else. So and when you win it, you got to lose it. I uh, mean, Ric Flair won it 30 times, but he lost it 30 times too. Right. 
You know, so to me, it's just part of business. I, you know, I, I didn't have, you know, I, I, was, I didn't have like an ego in my head. Like, I yeah, I some guys make a deal about who it is. Fuck that's... that, I'm drunk. I can lose to anybody. He's too cold, Scorpio. You don't have to do a freaking thing. I let Scorpio do all this whack, whack, whack. Let's go home, man, you know? I didn't have to do shit with him around. He did everything. And who even knows if that even really, I don't even know if that ever really happened. The fan getting burnt and all that shit. Did you ever see that on tape? I, I just, I think that whole thing's a work. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, yeah, that freaking whole fire thing. When the shirt I landed. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, there was a big stink about it, you know what I'm saying? But I really don't think anybody got hurt that bad. But that I mean, night Funk it, might have. Yeah. <laughs> no, that night, nobody cares. The show's over, man. Let's go to the bar. It was okay, so it was just another yeah. night of work. Fuck, it's Fire. CW. Who the fuck knows really what happened? You know what I mean? A lot of guys are out of the building already anyway. Who's responsible if something gets out of hand like this? Is it the talent? Is it poorly? Is it if security? If what gets out of hand? Well, someone comes to the ring with the t shirt on fire. He's it flies out there. That's out, him. It ain't all Paul A. I mean, yeah, you, I, you know, it's like, you know, it's like. Like, like how an insurance company would look at it as, and they're going to go sue everybody, you know what I mean? Right. But to me, is uh, listen, the, the, if the promoter gave me enough respect to let me go out there and do something like that, you better believe I would make sure nobody's going to get hurt doing it. That's how, I, that's how I look at it, you know what I mean? But, I mean, but shit happens when you get out there, you know what I mean? And there's some intangibles and stuff, but, you know, the boys are actually out there doing the work, you know what I mean? The boss let them do it, but, you know how many times I've gone to the ring and never even said to the boss, hey, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm like, fuck this guy, I'll learn later, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So if you're doing something, it's your responsibility when you're out there. Is this a big F you to the uh, feds? Pretty ballsy for a guy that escapes the noose more than once. Yeah, but that's just, yeah, that's Vince. That's why you gotta love him. No matter what, that's why you gotta love him because he does have a fucking set of brass balls. He's like I said, he's a man. Like, you can say whatever you want about Vince. I've had, we've had our difficulties. We've screamed at each other. We've, but you know, I love Vince. I mean, you know. Um, on this card, speaking of safe workers, Ahmed Johnson uh, makes his debut. Um, what's the word on him coming in uh, from uh, other wrestlers who have worked with him? I don't know where, like, I don't even know where the fuck he came from. I mean, he just like showed up like, out of nowhere in, <clears throat> in a dark match and just... You, know, you got to realize we're on the road. Like a, none of us were sheet guys. None of your red. None of. I mean, if you were caught with a fucking a sheet, oh, you were. I mean, you were fucking. It would. You would be crucified. So number one, we have no idea that there's anybody outside our world unless they're on on Turner's TV. So you can be the biggest fucking star in Japan. We don't fucking know who you are. We don't, we don't give a fuck. If you ain't in our world, on our grind, fuck you. We don't know where he came from. I don't know where he came from. I know that I had an idea for a vignette where we we're gonna bring back Karen Black and have him actually bathe Ahmed in a, in a bathroom. Karen Black, the old the actress from the old- From uh, the Mandingo. Oh, <laughs> oh see. see where you're going with that. The reference? Very obscure, <laughs> pulled in like a Dennis Miller. Went a long way for that one. Uh, <laughs> so many jokes, so many follow-ups I, I am opened Karen, up, but I- I am Karen Black. <laughs> it's, a, it's at that point now where it's just like, we, we gotta work against guys we wanna work with. 
Right. Like, this is fucking bullshit. We, he can like he, he would use Sid to you know do shit, but like the the, the meat of the match every night, Scott's got to work with somebody that's again, and it's the appeasement because Scott hasn't. I think at this point Scott has given him his ninety day notice because you have to give a ninety day written notice, the job clause. Mm. So I think Scott's given us notice at this point. Loved it. Yeah? Loved it. Yeah, it was awesome. Think you did well with it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Those guys were over, man. Those guys got, they all got over individually. You know, Stevie, to anybody, that, even the snot, booger, snot, what the hell was that dude's name? Booger picking moron or whatever, booger eating moron. He got over. We even got them all over, man. Mm -hmm. Not planned, just happened. Really? Just fucking happened. I mean, it was, uh, maybe the dance thing between Teddy and them, but uh, I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to happen. You know what I mean? So, that, yeah, it was probably planned between the, them, but it helped get me over. I was happy. Doing the cabbage patch or something I did. I don't know. What I was if, just trying to imitate one of those two, I remember. What about Gertner starting out in ECW? Great, at man. Time? Gertner was, I don't remember exactly, but I remember he, and that guy had a lot of heat in the beginning for who knows what, because somebody's got to have heat in the fucking locker room, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, why not pick on him? But um, I always thought he was a great talent. Why did he have the heat, heat in the locker room? Know, it was just because, like I say, sometimes somebody's got to have heat. Designated it's, bad guy kind of thing? Yeah, it's right. Not so much a designated. It's not like he's a bad guy. He's, he could just be a missile. It could have been one little thing that he said. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? And sometimes that snowballs, you know what I mean? But I always thought he was cool. there because there were marks at some point. I mean, he was the mark that dropped a million dollars into it. You know what I'm saying? But or seven hundred and fifty thousand or whatever, but we're all marks and we wouldn't be there. So nobody looked at it like that. Now Taz's turn is I mean not that I know of, but who knows what the rest of the like I said, thirty percent of the guys could have been thinking this. Thirty percent of the guys could have been thinking this. Taz comes back and his, his he's doing his the dick character now. Is is this just him being him? You is he I mean? a dick? No, he was never really a dick to me, but I just knew a lot of people thought, you know, he had heat with a lot of people. Yeah, I don't he, know. Maybe it was because they, they, the Van Damme thing, and I hung around with Van Damme and Fonzie and, uh, and Sabu all the time, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, he was not He was probably the least liked person in the locker room. But he was a hard ass. He was, all, he was hard on all them Team Taz guys and none of that. He was hard on Bubba Ray when he first started. They used to, until Bubba Ray stood up to him one day in the mm. fucking gym and smacked him around, I think, you know what I mean? So... I mean, Taz ain't a big guy. I mean, he's always been cool with me, though, so. Taz gets on the mic here. He calls out um, Paul E. saying, you know, my father's not some fat fucking Jew lawyer who pays my way through life. Would something like that have That's to a good be, line. be pre approved by Paul E? Or is it no way. Going to Paul E would have wished he to call him a fat lion, something or other. You know what I mean? Paul E just wants you to get over. You know what I'm saying? He don't care. He's a Jew and he knows it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He don't give a shit. Get over, kid. Say whatever the fuck you gotta say. Call me a douche, whatever. Just get over. Was there any difficulty with him coming back with any of the guys? Not at all. Sabu was one of the boys, man. We were happy, and man, everybody knows Sabu's good for business. So then, that you know, that that was a, that was a money. You know, there's a, you know, there's guys in the, when you know, if there's forty guys in the in the locker room, there's thirty guys that are there because they're just there. There's ten guys that really the people paid paid to see. You know what I'm saying? And and Sabu's a money. You know, he's a money guy. People pay to see Sabu.
by our car, he was a god. He'd fucking smarten up Sean, smarten up Scott. Took him like he was, you know, he was like, you know, their guru. So, From in Minnesota? Yeah, from yeah. AWA days. No, Kurt was, Kurt was fucking shit. Well, I mean, I, I know the whole scenario. I know where all Brett is is the fucking, you know, he's the, uh, are you a messenger or are you an assassin? No, I'm just a messenger. I'm just bringing the belt to Sean. I mean, I don't have the animosity to Brett. I just wanted to have a good match, and I knew I could have a good one with him because he got it, you know? And it was nice because it, it, looking back, like we, had, we weren't able to use chairs we had used a chair shot. I don't think anybody ever went through an announce table before. They hadn't, and I'm going to ask you about doing that spot. So go ahead, take it. Okay. Well, I mean, we just, we really, I mean, I've never in my life had a match of that significance of actually dropping a strap or doing something like that to get on the phone with somebody that I'm really not that close with. I've never made a trip just me and him. You know, me and, me and Brett, I've never been in a car with just us two, you know, up and down the road. And I get on the phone and it's just like, we're finishing each other's sentences, getting to the next spot, to what, how we see this thing. And then that day of the match, we got there and we put together the whole t tie me up with the fucking, you know, those, because Owen did a fucking really funny rib in Israel where he wrapped Brett in the cord as a rib. Uh, and then tied it like five knots, and Brett couldn't get out of it. Is this where the idea? This is where, yeah, we we got the idea from that because it was so because I, and it was, it was almost a shoot. At, I couldn't get that fucking thing loose off my leg for nothing. It was almost a shoot. Like you, those things, once they they get wet and yeah. they fucking get any kind of tension on I mean, you, can't get loose. So, uh, but you know, just everything from like telling the camera guys, make sure after I lose, I'm gonna turn around and say fuck catch that so people think like I, you know. Mm. And we needed a spot where fucking Diesel was turning back into what got him over because this is, here's, here's, an, here's the, let's really go back to where this all starts. I got over because uh, because of the Royal Rumble. I was a big motherfucker that looked like an ass kicker, that looked like if you saw him on really walk in someplace, that guy would probably beat the fuck out of me. I had a little bit of a legitimacy look to me. And then you find out, well, the guy's a bouncer, and he's fucking, he probably is a pretty tough guy. So as soon as I fucking win and get the belt and beat Backlund in eight seconds, which hasn't been done, mm -hmm. I'm on Raw with a fucking Santa cap singing fucking We Wish You a Merry Christmas to the fucking Titan Tower crew. Why didn't they just cut my balls and cock off right there? Put a fucking 800 implants in, man, I could have fucking wrestled Blaze for the title. Jeez, I mean, fuck, talking about just out of the shoot. I mean, I'd beg somebody to fucking name some guy that's been in this business and has had any kind of fucking popularity that goes from fucking Master Blaster to fucking Oz, where you pull off an old man's rubber mask to reveal you looking like a greenhorn with silver spray painted hair. You make it past that, you actually get pushed. You get Now you get to the top of the fucking mountain and fucking every two minutes fucking you're just like, is that another grenade? It's like, fuck, you know, you look at it and you just say, and people say, well, you know, fuck, Nash is lazy. You know what, fuck you. How many fucking times in your life? I mean, if I fucking go paint your fucking house, I'm, 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 I'm down to the t doing the last fucking thing in trim, and you walk behind me with a spray gun and do it black right behind me, how many times do you think I'm going to go back to the fucking other end of the house and start meticulously doing it fucking with a white paintbrush? You know what? Fuck you. It's black. You, leave, you deal with it. I'm not fucking with it. I'm not stupid. I got 145 IQ. Fuck you. I get it. I'll just take the money. Fuck you. You don't want me to care, you did it. I don't. Well, you want me to have a ladder match? I'll have one. So. Anything else? <laughs> Nash as monster. 
was created by Connecticut, maybe. And then these qualities that we hear. I had a little bit of, yeah, by the time I got down to fucking back, or back to Atlanta where I'd already been, it wasn't like fucking I wasn't beat with a kendo stick for three years there. Mm -hmm. Now I come in and I'm fucking, I'm, I'm getting paid jack and it's guaranteed. Fuck you. Guess what? You didn't lock the door. You shouldn't have had your daughter down there fucking picking daisies because fucking Frankenstein's in the village. <laughs> Now here's a, here's a baby face with the heelish edge, maybe a precursor to uh, Steve and and the kind of the tweener thing that became popular. Do you see yourself as kind of a groundbreaker? In absolutely, that respect? absolutely. I went and saw the movie Heat, and clear cut De Niro heel, Pacino baby face. Right. We both had likable qualities, though. Even but I mean, kind of vote, yeah. But I'm just saying, though, the other guy's gunning down cops in the middle of the street. Yes. Like, I mean, it's. But at the end of that fucking movie, there's not a fucking soul in the movie theater that wants De Niro to fucking not go over. Right. You know, so all of a sudden, I'm looking at this going, from a psychology major fucking point of view, we're a very skewed, fucked up society. And this, and, and I, to this fucking day, if Vince McMahon can get you in red, white, and blue tights and you fucking do this with the flag, he still thinks that's the baby face. He'll always think that's, he'll, it's like the image will just, that that's, it's America and it's, you know. And there is always going to be that quality, but, you know, while yeah, we, you know, I look at the American flag and I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of the fact that we're fucking dudes up with drones. And we don't even fucking, we're just flying over and fucking, mm -hmm. we're just fucking your shit up with technology. We're just smarter than you. And that to me is America. When it comes down to it, you know what? Okay, yeah, you stole our smartphone. Fuck you. Now, we, we, we got, you've been spending, you, you motherfucking Chinese have just spent a couple of billion dollars trying to build something to fucking find our submarines. And you can't, because they got fucking 12 Polarises with fucking 14 warheads, and they'll fucking, one of them takes off and opens up. Each one of those warheads has the fucking nuclear fucking explosion of the Nagasaki bomb, and each one can land fucking within 100 meters of where it's fucking directed. You shoot fucking 14 submarines with those many fucking missiles, and you fucking, what do you, we lose? No. <laughs> okay, okay, it's a game over. <laughs> But back to you being a heel and a baby face for a minute. Is any of this inspiration coming from ECW? I didn't even watch the show. It's been said that Shane was a fan. True? Was a fan of what? ECW. Did, did or at least watch, watched it at the time. What? Shane watched it? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure he did. I mean, he ended up there. Shane McMahon. Oh, Shane McMahon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. He would have been. I mean, he's always... That would, that was kind of the fucking underground, cutting edge thing. Of course mm -hmm. he would have been. In those terms, though, does it start to leak into WWE product at all with something like this? The, the baby face as heel? No. I mean, I, it wasn't anything. I was the one that fucking made sure that I cut the, I mean, it was my promo. You, I'm not going to touch anything with a black glove. It doesn't have to be one of the motherfuckers that you buy up at the concession stand, just any black glove. I knew that the anti-corporate guy was the guy that would get over. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, people can say what you want to. Steve's one of my best friends. Jesus, I mean, the only thing they didn't do was give him the black glove. They gave him the glass break. They gave him everything else. They gave him my attitude. I mean, he was a hell of a lot more successful with it than I was. Do you have a joke with Vince about it afterwards? Maybe recently. Like, hey, that stuff looks pretty familiar, huh? Huh? No, oh, it's just no. it's one of those it's one of those things that you know what? What's what's the saying? When you look in the mirror, there's fucking that's that's the one person you can't lie to. I don't I don't think anybody doesn't fucking know where shit came from or what who said what or who said what to when and how and 
I don't need any fucking validation in fucking life that I have a creative mind, that I've been successful in this business. I can get up and drink coffee and look at the fucking ocean and realize I've done pretty damn well. No, that's not what happened. Okay, tell me. We're in Europe. And Shane says he can't go tonight because his back's sore. Hunter has to work twice. Yoko cuts the promo. Yoko said, he, uh, Dean's getting on, you know, his name was Dean then, he's getting on the bus, and Yoko said, he said, um, yo, motherfucker, he said, did you watch that match? Shane just looks at me and goes, you watch the match, Hunter? He says, no. Well, motherfucker, if you watch a match, maybe you realize what fucking Scott needs out there. I fucking tore the house down. And another thing, there ain't no fucking days off in this fucking shit. We all hurt, motherfucker. If you ain't fucking paralyzed, take your motherfucking ass out there. And it was just like, we're in the back of the bus, and it's just like, oh, I mean, it, it was nothing for us to say. It was done. It was like Yoko was the one that cut the promo. Yeah. Yoko said, fuck you, are you fucking kidding? And that was another thing. This is the, you know, this is the BSK guy. This is the other fucking faction mm -hmm. saying, fucking, are you kidding me? You gotta pick it the fuck up. That's a, hey, maybe you don't take gimmicks. You know? I'm not saying, I'm not telling anybody they should, but fuck, you know, there would, you watch a guy like Taker fucking sit up with a flak jack and fucking broken ribs and a, Face mask with a fucking caved in skull and he ain't missing shots. Fuck you, man. P cowboy the fuck up. This is the fucking Biggs. You get your name chanted a thousand times a night. What more could you want? I mean, ser I mean, seriously, you know. And, but you know, some people just don't say it. What did he want? A run in the ring? He wanted to wrestle. Right. Uh, Paulie's like, "Well, you're going to ruin your career if you wrestle." I remember telling him in front of a bunch of people, and Hal just kept pushing it. Like I said, he was Teddy's boy, and Teddy was probably gone, but you know, in WCW maybe at that point. So, you know what I mean? So Paulie's like, "All right, I guess we'll use Hack in, in that spot too." You know, Paulie, like I said, he would just plug people in. It just plugged people in. Now you square off with Austin with the brass knocks here. Do you feel... I don't remember the brass knocks, but... Do you feel he took your gimmick for WWE? No, no, no not at all. He drank beer after his match. I drink a six pack before my match, bust them all in my head, and I'm bleeding before my match starts. But nobody had beer in the ring Yo, before you. Well, nobody. Yeah, okay, but now I wasn't the first one to bring a fucking Singapore cane into the ring, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing Tojo Yamamoto shit from 1972. Who the fuck am I saying, Steve? Well, you know, why would I be mad at him for that? You know what I'm not saying? Not that you're mad. No, not at all. Do you think he was influenced by you? Man, yeah, I, I, I would think, yeah. You know what I mean? I would think, yeah, but um, but you know, more power to him. Like I said, it's hard to be the first person to do. I was the first person with a cigarette in the fucking ring, but too. You know what I'm saying? It's good to be the. You know, it's good to be. The, you know, oh well, wait, Tommy Dreamer, you're the innovator of us, but I'm the innovator of gimmicks. I guess I don't know. And <laughs> you're the innovator of. Uh, I can't wait to see him the vices. Um, talk about regaining the belt. Does the does it mean anything to you, or is this just? No, I'm just more like, I, oh my god, I got the fucking belt again because I didn't know that I was getting it back. And there, here's the thing here. Oh, here. The reason I had to get it back was because Austin came in. We did a couple things. He signs with Vince. Paul, they don't want to keep the belt on fucking Mikey, so they got to put the belt. But the belt, there is what it was. Paulie didn't want me losing to Austin, so Paulie thinks, oh, that'll hurt the Sandman. So we'll get Mikey to do it. Some guy who's way weaker than fucking Austin. All right, well, we'll have him beat Sandman, and then he's not losing to Steve, and then Steve will take the belt from Mikey. Steve signs, belt has to go back to me.
That's how I ended up by happen chance. I'm going to ask you because there was the no blood policy. Was this Brett going into business for himself and knowing that? He did it, he did it in Chicago with Owen in a, in a cage match. He gave himself. Was he told to do this by Vince on the no, sly, you think? No. Mm -mm. So it wasn't a hard way, definitely. Anybody that's ever fucking. Hard way. To get that kind of color, you got to get stitches to shut it up. Anybody knows that. I mean, you just you get that kind of color. Most hard ways, fucking, they'll bleed for a couple of minutes and the swelling will shut them up. Unless you take the fucking steps and you, I mean, I've never seen anybody bleed fucking really effectively hard weighed unless A, they fucking slid it before and put something on it or fucking, you know. Which we had to do with Sid because Sid wouldn't juice when we stopped the match in WCW. We had a guy hard, you know, cut him and then we put some shit on it. So when he got in the corner, just took a couple of taps and busted open. Mm. Now it's not exactly the heavyweight title this is happening to, but is it still uh, sticking Vince's craw a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Did you sell that one? No, I think my wife was glad she was gone. No, did he? Oh. Did Vince sell that? <laughs> oh, were you friends with her? Uh, nah. Friends with her? No. Barely know her. Um, yeah, I mean, Vince no sold everything. Uh, you know what? For every, I mean, one of the one of the, the things in that time period that really just went on my ass sideways was like Bobby Heenan walking out the door with the fucking toy, like, like him being like, get rid of Heenan. Like, and I mean, you just knew at that point that nobody was safe. You know, nobody was safe. Yeah, that red handkerchief thing was over as fuck. <laughs> Didn't realize they met in San Francisco they wanted to be pissed on. <laughs> Wasn't that yellow? Uh, I guess. I, I forget. I, I haven't seen cruising in so long I forgot the whole fucking thing. Good film. Firstly, how about the choice of, uh, of casting? Would that work? Who would you cast? Would it be Sly? Would it be somebody else? I'm going to go on, I'm going to go out of the limb and go with James Gardner. Little Rockford <laughs> Five is coming at you. Um, Just on the stature. Laura Brevetti. Did you know her, the attorney? No. Okay. How about Emily Feinberg? Former Playboy Playmate. Um, no. Posed under a work name. No dice. Okay. We move on. Well, what, what month is this? This is December 19th, 95. Uh, we, must, we must have been like fucking... There were times where we ran overseas like back to back for like months. You know, we do 20 days, come home, do TVs, and go back over. Like, run Germany, then go back over, run the UK. Right, there was that sp uh, spot there where you would do, you did, you did yeah, Germany, did. came back to the UK. Yeah, we, it, was, it was, you know, that was one of those things where you didn't even know what the fuck was going on, you know, at your house, let alone anywhere else.
right next to the strip club. December 29th, a good place to be. Right next to the strip club. It was great being able to go over to that strip club. I mean, literally 50 yards, you walk right across the street. Which one gold, was the Flash Dance? Gold, I don't know the gold name of it. I, mean, I think it was Goldfingers, though, but it was great having a strip club. Good right house. You drew uh, 1,283 fans. Um, was it a big priority for Paul to get to New York City? I don't know. That wasn't a big that. moment for you guys to, to, to work in Vince's... Literally I did. Backyard. I did. Maybe some guys, but I was. My mind wasn't thinking thinking like that. You, you were thinking I mean? Goldfinger's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was. You know, I would. Because thing you got to understand, I was just. I was just happy being where I was and what I was doing, and I was still. I was along for the ride. Right. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't looking too much forward to the. the you know, I'm putting. The, you know, and to me, the whole thing. The whole thing against us, against the world, I never really liked. I liked us being together, and if the world just happened to think of us as against them. But I wasn't an us against the world type of guy. Other guys were, but other guys had been in other companies and seen that. I, you know, I'd been to USWA. Right. I was fucking it. I was in USWA when I went down there with JT for three, four, six weeks or whatever, and then came home and went back for a little while. But I hadn't really been anywhere, so it wasn't. It was just I was just happy to be there while they when they were doing that. If you guys thought of it as you against the world, then that's fine. Hey, I'm just here with you and having fun. What about a New York crowd and a Philly crowd? Any difference? No. All ECW fans. Yeah, it's an ECW crowd. relationship with Paulie like they get along yeah obviously or, they, or he wouldn't have brought her in or whatever but they had been friends from they had done some kind of business somewhere WCW, yeah. and look at look at another fortunate position I'm in fucking oh but Kevin Kevin gets signed to, to go to um to, to go to WCW which was probably this year I don't know if this was my first I think this was my first year with Nancy and Kevin's on his way out the out the door. He's like the last night he was there. He's like, listen, damn man, you know the way he talks. He's like, I'm gonna put Nancy with you. You take care of her while I'm gone. I'm like, okay, sir. You know what I mean? Then I get fucking woman. Then all of a sudden he gets woman a job up in fucking WCW. The next show I come back with Missy and fucking uh, up out of the bird's nest or whatever. You know what I mean? Paul, he was just feeding me shit, man, and it was fucking great. <laughs> It was just give me the ball. He was just throwing the ball to me. He handed it off to me. Just let me go, man. It was it was a good time. Was uh, and he always put me in a good position. He always put me in a win-win position. Did she get along with the other girls? Yeah, but like you, you have to understand, it's, you know, she's still Missy Hyatt. None of the girls had ever been anywhere before. It's a little bit different if you're the new girl coming in and all the girls have been somewhere before and you're the new girl on the street. It's a totally different dynamic Status. when you've been there. But you know, you've been there, done that. You know. Well, you sometimes years. hear that caddy. Yeah, we know, I never paid attention to that shit. Okay. Check uh, it at the fucking door. There are a handful of no-shows here. Uh, Paulie grabs the mic before the card, says the heavenly, bottles, heavenly body split up. He announces there'd be a big surprise replacement later. Also says that Steve Austin is now the million-dollar champion. He says um, Austin couldn't uh, suck Sandman's dick on his worst day. Said the winner of the Tommy Dreamer versus Raven match later would meet Sandman for the title. He said Vince McMahon was a piece of shit and fucked up ECW. Um, Pritchard, Austin's departure. It, it, does this really piss Paulie off, or is he just kind of turning this into? Yeah, Paulie's an making the best of a bad fucking right. situation. One, they're never going to rebut. <laughs> you know what I mean? He doesn't have to have a fucking conversation with the dudes. This is Paulie Ghetto. Tell Austin couldn't suck my dick. I don't even know where that what would even make his mind think something like that. But you know what I mean? That's just Paul Ghetto. Hey, we, we don't have the money to go on fucking to stay on TV, so we're gonna we're gonna turn against the producers of the TV and say you're not liking me doing this. That's why we're gonna get thrown off. Yeah. It's fucking smart business. Later on, it becomes known that Paulie, while he's trashing WWE privately to you guys, is taking some payroll money. This is much later. Who knows? Um, I, don't, I don't have any documentation. I've heard shit, but who knows? So who was knows? there any working relationship between I, WWF and them? Oh, I'm then? sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. I don't know. Forum system. You know, maybe Vince just just thought, you know, hey, Paulie does have something here. You know what I mean? Well, and you're he, a big conspiracy theorist, so... Totally. <laughs> if, if anyone would have a theory about dating back to 95, if there were... No, I would say meetings. that early, no. I, that early, no, but maybe maybe a little bit later on, yeah. I think, I think, I think at best, I think people would like to th think that, yeah, he was on the payroll... 
I think Poli knew that he had a job to be on the payroll once ECW was done with. Well, this was 1995, and it was literally for you, very much like living it for the first time again, much of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, you have it on camera now. He's my son. He's two and a half years old. He's CJ, and we're allowed to use videotape of him. Uh, Douglas turns heel on Cactus and sides with the Sandman. Now you're working with your buddy. What? Too Cold Scorpio wins the tag titles and then chooses you as his partner. So this is when you hook up with Whoa! Scorpio. Is that how it happened? Chad Austin. You defend against Chad Austin in Jim Thorpe, Are Pennsylvania. Are you fucking kidding me, Chad Austin? Okay, that same show, Mark comes in. Uh, Mark who? Comes in, uh, uh, Bubba. Comes in as... as Bubba's name's Mark? Talk about turning too cold heel. I don't remember being a baby. I, don't, I thought he was always a baby. But turning too cold heel, I don't remember. You, was I in the company here? Was I in WCW? But the entire year and wearing the <laughs> strap. I guess Jungle Jim Steele is going to fall in that same category. I, I know the guy, but I couldn't tell you anything that he did. The Broad Street Bully beats up the New Jersey Devil, which was uh, Doug Gentry. Do um, you remember it? Nope. Year, just so I know. Still 95. All of it 95. Oh, okay. Wow, yeah. what a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
knowing it's not the finish. He just takes a blast from the stairs, goes off the cage, goes down, and on two, he's underneath, and he's got a kick out of my shit like I never hit him with it. And I'm like, fucking really? I'm not a mark, but come on. You're way smarter than that. You talk about it afterwards? There's no fucking way that that wasn't fucking set up to fuck right, me. Right, right. No way. But why? Well, number one, I don't give a fuck what anybody says. When you, if you leave, you can come back, but it's like the old Puerto Rican thing. Hey, Nash wants to come in. Fuck him. No. Let's book him, then fuck him. <laughs> That's, you can always come back, but you know, you ain't leaving on your terms. As I got home, I sat there one day and I just looked at my wife. I said, where are the tremors at? She went, what? I said, the tremors I used to give tea haircut with. She goes, they're upstairs somewhere. I said, go get them. I'm fucking, she got them, brought them down. I put a number two guard on it and I said, she said, I'm not fucking doing that. And I went, I took, I turned it on, I went, and I went, Zzz. I went, you want to finish this? Got it now, yeah. She cut it off and she just looked at me, she goes, and what does that mean? I said, just in case I get the fucking notion that I want to fucking go back there anytime soon, I'm going to go back on my terms as a 52-year-old gray-headed motherfucker, and I'm going to say what I want to say and do what I want to do, because if I can't sing fucking my way at, at, the, at this point in my life, fuck it. I'll sit at home and do nothing. I'll, I'll look at my wife and go, Dow's at 103. 71. I'm fine. <laughs> as long as I get to watch my Brian Williams at 630, we'll feel good story at the end. That's the fucking note to put on the fucking open the first bottle of red wine. Honey, is dinner about ready? Dinner? How was your day? How was your day, son? Little fucking modern family. Everybody gets a chortle. It's calling a night. Now I can watch my DVR. Groundhog. <laughs> That's 1995. Thank you for coming back with us. For taking us with you. Yeah, and, 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 and thanks for opening that wound. <laughs> yeah, send us the bill. Thanks for watching.